Welcome to the Psych Substance Podcast. I am here with Derek from More Plates, More Dates. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, we've been talking for about an hour already, but we're ready to uh, get into this Connor Murphy debacle pretty uh, quick here. Apparently, he is ready to... I don't actually know. I have it loaded up here, and he has uh, just been fresh out of the institution for going clinically insane, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. We're about to find out. But um, So you know more about this than I do. Yeah. You've been following this guy much longer. Why have you been following him for so long is my question. Um, So he is a OG fitness YouTuber okay. who's been posting viral videos about his physique for a while. And to be honest, he's kind of known as he probably has one of the biggest fitness channels, if you can call it that, where mm -hmm. it's basically it's more of like a hybrid of pranking slash slash fitness, I yeah, guess. He did these Omegle videos. That's what I've seen. Yeah. Where he would, it's like a random chat, right? I've never yeah. used it. And then he would be topless. And that was yeah. the whole video. Yeah, like, so hey, look at my abs. Yeah. So that's yeah. A, a really popular go to for, you know, the shredded guys is just go on Omegle and pretend you're this, uh, you know, unassuming person and then peel off the tarp and oh, look at me. I'm shredded. Oh, so we do like a Clark Kent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And coincidentally, he sort of looks like that too. So it works in his favor. Mm. But he did these other ones where he would go up to girls on, uh, 6th Street, I think it is, in Austin, Texas, okay. where it's like, you know, a very popular um, nightlife spot. And he would do these, it's not like pranks, but he would do, you know, ask them questions, do, you know, weird, uh, I don't know, put the interesting scenarios that would all eventually end up with his shirt off, essentially. And those videos blew up. How did he transition to this? He he just be he just started randomly doing start it. taking yeah, his shirt off. Yeah. So he did he ever take the pants off too? <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe I don't I don't remember. It was usually the shirt. Yeah. But um, yeah. Literally, he started on YouTube, and from day one, he just uh -huh. blew up immediately doing these uh, shirtless reveal videos. So this is good because we're getting like not everyone watching maybe knows about him. So you're giving us a backstory. Yeah. Yeah. So he basically he had. You would think objectively he had everything going for him. You know, he's uh, the super popular YouTuber. He has 2.43 million subscribers. He got, you know, tons of views. Too slanted, bro. Is it? Yeah. So you can actually just put it like straight. Oh, like this? Yeah, that works good. As long as it's pointed at your mouth, you're good. You can play with it all you like. You would think I know this shit being <laughs> doing YouTube stuff. But um. so anyways, yeah, he uh, did the fitness thing for a while. And then he sort of transitioned into... I don't know, I guess he went on an ayahuasca trip with, I don't know if it was his friends or he thought it would somehow benefit him in some uh, you know, spirituality So this context. is how it's relevant to me. We're, yeah. we're pulling yeah. it in. All right. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting how the fitness thing sort of like developed into this hybrid of psychedelic stuff. <laughs> but he went on this uh, trip of enlightenment where he feels it was a success, apparently, whereas most other individuals do not seem to think that's the case because he is totally different to the point where... His personality is nearly unrecognizable. So all he... But was his personality good to begin with? I, like, who might say it was question. bad? I don't know if it was bad. <laughs> I just think that uh, he definitely was, uh, I guess, the traditional, like, egomaniac kind of guy, I guess, to begin with. Because he literally did everything based on his looks, his popularity, etc. Like, it was... Well, a, this whole YouTube was based on his looks. It's literally just look at me. Yeah, exactly. So that... I don't know. Essentially, he went into this thing with what I assume to be not the right headspace and ended up totally shifting his brain chemistry in some drastic aspect, I would mm -hmm. assume. And now he thinks he's God is one thing. Okay. So he thinks he's like, I don't know. He would, When he started, it wasn't that. It seemed a bit more harmless other than the fact that he had one video which really freaked people out where he was pretending he was acting, but he was bringing his friends onto his channel and his family and trying to enlighten them. And he would just explain all these, you know, obscure topics. Would he and feed them drugs? No, he would just talk to them and mm. talk to them about spirituality stuff. And, you know, sort of like the conversation was very looping in that he would just talk about mumbo jumbo for about an hour and then get annoyed when they weren't enlightened like him. So <laughs> he became... We'll do the bunny ears. Enlightened via drugs. Yeah. But he got so arrogant, he thought that he could bypass the drugs and enlighten people just with his speech. That's, it, I still find that very strange. Maybe I'm missing all the con some of the context on no, that. That's probably I, what happened. That's largely what, what happens with these yeah. guys. Yeah. So that's what it seemed. Because even his one video, it was failing to enlighten my parents. And they were visibly worried about the situation, even though he claims 
it's just an it's just an experiment. This is like an acting reel to show um, I don't know, directors and stuff. So to a, some part of him knows that people are going to think he's nuts. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't preface it with... Uh, yeah, he also didn't want it to get banned off YouTube or demonetized or whatever, so he would preface it, sort of like a medical disclaimer. Mm. By the way, I'm not actually insane. This is just for, uh, you know, entertainment, blah, blah, blah. Right. But anyway, so he failed to enlighten his parents, failed to enlighten his friends. Without drugs, though. After his experience and without drugs, yes. And well, he that, failed to enlighten them without drugs. See, usually when you go about enlightening somebody, you want to take them on the same journey that you just went on. So I find it it's also telling of his character that he naively believed or he arrogantly believed that he could just talk someone into enlightenment. Like yeah. you would ask him, were you talked into enlightenment? Like at least take them on the same trip you went on figuratively and, and like actually the trip. Yeah. If he took a trip to where did he take a trip to? Did he go to Peru? I don't know exactly where he went or who he went or with. Or did he just do it with in some L.A. dude's basement? Like, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Now, I, okay, I don't actually know that where he went or whatever. I just think that the context of the environment he was in, whatever headspace he went into it with, mm -hmm. was obviously suboptimal relative to what most people's experiences are. But it still netted the same end result. He became enlightened. Yeah. So he had this one video where he was basically visibly distraught, crying his eyes out and saying he's no one understands, you know, uh, they're going to understand, though, basically when I kill myself. And he basically says he basically lays out like a hypothetical deadline where he's going to be killing himself in his shower or his bathtub or something like that. And then mm -hmm. the police show up. He's not there. He's ran away from home, even though he lives by himself. He's not home. He can't be found. Um, they go find him on the beach somewhere and he's, uh, his whole plan, he's trying to like replicate what Jesus did in the Bible or something. I was actually going to ask that. Yeah. I was going to say, is he going to rise again? Yeah. So his whole okay. thing is sort of about like following like, uh, basically the timeline of what Jesus did. And then every time something happens, that's sort of relevant to that. He says, see, it was part of the plan. So by Jesus, you mean his past life as Jesus? Yeah, exactly. Is that what he believes? Um, I don't actually know what the fuck he believes, to be okay. honest, but uh, I think he definitely thinks he is like the all powerful whatever. So my question is, before we continue, how do you know, like you just said, you don't know what he believes. So are you fairly confident that these beliefs are are not just rising out of, uh, I don't know, some kind of publicity stunt? Like, how do you know he just doesn't want to get more views out of this? Maybe he was bored with what he was doing. Like, there's so many angles. He's bored. He thinks this is going to get him more popularity. I mean, it's definitely got more people talking about him. Yeah. So that's... How do you know that's not playing a, a part? That's some people's logic. They think, why are you giving this guy attention? He's just doing it for views. And, like, obviously, his channel was dying. So that's why he did it. And I'm thinking... Nobody would ruin their credibility like that to just score views. Because even if you're getting the views off of some big eventful, you know, faking your death, for example, yeah. everyone knows that you didn't do it once you show up alive and everyone thinks you are clinically insane, no, essentially. No, not the death thing. I mean, like, maybe he's acting enlightened and he's doing all these videos for views. I don't think that's the case. I'm just, no, but I'm just saying, like, there's people who are going to think that. Yeah, I think the... Uh, yeah, there's definitely people who think that for sure. I don't think that he necessarily is doing it just for views. Well, when you though. see how, how he behaves, then it becomes apparent that it's not just for views. Yeah. Like, he legitimately looks like he's lost all the marbles. Yeah, he knows this isn't... There's no way he would not be cognizant of the fact, if he was in a good state of mind, that this mm -hmm. is not tanking his like reputability or its credibility necessarily. Yeah. So even if it was for views, it would be like a sporadic bump, but... It doesn't actually help your brand. Well, yeah, and ultimately all. it's going to hurt you because yeah. he's going to. There's so many people who are going to find him completely not relatable at this point. Oh yeah, and Everyone. I think that's largely why people on YouTube, like a huge driving factor in your popularity on YouTube, is how relatable are you? Yeah. And if you think you're Jesus, who's going to relate to that? Yeah, he's no. not going to get much following. His comment section is riddled with "I miss the old Connor," and you know what happened to this, and I remember when you inspired me to work out, and now I'm like ashamed to watch your videos, like shit like that. And okay. he doesn't seem to care at all. He says it's all part of his grandmaster plan. And <laughs> basically he ended up getting, um, you know, the cops found him, blah, blah, blah. He went to um, a mental, mental institution as far as I know. And then he basically is very good at turning on his normalness when he's around people where he's trying to get out of the situation. Is he actually good at it though? Seems like when cops show up, like he's live stream cops showing up to his house and him talking to them. Yeah. And he seems very aware 
he seems very, he can come across as very normal and he will go on a tangent that is very, uh, how he would have sounded normally and say, but can you tell when you've seen this, that he's still not normal? Like, is there still something that's a little off? Yeah. There's like nuances, but it's, he's pretty good at acting okay. fine. Like for somebody who's never met him, if you show up to a mental institution, he acted the way he was, you know, people would think, okay, maybe he had a episode with drugs that went awry, mm -hmm. but now it seems like he's, you know, has control of himself. Everything's kind of resolved. So he's probably okay to go home. And then right when he goes home, he starts being like weird as fuck again. Yeah. So that's kind of what happened. And then he gets out and he starts making these progressively interesting health claims in his videos, which are relatively harmless to begin with. It's you seem stuff. normal at that point, though. Seem normal. Like he, he didn't like there, I saw a video that he did with this Kenny K.O. guy. And I know I'm going off topic a little bit where he looked absolutely insane. Like his eyes kept rolling to the side yeah. the whole time. But in these videos with these health claims, like he had a claim where he was uh Drinking other men's semen to get a testosterone boost, was yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, so the nerve growth factor component, the testosterone component, that kind of stuff from the semen, which at the end of the day, none of it is going to exert any kind of pharmacologic effect whatsoever. But he claimed that was basically me getting into this to begin with, is debunking those scientific claims in those videos because he mm -hmm. would make a lot of bold, unfounded claims, increasingly odd and increasingly strange, like to the point where, and they were all factually incorrect. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of doing reaction videos, debunking them because he's a big, you know, name in the fitness industry and he's making all these scientific, you know, bold claims and none of them being uh, justified whatsoever. And then it gets to the point where he's literally talking about eating his own shit for health benefits. He's talking about drinking his own piss, eating other men's semen and justifying it in ways that like, frankly, just don't make sense. Even though yeah. he's trying to, he's trying to intertwine science into some sort of element of like naturalness. Like he thinks, I don't know. Everything he's trying to do is based around like the world has given you what you need with nature and, you know, drugs and big pharma equals bad and blah, blah, blah. And he's, I don't know, has a lot of his claims just basically made no sense. And he was getting progressively Nothing worse with it. makes sense about it because he's acting enlightened, but he's still lying, too. Yeah, that was the weird thing. And he like, would, he would even video... rebut my videos and say, I'm wrong after quoting a study that is literally showing he's incorrect. And then he, he had a video where he was supposedly was going to admit what steroids he used or what not steroids, PEDs he used. That, yeah. And he did he, I, I'm not sure, did he admit it? No, he still skirted around it, which it is. It seemed like he's still like, like when you're enlightened, you become an open book. Yeah. Like essentially you have nothing to hide. Exactly. How so, on earth is that enlightenment? Like Exactly. So a lot of the stuff he does is contradictory to his whole persona of I'm enlightened and I don't care about anything. He would literally say in that video, I don't care about anything. I'm an open book. And then continue to skirt around the <laughs> questions. I'm like, dude, this is like blatantly obvious what's so going on So that is here. psychotic behavior. Yeah. Like yeah. that is very indicative of somebody who has gone through a drug psychosis with lingering mental instabilities, uh, such as a family history of schizophrenia. But we'll get into my prognosis later. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's one of the things, too, is because my original seeing this guy for the first time a very prevalent thing in the fitness industry is guys who build their physiques on performance enhancing drugs. He looked great too. Yeah, looked awesome. And then lie about it and say they're natural to, you know, sometimes you have a justified reason perhaps, or at least you think it is. You don't want to influence the youth to pursue chasing your physique with, you know, exogenous hormones and whatnot. Or you just don't want people to downplay your hard work or, you know, whatever stigma is surrounded around your PED use. Mm -hmm. But in general, a lot of these guys will lie about their use. And with him in particular, I speculated that to be the case even years ago. And now it was just interesting after being coming enlightened, he was still dodging it like a motherfucker. <laughs> and I was like, dude, like at least I sort of called him out. And that was the only reason the video happened. I feel like is because I said, why are you this enlightened guy who still cares about mm -hmm. keeping this a secret? And then he's like, you know what? I'm going to tell you all this stuff. And then he talked about some very harmless, like introductory compounds which most people wouldn't even consider really. So you think he never, he didn't, he actually didn't admit what he took. No. So he kind of, I think he, he did. downplayed it by saying, I took these light things as a way to hide the worst substances. Yeah. I think he probably took the light stuff too. No, of course. Yeah. But I think he definitely dabbled in some more uh, exotic intense shit. So anyway, what do you there... think? What do you think he took? Um, to be honest, I think he probably took the basic kind of uh, go-to stuff, you know, probably exogenous testosterone, something like that, a very like introductory steroid, 
I can't imagine he really went that far out. His physique wasn't insane. He didn't make any drastic changes before and after. No kind trembolone? Of, no, <laughs> I have probably not, to be honest. I would imagine no, but that's because... When he's, it's not like there's a lot of historical data to even reference in terms of he started his YouTube channel and he was already jacked. Yeah. So it's not like I can see it before and after of like all of a sudden you jumped up this disproportionate amount. Mm -hmm. The interesting with, thing with him was he started out big and like perfect essentially in terms of what any guy would want to look like and then degraded quickly despite yeah. still being fitness oriented. Like he was still posting his shirtless videos, still working out. But he didn't look as good. No, he like blatantly lost maybe like five, 10 pounds of muscle, got yeah. a bit softer. And that's like exactly what you would expect from a guy who still looks great by all means. Like he looked good even as a natural, but he definitely, there was a big step down and his justification at the time skirting around it with ridiculous claims about it's lighting, I'm bulking this, that. And it's like, okay, why have you never looked as good as you did at, you know, 21? Has anyone ever asked him if you're so enlightened, then why are you still lying? Me. <laughs> you asked him that. Well, in my video, yeah, but that's <laughs> that's pretty much the only thing. So did he answer you? No, like he did his response videos, which were him in like a like a bandana with like a fucking shaman cloak on and talking about his uh, you know beginner use or just skirting around it. Frankly, now was there any anything that hinted towards him cascading down so far? in his earlier videos like was there any kind of peeks into his a mental instability that just hadn't been exacerbated by drugs yet um did, did he look like the kind of guy who would go insane if he tripped or if you were to like you know take a stab you would say he should be able to handle his compounds just fine um that would be tough for me to say because i'm so inexperienced with psychedelics but i would assume if um like he seemed pretty pretty like i don't know fine like, eccentric though yeah but that's the thing so if you go into this experience caring a lot about things like i don't know your inherent value based on how you look and things of that nature is that necessarily dictating that you're going to have a bad experience or is that going to be dictated by the guy who is guiding you or what exactly because that's a combination of, of yeah. a few things but did was he a very one-dimensional person i think a lot of people would say that yeah and i think his his whole thing was he was finding a lot of ep emptiness in what he was doing yeah because it's not like he's providing value he's providing like i guess you could say is entertaining but he was clearly not too happy with the fact that his videos all revolved around just like talking to girls getting girls being shirtless with girls that's it. Like you're not providing any harm reduction. You're not providing any uh, education. You're not providing any sort of information. You're not providing any value above and beyond. You take your shirt off and people like you because your shirt's off. So yeah, also a sign of an egotistical person though, because he, he wanted to be valued mm. with more than just his body. Like he wanted to gain that authoritarian view. Like he wanted people to look at him like, Oh, this guy is so knowledgeable. He's yeah. beautiful. He's knowledgeable. He wanted to be like the whole package. Like, I think so. It sounds like someone who's absolutely obsessed with himself. Yeah, that sounds uh, about right. Because it seems like a lot of what he was upset with before his like mental break the first time was before the whole I'm going to kill myself claim. Mm -hmm. He was saying how he's achieved everything. He has all this money. He has all this fame. And none of it means anything. And he's unhappy. And it's all, you know, pointless and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to do this. And then after that, he becomes enlightened. And all of a sudden, he has this newfound knowledge to spread and, uh, you know, spirituality to, you know, impart on the public. So he became a guru, essentially. Yeah, exactly. So he becomes a spiritual guru who is more multifaceted than just his body, which I guess is the ultimate goal for him, perhaps. Yeah. And then throughout that, you know, his increasingly bold health claims turned into him starting to just do like really weird shit where he was just micro dosing consistently the more recent scenario. And I don't know what he's actually taking. His claim was taking ayahuasca every two hours, which I think you're going to be able to touch on if that's a realistic thing that you could even tolerate and or do and or what it seemed like he was on. I can try. Yeah. I don't <laughs> but know. that's kind of unheard of. Yeah. Like to me, it seemed kind of insane. And I don't even know anything about psychedelics. Everything to be about him seems kind of insane, though. It, like it's definitely too. on par with his, his current persona. Yeah. So it's interesting timing how we arrived at this podcast because literally today he had a video premiering called R.I.P. Connor Murphy and basically getting to the part where uh, for about a, maybe a week span, he was microdosing every single day 
and posting literally every half an hour to an hour on his Instagram and YouTube, these like clearly just under the influence videos that are so out there and make no sense, making claims about celebrities, saying Robin Williams is alive and like he's somebody lied about his death and Jake Paul raped them and like all this weird shit. That makes no sense. It's just like out of nowhere. None of it makes any sense. Exactly. So he has all these bold claims in these videos and he has all this weird shit going on. He's giving out his credit card information. He's holding Zoom conferences with like that are public for all of his followers so to join. You're here trying to summarize, but there's so much. Yeah. So there's it so sounds much. like I'm rambling, and but I am because I'm just trying to sort of consolidate it into somewhat of a palatable amount of information. It's really hard because he's done a lot of crazy stuff in the past couple months here. So anyways, he's really out there. Yeah. And the police have visited him multiple times. And every time they show up, he, you know, turns it on and is like, this he turns is, on the act. Yeah. This is all for YouTube. And, you know, this is uh, nothing to worry about. This is all for uh, teaching some, you know, greater message and blah, blah, blah. And um, I guess they can't really arrest him for just being weird. So, yeah. so anyways, I mean, if they deem that he's a danger to others, then that's when they would put him in the mental yeah. hospital himself or others. Yeah. And they did. Right. A yeah, so he ended up getting help as at least his, I don't know, that's what, uh, there's this girl named Jane who was staying with him and basically trying to make sure he was not harming himself or other people. She was kind okay. of just like babysitting him, I guess, and he... So like a never-ending trip sitter? Yeah, <laughs> he he actually proposed to her live too and said, we're getting married and blah, blah, blah. And um, anyways, obviously, you know, totally not happening, but she says he's you know, becoming increasingly volatile in terms of his just actions and whatnot. And it's dangerous to be around him. And then the most recent update, his sister, Connor Murphy's sister said he's getting help and he's uh, in a, presumably an institution again and like stop messaging, messaging us about it. Cause I guess people are harassing her about it, which is understandable, I guess, considering he's, uh, you know, literally like the center of the focus of the fitness industry, interestingly enough for, stuff non-fitness related entirely and now he's out of the institution supposedly better and then he posts i'm in this like weird private group with him that he put me in for some reason <laughs> where he's like he's posting private conversations to like his cult and i'm in it with like tiger woods and like disney world and like all these weird like accounts for no reason he has, he has a cult though yeah some of them are actually legitimately supportive of this and they're like he has risen again blah 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 and um what a weird situation yeah so in that group he says i have evolved and basically is coming out with his i don't know how can you become super physiologically enlightened like i don't i don't fucking know but now he's even more so than before and he has this video again that's been ready to premiere that i had loaded up and i haven't watched it you haven't watched it <laughs> It's only about 50, it's only 55 seconds. I figured we could react to it live. That is a short video. Yeah, and I don't know what it is, but I'll try and, uh, we can like overlay it, I guess. Can you just like move over here? Yeah, sure. This is uh, the video he premiered today, which I have not watched and you have not watched either. So we're not doing Instagram, we're just doing this? This is okay. the one from today, and then we can give examples of his kind of progression on Instagram afterwards so you can get an idea of where his mindset has gone to get to this point he's at now in this video he premiered today. And, and just to be totally clear to everybody watching, why are we doing this? <laughs> um, mainly because the hi hybrid between fitness content and psychedelic content, like I thought, I've already been reacting to this stuff and I thought getting your insight on his mental state in terms of harm reduction, who is a viable candidate for a psychedelic experience, why would you want to do it? Like, for example, if you're micro dosing something like LSD, a lot more harmless than an ayahuasca trip, presumably. Yeah. So you want me to give a diagnosis of whether or not this is a feasible outcome for an average person or how to avoid this or. Yeah. Something like if you wanted to pursue something like that, what had to an ayahuasca trip? That yeah. Is. So why would you do that exactly? What kind of individual benefit from it versus perhaps be harmed? Mm -hmm. And then how do you prepare for it? Um, or and explain maybe why this happened to him. Like yeah, reasons yeah. Reasons for this, this reaction. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But you can call me Sevenson. Dear Evan Hansen, Connor Murphy has committed suicide. But it is Connor Murphy's wish that only three videos are released 
and these videos contain Blue's Clues. The first 555 to solve the puzzle will receive some of Connor's 5 million remaining ghost coins. Okay, by the way, to give context, he claims he has multiple millions of Dogecoin, which is his, uh, like, he's been giving away his money, essentially, and, like, he gave away his credit card information. Now, there's two-factor authentication and stuff, which prevents people from just grabbing his stuff when he posted, lo he, he posted logins to all of his social media, all of his bank accounts, and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And he was screen recording him approving payment requests from people who are trying to like take money from him essentially. And he's saying here he's going to be giving away his Dogecoin, which I don't think there's any proof that he actually has this balance, but he claims that he has seven million, which now is worth what, like, I don't know, five million dollars or I don't, actually, I don't follow it. Didn't it get cut in half? Or yeah, something? it got it tanked real. Yeah, recently. so maybe it's worth three or four. Yeah, but it's still a lot of money. It's a ton of money. It's more money than I have. What, <laughs> what, what, what is this? The title of the video is Giving Away Seven Million Dogecoin. This is Elon speaking. Ha ha. A musically scientific perfection. Yeah, so this is an example of some of the stuff he's been, <laughs> he's been posting in the past month here. And again, a bold claim that's probably not true. What does that even mean? A musically scientific perfection. Who knows, dude? I don't, I don't <laughs> understand what any of this means. No, What's yeah. with the Elon Musk joke? Why is that funny? <laughs> I don't, I don't get e it. Because Elon pumps Dogecoin, I guess. But this, I don't know if this is a movie, by the way. Like, we're sort of learning about this development as we go. So we can sort of get our live reaction. But this is a... I, I honestly, I don't know if there's something wrong with my ears, but I couldn't understand a word that that was being said there. No, I'm going to turn it up and maybe play it again. But it sounded like he was giving details to how to collect his Dogecoin. But he's basing, I don't know if he's going off of the script for this movie that's premiering on September, but there's a guy in the movie named Connor Murphy who dies by suicide and leaves a note in the pocket of or wait, here it is. Evan's classmate Connor Murphy gets a hold of one of his notes and dies by suicide with the note in his pocket, leading Connor's parents to believe it was a suicide note addressed to Evan. Soon, Evan gets caught in a complicated lie pretending to have been Connor's friend and forming a fabricated relationship with the Murphy family. And for whatever reason, Connor's been promoting this movie in his videos, so he's sort of intertwining a storyline of Jesus mixed with this vi movie that hasn't come out yet somehow. Is this a big budget movie? It's by Universal, so I guess so. Maybe I would. The trailer for it has like eight million views, so I would imagine it's pretty big. But coincidence that the guy's name is Connor Murphy? I would imagine so. He does not seem to think it's the case. He thinks he's involved in some capacity. But he also thinks he's Jesus, so that's not too exactly far fetched. Yeah. So let's turn it up a bit. And basically, from what I can tell, he has altered his voice and he's overlaying it here. Too. No, I'm sure that's his real voice, man. <laughs> And uh, so talking about up. how to uh, get his Dogecoin based on clues he's going to be leaving for but something. But the title is Rest in Peace, Connor Murphy. I thought it was different. Or was that a different video? No, that's literally it. I'm seeing it for the first time as you, dude. What so. was the other video we just saw? There was another one that was scientifically... Oh, that's him showing it in this video. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. I guess let's start from scratch here. Are there captions? I'm going to try and turn them on. Apparently not. Yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, good luck to YouTube trying to caption this. I know. So. But you can call me Sevenson. Dear Evan Hansen, Connor Murphy has committed suicide. But it is Connor Murphy's wish that only three videos are released. And these videos contain Blue's Clues. The first 555 to solve the puzzle will receive some of Connor's five. No. Is that Edward I mean, Snowden talking? Sure. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, and Connor's been doing this weird, like, Matthew McConaughey accent, too, since he's been doing these microdose trips, talking like a, uh, I don't know, Matthew McConaughey, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, no for, shit. So he has that, plus the voice alteration, and he's trying to talk about how he's not Connor Murphy, he's Connor Murph free from, I don't know, constraints of... Whatever. Hold on, and he's showing a picture of himself back when he was on roids, or is that him now? Yeah, that's an old picture. 
Okay. So this is what he used to look like, by the way. And he's talking about how he's going to release these clues to get his 7 million Dogecoin because for whatever reason, giving away a bunch of crypto accomplishes some greater good. In these videos contain Blue's clues. The first 555 to solve the puzzle will receive some of Connor's 5 million remaining Dogecoin. The secret lies with Greensboro. Hashtag national pleasure. Remember, I love golf. Life is a play. And we are the actors. I would like to wish you a merry 12th day of Christmas since you've heard from the last. So he's laying out some sort of puzzle framework for, I guess he's, he claims he's given away 2 million Dogecoin already, which I can't imagine is true, but he, uh, I don't know. He says he likes golf, which, you know, he does like golf. <laughs> what know. did this have to do with him dying? I don't fucking know, dude. That Okay, I'm not quite sure how to react to this because that made no that's, sense to Yeah, me. exactly. That's why it's kind of tough. But that is, that's what he's laid out here in terms of he is achieving some greater good. He's literally messaged me directly and said, say you're in on it or you're going to look stupid. So in on what exactly? What are you accomplishing by giving away a bunch of money in some like cryptic fashion? I'm not really sure, but if you see some of his old stuff, I'm about to jump to the Instagram here, you get some ideas of uh, what exactly this guy's mental state is. Yeah, I mean, let's react to something that shows like a more... Yeah, so I'm going to start uh, the screen recording right now on my phone. Yeah, a, a better example of like him, because I couldn't even, that wasn't even him. That was some weird voiceover. Okay, so this is an Instagram page, and he posts like 50 times a day at this point, or at least when he was majorly under the influence, he was posting that much. And recently, he's posted these. I'll go back to some of the more stuff before he went into the, uh, I don't know, get help. Okay, that is just a picture, but let's see. Um... <laughs> So that's one that's one example. <laughs> so it's just a mishmash of insanity. So yeah, it's almost like unrecognizable and he's going up to even girls in the park and doing like Why's he got audio overlaying audio? Good question. All right, pause that, please. I feel like I'm losing brain cells watching yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, you probably are. But um, yeah, he's still doing what he sort of used to do in terms of going up to girls randomly. I'm also I'm not sure if I should laugh at this because it actually looks like someone who does need some form of uh, real assistance. No, absolutely. Like here, he's talking about um, um. Actually, let's see what other ones has he posted. <laughs> So I think people can get the idea. So in New Zealand, what we would say is he's lost the plot, bro. He's yeah. totally lost the plot. Can we react to like a, a one of those YouTube videos, maybe? Sure. Where he actually makes sense. Let's find one that makes sense. Okay, so going because yeah, I I totally get. I don't think we need to see more of that. He, no, he makes no sense. Yeah, it's a bunch of nonsense, and he'll make he'll say stuff about celebrities that is not true, or you know. I don't know what the point of it is or what he's accomplishing by that. I don't know what the point of any of that was. Um, no, Adobe Flash, I don't want to update. Fuck. I think we can confidently say that he's experiencing psychosis. Probably more than that. 
Yeah, probably. And he started this thing called Prim. I forgot to mention he started this thing called Primisati Yoga, where he basically gets girls to like sit on his lap and like stare into his eyes, and they just do like breathing exercises essentially. And it is, you know, like very sexual. And then he posts the the raw like actual like fucking on his OnlyFans account. Yeah. So, wow. so a lot of people think this is to promote his OnlyFans to generate revenue as well, which is plausible because he is, in fact, generating revenue off of it and does promote it quite heavily. But it's above and beyond that, I think. Like, it's uh, at this point, he's just posting nonsense that has absolutely nothing to do with promotion. So, like, Connor Murphy versus Sam Harris, Joe Rogan decides if God exists. Here's an example. Why, hello! Mr. Joe Rogan. And by the way, this is not even a recent one where he's been microdosing all day long. This is him when he was sort of normal, I guess. Or at least more normal than now. Nah. And Mr. Samuel Harris. It is hard to see I am blinded by this light. But it shall be worth it if I run into a tree. It is for the good of the world. We're saving the world, everyone. So, if you don't know me, I'm a... Connor Murphy, also I'm God in every sense of the word, the metaphysical sense of the word God, and actually the material version of God, like the Christian God. Yeah, that's right, Sam. Howdy-do. You thought I didn't exist, but I do. But you don't believe that now. But before I get into the plan, let me tell you a little bit of who, about who I am. I am Connor Murphy. I uh, started out as a Christian, turned into an atheist because, yeah. The dogmatic Christianity of the world is a little, a little off, we could say. And then uh, recently I've had quite the spiritual awakening, and I realized, whoa! About the biggest spiritual awakening you could have, that, whoa, uh, you're God, crazy, yeah. But anyway, I've been pretty crazy over the past year. He's pretty truthful so far. That was a relatively good summary of what he, like... But he's, he's also, he's also, like, actually able to... Tell the truth here. He's saying he has been crazy over the past year, mm -hmm. and he's saying you're not going to believe that I'm God, but I am God. Yeah. And there's some truth to that from like a psychedelic context. Like what he's saying isn't totally out there. You have a lot of people who have these experiences who come back and say, "I just experienced being one with all of everything. Mm -hmm. I am now God," is what yeah. they would say. But they would also say you are also God, and it seemed like he was almost saying that you were God. So essentially, the psychedelic he has experience been that to people, by the has way. he? So yeah. you can break it down into you realize on a very fundamental level, like if I'm going to relate this in a way that a layman can understand, it's it's hard because there's really very few words that accurately describe what these all-encompassing, one-with-everything experiences feel like. And it just, it sounds crazy and repetitive. Like this is why people, I'm trying to defend, like let's start off by defending him a little bit. Yeah. So from that angle, when you say you were God, you could actually translate that into if you believe in the Big Bang, at one point everything was part of everything. Right. And we have as much like on a top, like if you break it down into atoms and electrons, we have as much in common with each other as we do this table. Hmm. So when he says I am God, he people essentially mean I am the same as everything. And I essentially am you you're me and if you were to like zoom in with a microscope on a metaphysical level you would see that our consciousnesses are actually shared it's just that time is not a how do you describe this time is not a linear thing but we experience time in a linear way when we're alive but after you're dead time all just becomes this continuous thing where there's no past present or future and i'm experiencing this life and then your life all simultaneously but in this human experience in order for this to actually work you got to break it down and like like you know time how we operate there's one thing happens after the other otherwise this world would fall apart right so these are the kinds of experiences you have and whether there's any validity to that experience like whether anything I just said actually makes sense or if it's just a really fancy thought or these are all just feelings that you have that you're trying to transition into words, which um, at that point it just falls to pieces because words can't translate the feelings. The weird thing is how he feels obligated to impart that perspective on everyone though. Yeah. Like it's, you mentioned before how 
if you were truly enlightened, you wouldn't feel the need to share it with everyone and kind of prove that you've undergone this metamorphosis into like an enlightened being and trying to teach people how to be like you sort of the actual word of enlightened like yeah. people who are enlightened wouldn't actually call themselves enlightened because yeah. i mentioned to you the very when you're in when you're in that psychedelic state you realize that the very act of saying oh my god i am everything means that an actual ego persona has to voice those words, meaning your individualized self has to think those words, and the very act of thinking them and voicing them means you are no longer everything by the very fact that you are a person saying it. Yeah. Like, if you could voice, oh my God, I am God, and for it to mean anything true, then, like, everybody would have to voice it at the same time. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, from that aspect, as soon as you take any one individual... And you follow the belief that if they follow the belief that they are God, in essence, it kind of takes away the whole experience. Like it nullifies the whole thing yeah. because any individual can't be God because as an individual, you are not everything. You are you. He's describing it in a framework as if your current state as the layman is suboptimal to his state too. So saying you need to get to this point if you want to be as you know a superior being like i am but sort from of. a true enlightened state the the true like enlightened ones yeah. meaning um somebody who reaches a state they would call it satori or a kensho awakening or any of he the, talks about that a lot too he so does satori, yeah. okay so any of the ascended masters of old like who did ramdas follow some baba something what was his name see now i can't remember i'm drawing a blank whatever his guru's name was um, these are people who claim to be really channeled in to uh, the state that he claims to be channeled into. But when they're actually in that state, they not only don't have to share it with anybody. I'm actually losing my complete train of thought right now. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Like if you go out of your way to tell everyone about how what you're doing is this better version of you and or, you know, this is something to achieve that is superior to your current state of mind, then mm -hmm. you're sort of defeating the purpose of doing it to begin with. Yeah, I had another point I was making, but I'm drawing a blank. It'll come to me. Yeah. See, I'm having a great difficulty putting this, like verbalizing it because I want to be careful not to, not to completely dismiss his experience. Because yeah. it does seem like he's had, there, there's some truth to his experience. He's just gone around translating it in a very poor way. And this is largely due to, like we already said, somebody who already comes into it from a very egotistical standpoint. Um, how this would look different, like say somebody who wasn't so egocentric to, to start with, if they had the experience, uh, they first of all might have a little bit of an urge to share it because it's kind of like, imagine you just discovered this new great, um, I don't know, product that had like yeah. no side effects that gave you the best workout gains you could possibly imagine mm -hmm. would you not want to share that yeah i would yeah definitely. and imagine like everyone you're sharing it with doesn't believe you and you're just like in your head you're like it's so easy you just take this thing mm. and then all of your worries are gone and like you're the most beautiful version of yourself you would want to share it right so it can right. be a frustrating point where i feel like he's reached that level of frustration too because he tried to share it with his family like i can relate i've had those enlightened states and i wanted to share it with everybody Hmm. And you soon realize um, you can you can actually get derailed from your mission because like your mission of wanting to share it because it's like no one no one can hear you. Yeah. It feels like you're just talking talking a different language because no one can actually understand. And then you get to the point where it's like the only way to truly share this is to have other people you know undergo the experience. And this is where things get interesting because even if he were to give his family an ayahuasca trip, there's a really high chance they wouldn't have the same all enlightening thing that he had because there's really people have written books like timothy leary and, and uh richard alpert wrote the psychedelic experience which was based off the tibetan book of the dead where they tried to show ways to program your psychedelic trip to reach these various states but it largely fell on deaf ears because it seems like unless you are truly at the right point in your life to experience that back of a better term enlightenment, yeah. no amount of psychedelics will get you there. Like you would argue you can just take a higher dose and get enlightened. Now you might just get psychosis. You really got to be at that level before you take it, which kind of translates into already um, following meditative practices and um, 
how someone could go about reaching it from a healthy perspective would probably be that they would already have an interest in meditating. Um, they'd follow some form of Eastern philosophy. And then when they had that experience, they would realize that it's not all about them. Right. So for with, I don't want to belabor the, like show too many of the videos. Cause if you really want to dig into, he's posted like hundreds of videos. So it's hard to just pick out one and summarize it all. Yeah. I understand this is a bit unorganized, but I'm trying my best to make it palatable. To we kind are, of... we are putting together such a good job for the editor. <laughs> like that's essentially what this comes down to. <laughs> so yeah. So basically he hit his breaking point where he was trying to enlighten everyone around him. No one was getting it. According to him, he ends up having a mental break or staging this, you know, event becomes progressively worse, gets to the point now where he is supposedly microdosing every two hours, which um, is that even possible? Microdosing ayahuasca, or do you think it is a different drug entirely based on his behavior? So you got to look at tolerance and psychedelics all are very non-addictive. They're almost anti-addictive because you build an immediate tolerance to it. For example, if you were to take ayahuasca two days in a row, the second day, yeah. you would have to take maybe twice as much to reach the same level of effects. Wait, is that accurate though? I don't want to spew nonsense. It's accurate for LSD. Um, there are some drugs that don't have the same level of tolerance, and ayahuasca might have less of a tolerance than some of the other ones. Um, but in general, psychedelics can't be taken in in succession like this. Um, tolerance and addiction potential. I don't know if I should dig into this. See, the thing is, ayahuasca actually uses DMT as it's. They call it the the light, and it is DMT. And DMT, you actually don't get much of a tolerance. Like, I could smoke DMT every hour and have very little, if any, tolerance. So it's one of the rare psychedelics where you can experience it consecutively. Tolerance so of the effects do not wouldn't. build up with repeated use, and this compound can therefore be used repeatedly to there any we go. extent. Does not present a cross-tolerance with other psychedelics, meaning that after the consumption <laughs> of ayahuasca, psychedelics will not have a reduced effect. That's very interesting. That's what I thought. So... Uh, Something like LSD will give you an instant tolerance. You mm -hmm. can't do it two days in a row, but ayahuasca might just be that rare one where you can. Hmm. But every two hours, um, the the trip lasts longer than two hours. So it would be redundant to be dosing again? At a microdose level? I would think so. Maybe it would just keep the microdose going. Um, my concern would be the monone monoamine oxidase inhibitors that are present. Like he would have to change his diet. And yeah, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know if he's been eating because he actually. By the way, another thing he did, he did a forty-day fast to replicate, the, like the, basically like going by Bible stuff and trying to replicate things. Huh. And he so he did this forty-day fast to show. And by the way, fasting does have like legitimate health benefits, but you don't necessarily need to starve yourself for forty days to accomplish autophagy or any of these you know cell repair processes. But he goes like way overboard, does this 40 day fast, loses like 50 pounds or something. Insane shows how you can survive it, which is fine, like whatever. But it's just another example of some of the stuff he's, you know, justified in his mind as, um, you know, things to pursue. So I don't even know if he is eating while he's using this stuff. Like he's clearly proven that he can go long spans of time without. Because there's, I, I, I don't know if you've researched this, there's ayahuasca diets. Like you don't eat any smoked meats. Oh, you don't, right. you're not supposed to drink beer. You couldn't mix ayahuasca with uh, stimulants and it be, it's because of the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Is it just uh, the tyramine component or what? what yeah, is, yeah, exactly. Okay. The, is that what it is? I think off the top of my head, I might be wrong on that. There's something that, uh, uh, let's see. Is that what's in Turkey? Um. I would be probably speaking out my ass if I said, so Starts I'm not going to say. I think you're right. Yeah. It's a tyramine. And I want, oh, it's got to be it. I would think the MAOI diet. As a result, there are no known fatalities as a result of eating foods containing tyramine with taking ayahuasca, but it's still wise to practice caution, especially. Um, yeah, the main culprits are going to be people who are on antidepressants. The right. mix of the MAOIs can cause serotonin syndrome. Okay. And people have died from taking antidepressants and ayahuasca or things like amphetamines and ayahuasca can cause that. Um, the food is a big precaution. Like they also say don't don't have caffeine, as it says there. Mm -hmm. But it is doubtful if you would actually die. It might just be a little uncomfortable. Um, but the ayahuasca diet even says stuff like, I don't even know if you can have salt. Like it's a really oh, strict wow. diet. But this is all from a traditional like shamanistic standpoint and how they've done it for centuries via the tribe. Um, if you're going to have a Westerner 
try ayahuasca, they're probably not going to follow it. I mean, some people do, but it's arguable if you have to follow it to that degree. Right. Um, so maybe he is taking ayahuasca every two hours. So hypothetically with this guy, like obviously you don't have a ton of context in terms of his mindset beforehand, you know, his uh, who was guiding him on it or whatever, but you kind of get the idea that he was, you know, a very more one dimensional guy prior to the spiritual experience. Yeah. If he goes into it with everything dialed in, except for being that, you know, egocentric guy, would you still have a bad experience or what would be the outcome potentially in a, could you achieve some benefit or would it still be a bad idea? First of all, I don't think I'm an expert. I just no, want to yeah, preface yeah. it by saying that I have, I'm no expert. These drugs affect everybody in a very unique and different way. And I don't know if you really could foresee this happening from an outside perspective, because what it really looks like has happened is it's brought to the surface some form of latent condition, like perhaps schizophrenia. And keep in mind what we call schizophrenia. I was telling you this back in ancient cultures, they were revered. They were right. like the mystics. So we have now boxed all of these symptoms in like with dementia schizophrenia and some of these people actually have very different experiences we just we're obsessed with labels so we slap this they're schizophrenic it's a way for us to understand something that we can't understand mm. but i actually personally believe there's some truth to the way that they used to be viewed that they are tapping into something more and that's probably because of my own psychedelic experiences which show you this reality is actually nothing like we think it is. Mm. Like, especially in our societies, we've really diced up and sliced this reality into a digestible format that might hold no true, like, efficacy to... How do I say this in a way that doesn't sound crazy? I can't. <laughs> I'm going to sound fucking crazy <laughs> now. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's kind of hard to just ballpark what's going to happen now. It's so. hard, but I, I don't think that his reaction is normal. What has happened to him is a very atypical reaction. And I think he has schizophrenia is, is my, just from like a initial reaction, like knee jerk reaction, he is experiencing either a prolonged bout of psychosis, but it's more likely it's brought his schizophrenia to the surface. And then the question is, can psychedelics cause schizophrenia? And once you get to his point, can you get back to baseline ever? Because what's happening is he's, uh, I'll answer that question, but he's mixing some truth in with falsehood. Yeah. Like the whole we are all one, there's truth to that, but it's not in the way that he's depicting it. So it's almost like he's very confused. It's like he got, there's a Carl Jung quote. It says, beware of unearned wisdom. And it seems like he has actually gotten injected with a dose of, something spectacular mm -hmm. like you can't take away that he had a spectacular experience for something to change him to the extent that it changed him like a total 180 yeah and this is a guy who actually seemed to be a normal again very hedonistic style lifestyle but yeah. a, a normal by our society standards which is you know to call someone sane in an insane world is no measure of sanity but you know like i'd say the average male in their 20s is not so dissimilar to him in terms of mental stability. So like he was propped up on all the success going into it, but I don't think there's a ton of individuals who've done the ayahuasca trips necessarily that are like, I don't know, like a lot of people are still as hedonistic as him just to a, haven't experienced the degree of success he had at such a young age. It's almost like a warning marker to our society. I wonder if it had to do with just the way that we live. It kind of like built up built him up to this point where he was like just a pile of dominoes ready to crash down. Um, oh, it's really hard to just p answer that. Cause I think anybody could say, Oh, I'm not as hedonistic as Connor was, but it's like how many dudes still care about, you know, the nice cars, getting girls, getting tons of money, blah, blah, blah. All the kind of standard wants of a young 20 something. Yeah, and it's our society that kind of defines what our wants and needs are. And that's, yeah. So does that disqualify yeah. anyone from having a positive experience? I would imagine no. I just. But here's the thing. Usually when people have these experiences, when they're in a healthy state of mind, they reel back. Yeah. And our society is, is very enticing to the point where it's like you can actually feel like you were enlightened, but then spend a month back in your old life and you're going to forget all of the positive lessons you might have learned. Right. So it's almost like what happened to him was so 
spectacular in the sense where it affected him to such a great degree that not even our society was able to snap him back and pull him back into his old ways of thinking. And um, that's not going to happen to everybody. By the way, I have an answer to the uh, fixing your if you were coming off of amphetamines and had significantly downregulated dopaminergic activity, how oh, to. Yeah, what's that? So Seroquel 50 to 100 milligrams before bed and time away from dopaminergic drugs. Drugs Seroquel inhibits, uh, inhibits activity at the receptors a bit at that dose enough to super physiologically cause them to upregulate, but it'll make the person drowsy and most people don't want to tolerate it. If they upregulate neurogenesis, they will also likely recover faster due to more plasticity in the brain. I'd use cere cerebral lysin on weekends and not take the Seroquel. It's Seroquel, isn't that an antidepressant? Yeah, but I guess it would be antagonizing whatever process is keeping you. I'd have to look at the pharmacology. This is just an answer I got in two seconds from oh, Leo. I appreciate it, thank you. But um, yes, yeah, cerebral lysin, by the way, is a actually nerve growth factor. So Connor Murphy talking about ingesting semen to get nerve growth factor, mm -hmm. obviously it doesn't actually work, but cerebral lysin is literally derived from, uh, well, it's actually derived from pig brains, interestingly, which, you know, it's hmm. kind of, can be a bit sketchy if you think of it like that, but it does have legitimate nerve growth factor that does significantly increase neuroplasticity to a point that it appears to be even more effective than, have you ever heard of, um, fuck, it's escaping me. The thing that people used to come off of Kratom and opiates. What the fuck is they it They use Kratom to come off of opiates. No, that's the, the typical like downgrade. I'm talking about to actually like stop being addicted entirely. It's called um, Ibogaine. Ibogaine. Okay. Ibogaine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is a superior, well actually I'm just, I don't actually know if it's superior, but anecdotally it seems to be a safer alternative to resetting yourself. Is is what, sorry? Cerebral lysin. You gotta send me a link, never heard of this. Yeah, so it's uh, something we've discussed on one of my podcasts a couple times i'll send you a couple links but it's mm -hmm. not my expertise it's one of my co-hosts who's like really into this stuff and he Sweet. yeah but it's he says it's like a miracle game changer really yeah like significantly so and he's seen people who are like heavily addicted to things just be like perfect i gotta try it then yeah not that i'm addicted to the amphetamines anymore but i want that damage reverse yeah even like central nervous system fatigue and like heavy duty power lifters and strongman and stuff it yeah. appears to attenuate that like much mm. quicker than just resting which you know obviously normally you would have to take time off from being, being just fried but this stuff can actually help you recover significantly quicker so what downsides are there to super physiologic amounts of uh um like nerve growth factor and whatnot and neurogenesis. Like I imagine there's always a push pull with, you know, cancer cell growth and, or, you know, like brain health or one or the other, but so far so good in terms of anecdotally, it seems to work pretty well. I will at least send you the information, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I any, tried it. Yeah. Um, if I knew more about it, I'd love to, you know, detail it and deep dive into it right now. But I just learned about it recently for the first time too, Sweet, but it no looks, worries. looks extremely promising. Going back to the Connor thing. So, we mentioned how he, like you kind of know what kind of a guy he was prior, at least with the minimal amounts of information we have. We can see he was like a hyper successful young YouTuber, got everything he ever wanted, you know, at least by the hedonistic standards of a young 20 something, ends up going on the spiritual journey to find higher meaning. Which also maybe he felt empty because he got everything he always wanted. And I think you're oh, yeah. saying that. Grass and is always greener. And then once you get what, this is actually something that is definitely true is once you achieve an end goal, life becomes so much more meaningless almost. Mm -hmm. And also I wanted to point or add on that his behavior. <sighs> this I cup don't... works really well, by the way. It's like perpetually like really hot. I know, it's so cool. I love these cups. Um, it seems like he's someone who has realized that this is all, um, again, in the stance of defending him, it yeah. seems like he's realized it's all a game. So what people who commonly have these enlightening experiences come to is this belief that reality isn't as important as they thought it was. That it's more so like you would say, we're living in a simulation. This is all just for fun. Yeah. And the oh, point of life that. is there's no point to life. He says that. The okay. interesting thing about it, though, is he says people's justification for why he's not enlightened is why do you care still about things like how you look like he's got a hair transplant recently. Yeah. which obviously is something. But if, why does he care about people believing he's enlightened? 
both are weird contradictory things yeah so it's like why do you care about what you look like still when you're supposedly enlightened and then why do you also care about people knowing you're enlightened because i'm gonna answer that. there's no such thing as being enlightened yeah there's, there's not but he his his outline of it is we're in this simulation and why not enjoy it the most you can by upgrading your character right that's right. his stance in terms so he's, of he's mixing this is what i was saying he's mixing truth with falsehood mm -hmm. so the truth is yeah maybe we are like i mean truth is subjective every yeah. single human alive is going to have their own truth because we all have our own perspectives of seeing the world so there's always going to be different truths no matter any way you slice it unless like i could become you i can never view your truth mm -hmm. so coming prefacing it with that it's like he's mixing his truth in with things that just are blatant contradictions which that's kind of what makes him look crazy yeah because I think what he's experienced in its own right, that kind of experience, I don't think it's crazy. I think you can have these experiences. You can you can come down from them. You can come back from them. And I think these types of experiences where you realize that everything's not all about you, I think they can be beneficial for growth. Like personally speaking, uh, they can help you in the sense they can also just get you out of your own your own head and they can turn you from being a selfish person into a more caring loving person because hey if i'm everybody and i'm also you if i talk mean to you and i'm an asshole to you i'm actually being an asshole to myself literally right, right. so when you have that experience and you're like oh you're just an incarnation of me i'm gonna want to be nicer to you because you're me yeah so even if you're totally selfish i selfishly want to be nicer to you because you're me so it's like it can have that effect mm -hmm. but he never it doesn't seem like he's had that effect, but maybe it does because he's giving his money away. If it seems like he is, I have no actual factual proof he is, but he's posted screenshots showing approvals of payments to people. There's definitely people trying to hack his stuff because he's giving away passwords and whatnot. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't know where it's evolving. He seems to continuously make it seem like every end is not actually the end of his grandmaster plan it's just another cog in the thing his and grandmaster plan then it just keeps going and keeps he's going also a kid like he, when i look at him i see it i think he's like 25 or 26 he's very young he again beware of unearned wisdom he doesn't know how to handle some of the information that he's gotten because mm -hmm. yeah. if he did i don't believe he would be acting this way yeah yeah it seems like it's like overload for him yeah it was overload and now he's like if i were to like guess at like try to foresee where this is going to go like what's going to happen next um it seems like he's probably going to be in a mental institution at some point it looks like the behavior is going to lead to more erratic and dangerous for his content like it seems like he's going to get deleted from youtube yeah i'm sure it almost feels like it's up. his mission to get deleted from youtube mm -hmm. like maybe that's what he wants because some of that shit just looks yeah why isn't he getting striked? Yeah, he literally posted a story pretending he was being kidnapped and tagged the police department in his state. And he's still on YouTube? Yeah. Well, that was on Instagram he did that, but uh, but still. That doesn't make yeah. any fucking sense. <laughs> yeah. Like, he, he, it was blatantly... Um, like it, He's a pretty convincing actor if you don't know what's going on. Like If you mm. just saw the video randomly, he was like screaming and crying, like, come help me, blah, blah, blah. And then literally tags like Austin police department. And yeah, I don't know. So he he also dropped an N bomb too on okay. his Instagram. So he's obviously looking for reactions. He's obviously yeah. looking for attention. Like there's all this, there's a lot of compounding things going on, but I wanted to touch back on what I said about him knowing it's all a game. So like if you truly are encompassing this reality as a game, you're going to be as crazy as him. Right. Because, like, who cares? At that point, what does it matter? Just like, make it as good and entertaining as you can. Maybe he's doing all this just to entertain himself because he's, like, truly living that all of this is just for fun. And, um, yeah, that's scary. But then, like, I don't know where I'm going with this because it almost sounds like I'm defending him. Yeah. But I'm not because it seems like what he's doing is, uh, wait, is it dangerous? Um, well, it sounded like he was starting to become a danger to himself and others, to people who were helping him. Like there are some videos of people saying they, people have been in his place and tried to, um, what do you call it? Trip sitter. Yeah. Like sit there and watch him and make sure he's okay. And he was starting to become a lot more volatile and dangerous towards people apparently. And 
threatening to harm himself, harm others potentially. And um, okay, so if it's going to that regard, then yeah, I, I guess he is going to end up in a home. Yeah, and then once you're there, though, how long does it take to for your brain to return to homeostasis, or does it? So if he's actually microdosing this stuff constantly, meaning he's keeping himself in a continuous trip, uh, once he gets off it. And then once you like the psychosis where like how long does it take the psychosis to wear off? It's different for everybody. Mm. There are some people where once they, you know, their schizophrenia comes to the surface, they never lose it. They're like, right. th that's them. Yeah. And I mean, there are stories of people being admitted to the hospital and they don't get out. Like that's where they live now. Um, for other people, it, I, it's impossible to say how long it could be weeks. It could be months. Um, Generally, I think it's about a few weeks to a couple months huh. where people are in these like perpetual psychotic states. It doesn't sound as bad as I was thinking, to be honest. I thought it was going to be years potentially. No, and he'll likely complete like if this is like a blip, he will likely return back to normal to a very large degree. And he'll there's a chance that he's going to like feel uh, a lot of remorse for his behavior and guilt and shame and there's a chance he'll be making apologies like i am so sorry like there that is not off the table like it might seem like he's so far gone that he would yeah. never come back but um that could be just because he's constantly in that state i think it's almost like the boy who cried wolf at this point though because he has made apology videos and then he just becomes more intense after that Yeah, because he took the drug again though yeah that's true but i think a lot of people won't believe him initially regardless of no he's absolutely destroyed his, his online reputation yeah. As far as one thing I find interesting is how many entrepreneurs are very interested in these ayahuasca trips. And it seems like it could potentially be counterproductive in terms of your success is driven largely by ego yeah. in terms of, yeah, I uh, have a new arbitrary goal of this many dollars or this much, I don't know, views or subscribers or whatever it is. I, if I have a company or some like people who depend on me and I'm literally driving everything forward through my pursuit of perhaps what somebody who's enlightened might see as arbitrary, meaningless goals. No one's enlightened, Derek. Okay, but yeah, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> how How is it beneficial for somebody like that? Like in terms of, I could see them achieving a... Somebody who reaches Satori, you could say. Because Satori is seen as like a brief glimpse. So when you truly reach a Satori state, you realize just via how temporary it was. And and again, like I said earlier, how to come out of it, you're back to your personality. You realize that it's just a glimpse. The only way to be truly what they consider enlightened is to be dead. Mm. So unless you're dead, you're not fucking enlightened. Right. So when you're saying once you become enlightened, I'm going to translate that into once you have the experience of being one with everything, like once you have a Kensho. Hmm. So look at it that way. I'm trying to give you um, a glimpse into how how to frame it in your own mind. So don't think like once an individual becomes enlightened, because essentially enlightened in this instance means insanity. Because yeah. Connor Murphy has reached a state of what I think is perpetual psychosis or schizophrenia, which is not a usual response. Right. Usually that you can become psycho psychotic from the drug, but as the drug wears off, the psychosis wears off with it. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm just trying to reframe your question. So, sorry, continue. Um, yeah, I'm like almost hoping I'm even framing it in the right context here. Like you are. I'm, yeah, like I'm just thinking for somebody who has only something to... Like, obviously, you don't just have something to lose and nothing to gain or else you wouldn't be doing it to begin with. But I just don't see how if somebody if the ego is maxed up here and zero ego is down here where you like literally don't care about obtaining money or anything or, you know, pursuing higher power or something. What do you achieve by getting to the middle, perhaps with ayahuasca, which I, presumably like why else would you be taking it to not take yourself from this? heightened hyper egomaniac state like yeah. is that that would be the main primary goal i would assume or is it just people who want to see cool shit or what is the sometimes but so it's so it's like this you're you're here yeah hyper ego first of all you need a reason for wanting to take the ayahuasca so you got to look expectation and results are tied together people always have something that they want to achieve what's it, the primary goals typically that you see 
or that, that you are aware of. That I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, usually people, if it's not to cure an illness, some people are actually sick mm. and uh, they could be on the verge of death. And there's studies showing from the Johns Hopkins studies of psilocybin mushrooms, where if you give them to people near death in, uh, with cancer, uh, it changes their outlook on death and they oh. face their death from a much calmer and right. happier place. So you got to look at the reasons for taking it. So it depends on the individual. If it's not like to face death better or if you're not, some people actually think it'll cure their illness. Like they think that if they have cancer, they'll take ayahuasca. They'll come out of it potentially cancer free. Like they, there are those beliefs that exist. Um, but a lot of the time it's people, the people who are here, who are have the big businesses, yeah. they've realized that they're not getting fulfillment out of being here. Oh, so gotcha. they want to take it because they've heard of people who have these experiences and it brings them down to a place where they are actually what you're afraid of okay with having nothing yeah because they've realized i'm not fulfilled with having all this stuff why should i keep it and maybe subconsciously they want to be okay with having nothing so that's why they lose everything you got to look at what their underlying reasons are and sometimes your reasons for doing it aren't you're not even consciously aware of it right um, but largely has to do with a lack of fulfillment in your life and you want to gain meaning so it almost reinforces pursuing business endeavors that are rewarding in aspects other than just monetarily. So Tony Robbins says that no business endeavor is worth following unless you have fulfillment. That's why rich and famous yeah. people kill themselves all the time. He says success without fulfillment is the biggest failure of them all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, fortunately where, like I think of that a lot when I think of the entrepreneurs who do this kind of stuff. And yeah. I think to myself perspective wise, like am I driven way too hard by my ego? Am I way too... Am I pursuing dumb things that shouldn't matter as much to me as they do? But then I think of the context of some of the, like my business endeavors and I'm actually pursuing like optimizing health or things of this nature that I feel like actually give me a rewarding yeah. rather than just, I don't know, selling a bullshit, like make money online course and knowing I'm like borderline scamming somebody to make a million bucks. Like mm -hmm. the, the million dollars from this versus the million dollars from this, like one is worth exponentially more even though it's the same financial value. So I'm wondering for individuals, like in general, I guess the entrepreneurial mindset is more for, like you mentioned, you don't have fulfillment from whatever your current endeavor is. So then you're pursuing it through this medium sort of thing. Yeah. So what was your initial question? You, well, it was you more like, why would an entrepreneur justify doing it? Because I see how how it's becoming justify? trendy, you know? Oh, is it? Yeah, there's a lot of guys So maybe who... there's people taking it now who aren't even at a place of no fulfillment. They're just they're just taking it. So what happens to the normal person, though, is the, they're up here, you know, with yeah. the ego. And say this is like max no ego. Right. So they take it. And it doesn't matter how far down the ladder they they fall. As soon as the drug wears off, and maybe it might even take a couple of weeks or a month of being subjected to our society. And our society's fucking crazy, man. Yeah. We are taught to care so much about other people's opinions more than our own. We are taught to shit, like we're taught shame. There's so much bad negative reinforcement that goes on in our society that leads people to being at this very egocentric way because they don't know how else to live. Right. Like this is just what, like everybody ultimately wants love and acceptance and being this way is how people think they're going to get that love and acceptance because the more money they have, you know, the more power they have, the, the, you know, the drill, yeah. but they take the drug, they fall down, drug wears off, they go back up. They might right. trip again, they fall down, they go back up. Very few people lose the ego hmm. and stay in that state. In fact, there's a lot of people who trip who, wish they could be there like that is their goal is to have you know less ego and it's like no matter what they do they can't reach it right. so like you're afraid of reaching something that some people would love to be at um and it's because like people often in the psychedelic community ask this like how do i have these experiences and make it stick because every time i trip i have this i'm one with everything i see the world in a more fulfilling way from the sense of they no longer have these huge cares which translate into worries that have been programmed into them via our society like a care and worry would be i have to make this much money to be happy mm -hmm. and as a successful businessman you would know that once you reach a new standard what you used to be happy with is abysmal to you now you're like yeah like when you were down here like even with subscribers on youtube there's a point where you're like i couldn't imagine getting a hundred thousand then you get a hundred thousand you're I'm like i'm sure you can attest to back when you had let's just say i don't know ten thousand subscribers getting a video that would pop off and get, I don't know, 50,000 views or something 
was a huge fucking deal. Of now, course. if you get a hundred thousand, you're like, well, that was a shitty video. <laughs> like what the fuck, you know? And that's, it's just crazy how your mindset so quickly adjust and acclimates to the hedonic treadmill where you're just on this continuous ride and it sets you up for like worse and worse crashes potentially crashes, but also yeah, yeah so. also less fulfillment in your life because it's like you soon realize i mean if you're somewhat intelligent that you're never going to be happy it's i can like you reach that point i can definitively say and i always wondered about this how could you know rich guy or successful guys say that Achieving some giant thing was equivalent happiness to some minuscule thing that I don't know. Like I always use this example. I don't know if you know who Dan Bilzerian is. Yeah. So he was on Joe Rogan. He was talking about how his happiness level when he was, I don't know, 16 years old. If he got a Mustang, that would have put him at a 10 out of 10 because that was his dream car. Mm. And, you know, objectively, it's, it's a pretty nice car and it's like reasonably expensive. But it's not like an exotic supercar or something. Like a Lambo. Now, if he gets a Lambo, he's like, I don't even care as a gift because he's just so adjusted to having a private chef, being, you know, having the nicest place, having all these cars, having this and that. It's like the thing that made him so happy as a teenager, if he got it, now is nothing to him and it put him at like a one out of ten. No, no, no. You're saying Lambo. You're talking about Mustang. So what would happen if he got the Mustang now? Would yeah. he be mad? He'd oh, probably yeah. be mad. He'd be like negative. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> so that's that's the thing is like I can definitively say now that I've experienced that to some extent with the YouTube stuff and tr getting traction and whatnot, my happiness level when I'd have something pop off when I was tiny versus my success now in relative terms, like I could be the same if not sometimes even less or so with something yeah. that is disproportionately better to the average person objectively and neurochemically what's happening this is what i ask myself neurochemically neurochemically what that means is you are becoming desensitized to dopamine yeah and it's scary almost it is it, no it actually is scary yeah someone like me who i was telling you i was addicted to amphetamines prescribed yeah like so it, i could justify the addiction as in, yeah. this is for my adhd but i learned firsthand just how much you need dopamine because when you take those daily your body stops producing as much dopamine on its own because you're always trying to reach a state of homeostasis so you're like if you're daily on this then we're going to lower your daily like your normal daily release so that it when you're taking this it matches but then when you come off it since it's lowered it you're like way down mm. here and you feel like shit nothing gets you going nothing is exciting to you yeah and it's like if that was caused via drugs via taking amphetamines is it really much different when it's caused via actual success like we're talking like how much down regulation of the dopamine is happening this way a lot naturally i think, I think it's got to be a lot one thing i almost find a hilariously similar comparison is you know the the rodent model where they have they wire its brain so it hits a button and then it, it i don't know if it it just like releases I don't think it was, I don't know if it was dopamine or if it makes them like instantly orgasm or something when they hit the button Yeah, and they just like keep hammering the button over and over again and just like fry the shit out of their brain. And they see these rodents basically reinforcing that it's never enough dopamine. They just keep hammering and keep hammering the button in this experimental model. One thing I've noticed that's almost similar in a social media aspect is hitting the refresh button to watch your videos performance as you publish a new video and you go there and you press refresh and you see the views popping up and you see the comments, you see the likes, you wait five minutes, maybe, maybe it's popping off a bit more, refresh, it's another 10,000 views, oh, refresh. And you're sitting there and before you know it, you spent 45 <laughs> minutes fucking refreshing like a fucking rodent trying to achieve like this new like high essentially. Well, and yeah, why else would you be refreshing? It's giving you a spike. Exactly, but it's yeah. just crazy how similar it is and you don't even realize you're essentially like these rodents in that experimental model in real life scenario so i was asking you before we started filming if you were worried about burning out yeah. and so you were saying there's always like you're always rewarded because yeah. you're just you know your channel's been exploding yeah and i was saying like what happens when it stops though yeah maybe yeah. what would happen is you're going to get desensitized to the reward yeah and that's what happens to so many people like you wouldn't be alone you would just you would be the same as almost everybody. Yeah. You get th that refresh, what you're saying, loses Oh yeah. its excitement. Yeah. And when it loses its excitement, sometimes the money, like this is, so pulling it back to the question, this is why they take it. Yeah. Because they're so numb 
to what used to bring them so much joy. Right. And now okay. they're like, where is my fulfillment in life? I can't hit refresh. No matter how many times I refresh, no matter how many Lambos I get, I still feel like shit. Mm -hmm. So it ultimately comes to I have no fulfillment in my life. Yeah. And they don't know how to get the fulfillment. So they're like, these people took this drug. Yeah. They had this mystical experience and now they're happy again. Yeah. It comes down to they, people just want to feel joy. They just want to feel happy. The fascinating thing is how a lot of people and I was in the same mind space as you think as, I don't know, just an average Joe. When I see somebody hyper successful and they're depressed, your first thought is, what the fuck do you have to complain about? But you, they don't get the neurochemical interactions that occur that end up putting you at a state that could be lower on the totem pole in terms of happiness than a normal guy with a normal job who has a good family and hang, has a good, you know, friend circle mm -hmm. and things of this nature. You could be the most hyper successful, you know, rock star. And you're so accustomed to giant amounts of dopamine and like your concerts and whatnot. Well, that's why they do the drugs too, eh? Yeah. That is why, because they're getting so much dopamine from just their everyday life. They're constantly having people feigning over them and giving them attention. And it's like, they're so numb. The only way to get the release now is the drugs. Yeah. And the thing that's worse about musicians and stuff is a lot of them, they have such staggering rises and such staggering fall offs that it's like the ultimate example of reaching like ultimate ego centric maximum capacity and then potentially losing that stimulation entirely because you might become irrelevant because you don't produce the new like best song or whatever mm. so you could go from literally being so hyper exposed to this chemical and then all of a sudden having it ripped out from under you and you become more depressed than anybody you know probably just be, even though objectively you're still very successful but yeah. relative to your new baseline it's like this unrealistic expectation that you have to maintain and you'll like never be happy until you potentially do what you're mentioning <laughs> but see the thing that's funny though is you say never be happy when they're when they're even at these top levels they're not happy mm. so it's like even though it looks like they're getting blasted with these like reaffirmations from people like everyone's constantly validating them yeah and you know we're social creatures that validation is largely what helps us to get that dopamine release that's why people care so much about how they look the fitness community is the biggest culprit of this you got all these people who are doing such unhealthy practices just to get and you gotta ask like why do they need to get that big yeah what are they getting out of it yeah. they're getting validation yeah they're getting attention which ultimately is that dopamine blast it's making them feel good and it's coming from all these outside sources yeah. like how many of them get that big and actually just look in the mirror and and they're just getting the blast from themselves i mean i'm sure some of them are but yeah but i think a lot of it has to do with the outside influence and where, where does it lead to like where does it go the interesting thing you just said about the validation is it kind of circles back to a point that um leo from uh co-host of a podcast i do that i mentioned about the cerebral license he Met, he was like researching happiness when he was in post-secondary and he was potentially looking into specializing it in terms of how to achieve it, you know, just the, I don't know, neurochemical <laughs> processes of it and stuff. And he was outlining in a show we did a while ago about how the ultimate way to be fulfilled and happy in terms of like a goal metric is never is having a grand goal, but never actually achieving it. And the small micro steps along the way and the little bits of validation you get along your path towards this fulfilling goal, ideally not something that is, you know, just based around entirely money or something, because you'll never be happy and you have to go on tangents of hedonistic, you know, explorative things and, you know, do whatever it is that probably Connor was doing, I imagine, to get those little the trips of happiness, I guess. But ideally, it's you're slowly titrating your way up to this goal, but you never actually get it. And it's your validation, like, along the way of like getting your way there that keeps you keeps the hamster wheel going i guess i see yeah because you do you believe in that do you do you believe that that to be true well Would i think it, i think if your end goal is actually something that is fulfilling and isn't just financially incentivized then yeah. yeah but that's the thing can there be an end goal isn't it about the journey well that's the whole point is you have some grand thing that you never actually get to ideally mm-hmm you just like you make progress and your validation along the way from people recognizing your progress is yeah. sort of what keeps you going. See, I think people this is going to sound off base, but in the same similar regard to having like in the goal for happiness, I think people who have some kind of artistic something artistic that they pursue mm -hmm. are generally 
I think they're displayed as not being happy. You know, the angry artist or the alcoholic yeah, artist. Yeah, the troubled artist. Or but it, but it's like I think they have a better, better chance of achieving fulfillment because by the very nature, people do art not usually for the end goal, but they enjoy the process of doing art. Right. And there's very few practices that people can follow where it's about the process. I, I think your your friend is onto something with that because I think the goal, the, like the key to having that fulfillment, is to constantly be enjoying your process be enjoying right. your journey yeah like being um end goal dependent would be like saying i'm going to be happy when i make this x amount of money when i have x size channel and being that way as we know gives you that short-term boost but like once you get there you're still not happy you always need yeah. the next thing so that is the key for sure I like agree. i'm not at a million subscribers but i imagine that was initially one of my end goals is to get there and I was confident I could and I'm pretty sure ideally this year I think I will get there but again I've realized that now that is kind of a pointless goal to have because once I get it it's going to be like so what's a good goal to have yeah so I imagine when you got the one million it was cool but it was probably a lot less um fulfilling than you anticipated potentially like in terms of now like what now you know now okay two million three million well, if you're looking for validation, then the next is 10 million. Yeah. Because at 10, you get another plaque. Oh, yeah. So, True. So maybe that's where your mind goes. Now, for me personally, I got the million, and I just thought it was fucking crazy that a channel about drugs got a million subscribers. Right. Like, I thought that was wild. Yeah. Um, like once, one thing I've noticed is a lot of guys, all of a sudden, their efforts sort of fall off once they hit a million. Like They stop trying so? as hard because mm. it's like, oh, I've achieved. I finally achieved it, and now I'm like, it's almost like retirement from caring because you have nothing to pursue at this point not for me it was kids yeah uh, okay i we, we had the one kid when i started the channel the kid wasn't born yet yeah and then i had a second kid unexpectedly and for me it's been like a balancing act like my effort has fallen off but it's because of other factors mm -hmm. but maybe some of this but also it's like i gotta balance family yeah. gotta balance work and i'm working from home yeah. so there's interruptions so for me it's multiple things but i think for a lot of people you're absolutely right they reach that goal and then they realize too, oh, I'm not really that happy that I got here. And now what's next? Yeah. And then it almost becomes like annoying. At the same time though, I think like I do have goals that I set for myself or else I don't have any like actual direction necessarily. Dude, goals are important. I'm not saying goals aren't important. They are important. Right. Okay. I was wondering like for you, like how do you, what metrics do you use sort of thing? Let's see, this is my job, I must feed my family, so let's keep making videos to keep making money to feed my family. But that's only one part. I also, I enjoy helping people. Right. So knowing that I'm helping people- Keeps you going. Keeps me going, but only to a degree, because then I reach this point where it's like, on certain topics, I feel like I've exhausted it, and now I'm just repetitive, and how much more am I helping people just repeating the same shit? So I have definitely been up at arms with like, is this fulfilling, is this valuable for me to personally persist and continuing and um sometimes i don't know one thing about the repetitive content by the way circling back to our discussion earlier you'd be shocked how many people who are existing subscribers haven't seen your old stuff oh you're right yeah. like how many people do i say hey do you have a video on this i'm like use the fucking search bar bro <laughs> and they still haven't seen it so a lot of times you think people you're being repetitive but in reality it's fresh content mm -hmm. and you also probably gain unique perspectives over the years in terms of certain concepts that maybe is different than the same introductory post you did five years ago. Right. So, but what's happened to me too is kind of like what we've been talking about. I don't know if it has to do with numb dopamine, but sometimes I go like, what's the point of me making a video unless I enjoy the process of making the video? Right. Like, like what is the point? The point is the end goal then to make, you know, to help other people or to get, to keep, you know, keep it as my job. Like sometimes I battle with that. It's like, I want to feel like I'm very uniquely aware of how what I'm doing is either fulfilling or unfulfilling. Hmm. I don't know if you're at that point where like, yeah, you're thinking these thoughts. Are yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. But one thing I try to do too is, well, for me, it's a little bit different because some of the traffic of my businesses is largely contingent upon my posting as well. Right. And my ability to leverage recruiting new athletes to our affiliate programs and getting doctors who want to work for me and stuff like that. That's all contingent upon me growing at the rate I am. So it's a little bit different, but in terms of like indirectly justifying it, like maybe even if one video isn't necessarily fulfilling in itself, if you know it's like an algorithm friendly video, 
it indirectly feeds the stuff that you're passionate about. And then as a byproduct of that helps build your, like, it's not like everything is fun, you know? No, you're right. Yeah. So you could look at it through the lens of these algorithm friendly videos that are less exciting for me to make or work in order to feed the success of my passionate topics that I actually want to, because it's annoying when you see a passionate topic, you put a fuck ton into perform like shit. It sucks. Yeah. So it's almost like building up the infrastructure to catapult the success of those. Once you actually put them out Yeah, yeah. is how I sort of view it. Cause for Mm. me, some of my stuff is fluff. Like I don't necessarily want to talk about pop culture. I don't necessarily want to talk about trending topics. Frankly, I just want to talk about pharmacology and endocrinology and just be like a fucking nerd, but it doesn't always like pull the view. So I will often talk about stuff that's happening, that's relevant to my niche and then draw in the masses and then sort of, it sort of shows them my actual stuff. Gotcha. You know? And I, I feel like that is something that like, who am I to give you advice? I'm like, you know, a fraction of your size, but I think that could be bigger than mine, dude by views daily maybe that's all that matters i guess yeah subscribers is just a dick measuring contest yeah. <laughs> it's, it means nothing yeah yeah really it's like oh so so i've just been doing this longer your channel's blowing up dude yeah yeah so, so anyway i i see that as a way to feel better about the stuff that you might be like why am i doing this ah uh, i see no yeah. you're absolutely right I, I've, I've thought of that stuff too before yeah um but for some of my stuff i've reached that point where it's like i just want it to be fulfilling mm. but yeah, I'm I'm on board with what you're saying. That's really good advice. Yeah, um, you're um, you mentioned earlier before we started recording about you've had some atypical compound experience used for like obviously this has some crossover with the. So fitness are we jumping stuff. off the, the the enlightened topic? Unless you have something to add, like I don't have a whole lot of other like I guess technically I could relate it to myself if I wanted to say like how could I do it, and I feel like I'm sort of avoiding that because I don't think I'm gonna do it to be honest. <laughs> you don't need to take yeah. ayahuasca. No, but yeah. I would, honestly, I would not su- like if you were to ask me what yeah. I would suggest. I wouldn't suggest you take ayahuasca. Okay, hypothetically for me, like you sort of have an idea of what. Like we we only met like an hour and a half ago or whatever, uh-huh. but you sort of get an idea of where my head's at with workflow and how like aggressively I am about making sure I'm getting my shit done. Steve Jobs related his success to Apple to his acid trip. He said if he never explored psychedelics, he would have never gone down that path and we would not have Apple. Huh. So there's certain psychedelics that have a higher, is the word efficacy I'm looking for? If I found my path though, that was to find his path or to make him more driven in his current chosen yeah, he was already in his path oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. i think it's it highly it showed him how design was important I, and uh, i could be totally off base I, i'm thinking that's what it did and that's why he focused so much with apple on the symmetry of things because men right. i think men in general are, are very visual creatures yeah. and lsd is a very visual experience it allows the visual cortex to communicate this is what we know there's a lot going on that we don't know but i don't know if you know this the visual cortex communicates with parts of the brain that it doesn't normally communicate to. This is why on it, you can do stuff like see sounds, like in a way that just, I could not explain. And it's really cool. So it showed him in a visual sense, how important symmetry and all of that was to the technology. And then he merged the two together. And that's why to this day, when you look at Apple computers, part of the allure is just how symmetrically pleasing they are. And you can thank good old LSD, Ms. Lucy for that one, baby. (laughs) Yeah. So it would depend on the compound. So there's some compounds that more are going to lead to the one enlightening state. Right. DMT, the active ingredient in ayahuasca, is that ego killer. Mm. LSD will shoot the ego to shit, but DMT is what causes the, um, really it pulls you out of the simulation. Okay. And, and that's what ayahuasca does. You can have the same thing happen on LSD, but it's not, it's not necessarily the same way. So that you hear a lot of business people taking LSD. Um, so from your context, if you were going to have a trip, I would just say have an acid trip. It could actually mm. help. Like you're looking at it from like a, I'm scared because yeah. people have like dropped so far down yeah. perspective. Yeah. But there's another another perspective to take where if you already are fulfilled in what you're doing, you have nothing to be afraid of. So hypothetically, if my workflow involves reviewing videos, filming content, educating myself and reading research papers, doing stuff like that, you think an acid trip enhances that in some aspect or puts me on a tangent of creativity that I otherwise would not have even saw on? That one. Okay. It can make, it can give you, it can allow you to see everything you're doing from a new perspective. And by definition, new perspective means something that no matter how hard you try, you can't currently see. 
And that's why I think they have such potential to help most sane, healthy people who Mm. do it, you know, from a context of, from a harm reduction context, who are doing it safely, as safe as they possibly can, you know, who are testing their drugs, who have trip sitters, who have researched the shit out of it first. I'm not saying I think everyone should take acid or everyone should trip, but if you were looking at having an experience, that is the one that I would think would benefit you because you might have some latent creativity hiding somewhere and, you know, it can help pull it out it might be able to give you a, a new perspective on what you're doing so you can maybe even find fulfillment in it more. Um, might help you in non-business aspects. Generally, these things help in non-business aspects. Yeah, like I'm thinking, so for me, in general, my sort of cognitive enhancing components, like what I focus on for my helping my work is stuff like nootropic agents that enhance information retention, memory recall, yeah. fluency. So microdosing could be a thing. Microdosing is fantastic. As well as things like microdoses of amphetamines or amphetamine analogs I've utilized as well as, you know, basic shit like caffeine. But then the LSD microdosing, like I know the typical, I don't know, Silicon Valley approaches, let's take modafinil or let's take Adderall and mm-hmm. let's really dial in and just get a fuck ton of work done Yeah, and do it with a higher level of attentiveness. So it's higher quality work for longer spans of time throughout the day. But the LSD, you think, adds a component of creativity to that. Rather, there's no enhanced productivity necessarily. I I, You know, everyone's so different. Um, For me personally, if I'm just talking my experience with microdosing, it doesn't make me more productive in the same way that amphetamine makes me... Like, amphetamine makes doing boring shit fun. Mm -hmm. I think that's why it feels good. It's like, I hate this task, but I feel... You know, it makes you feel good already, so doing that shit is manageable. The LSD doesn't really do that. So I think you're on point with saying it enhances your creativity. So things become a little more exciting because you can see your normal thoughts kind of flow in a different way. I could see it for an editor being very useful. I could see it for people who are writers potentially. For me, I'm just trying to think of like an application where it enhances what I'm doing because I'm so like militant about record informational video or reacting video or whatever it might give you a new way to describe things oh ah, okay like maybe you're describing things in a similar fashion all the time it might make you give you the ability to like stand from a different you know side and view it the same thing in a different way which will give you i don't know a broader lexicon of explanations i don't right. know what to say oh, okay that makes i sense. think it could help um but do you need the help yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I don't know if the RO, like, I guess it's pretty hard to fuck yourself up with a microdose of LSD, I'm assuming. Microdose is good. It's going to be like a coffee, man. Yeah. Like, you don't yeah. really, you might not even feel it. No, yeah, that's something um, I have. Uh, I would say if you're curious and the main thing stopping you is fear, you don't really have anything to be afraid of. Yeah, I'm more fearful of like the heavy duty ship. It's not like I need to go on an ayahuasca trip, like you said. I can try. Like, it's not the no. introductory. I saw your beginner's top five introductory compounds. And yeah. It's like, it seems a lot more I didn't reasonable. even say ayahuasca. I don't no, think. No, no, you didn't. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. No, no. LSD would probably be something that could be interesting to you. And I would say even a full trip isn't anything to be scary about. I had a full trip the day before yesterday. No. How do I look? Do I look like I'm fucked? No, you seem fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't like... And by a full trip, I mean I had like just over 100 micrograms. You can have 100 micrograms and you can... You can have an intense experience, but you come back from it like that, like you're good. What's the duration of effect? In of 100 micrograms? Yeah. So that's like the average tab is 100. Right. Um, It's going to last six to six to 12 hours. Everyone's different. For me, after about four or five, I'm like, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. It's yeah, an no. interesting compound. Yeah. So sort of tangent on that, going to psychedelic implementation for performance enhancement in mm-hmm. the gym perhaps or I've done that, yeah yeah so you're mentioning you've used some interesting training aids before and fat burners which i don't know how that would play into psychedelics but i'm interested to hear your uh elaboration so microdosing let's start with fat burners microdosing is a fat burner because if you microdose higher yeah. it decreases appetite so it oh, kind of so has indirectly a, yeah it indirectly has an effect that's okay. that's all i meant on that and i found that the more dopaminergic psychedelics like the phenethylamine class lysergamides as well have some dopamine action those 
you know, of course, by definition, are going to be better for decreasing appetite because obviously amphetamines decrease appetite. And they See, have effects. interesting thing. Sorry to cut you off. Oh, no, go ahead. I don't can I never even considered a PEA analog, for example, as a psychedelic necessarily. I always just consider it in stimulant class. So is that what you're referring to when you say appetite suppression, like typically from stimulatory compounds in general or from actual like when I think psychedelic, I think mushroom psilocybin lsd ayahuasca stuff mm -hmm. like that i don't think pea amphetamine dextro amphetamine blah, blah 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 right well amphetamines are phenethylamines right yeah i think they have the phenethylamine base so there's a whole class of psychedelics that are just phenethylamines so the 2c series are all phenethylamine based any of the mescaline 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 analogs are phenethylamine based there's even amphetamine based psychedelics the dox compounds are amphetamine based and these are psychedelics that you could potentially microdose, which would give you that creative edge and decrease your appetite at the same time. So they're like a hybrid of stimulatory plus creative enhancing? Yes. Ah, yes, I found that's... on days where I microdose acid, I adhere to my diet model so strictly. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Like it's actually a driving factor because yeah. I'm trying to cut. Yeah. So a driving factor in me to take the microdose on many occasions is like, I know if I take this microdose, I'm going to eat less. Circling back to Kratom briefly, that's also a reason I used to use it is it killed my appetite. Dude, it grazed mine. Really? Yeah. What the fuck? That's, that's so fucked. That's, yeah, definitely individual I response. wanted to stop taking it because it made me eat so much. That's wild. Yeah. I know people who like forget to eat when they use it. I wish I had that effect. It mm. makes me eat like there's no fucking tomorrow. Interesting. That's weird, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's all I mean by um, it, it affected my appetite. So that would be like mescaline microdosing, 2CB microdosing, any of the LSD analogs, like um, not LSA because it's a fucking seed and that's hurts your tummy. Those have cyanide in them. That's a whole other story. <laughs> um, but yeah, like there's a lot of legal lysergamides. I don't know if you know this. Yeah, like research chemical stuff? Yeah, like, uh, what are they called? 1P LSD, 1CP LSD, all add, all of these stuff, You all of these things you can buy on the clear net and you could easily microdose them and it would decrease your appetite. Uh, they also give you an energy boost. So it has like multi multiple functions. So it increases creativity. It kind of behaves like a coffee. Yeah, it sounds up my alley for sure. Like a hybrid of stimulatory plus creativity rather than just hyper aggressive in one vector. And it's all dose dependent too. Yeah. So you can microdose anywhere from five micro, say acid, because we're on that topic, yeah. five to about 25. And I've microdosed up to 40. So I've like really pushed it. I've wanted to see like how far until you reach, I'm actually on a light acid trip versus this is still in the microdose alley. Right. Um, so yeah. Yeah, you, when it comes to the microdosing though, the key is finding the dose. Right. So you might microdose five micrograms and like hate it. But then you'll go to 15 and you'll be like, okay, these are the effects I'm after. The effects jump, uh, not, they're not, they jump in an exponential way. Right. It's not like sometimes t uh, taking twice as much is twice as intense. It's more like you take twice as much and other effects come to fruition that uh, you didn't anticipate. Gotcha. Um, so anyway, speaking of the psychedelics in a fat burner context, you mentioned they kill your appetite and like, presumably that's the main mechanism by which they burn fat. There's no other like, no, no, they just, they just make it so you don't want to eat. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know some stimulants, they do work by literally just increasing your heart rate, for example, and like your the, energy expenditure. Right? Yeah. Cause you're like yeah. moving so much. Yeah, yeah. Like there's this one drug called clenbuterol. Have you ever heard of it? No, it's a beta two agonist and basically it makes you jittery. Like you actually can visibly, if you hold your hand up, you can see it shaking. I get that from coffee. It's worse. Like it, it's to the point where you can't b even write properly almost. Like you're like fucking this. Uh, I've so, had that from Crate of Man Coffee together. Oh, really? Have you ever had that from? What? It depends, I guess how much coffee? It depends. I've definitely had like overstimulation from basic coffee for sure. Mm. But to the degree like Clen is next level where you could be focusing on keeping your hand steady and it's like. Oh, oh, it's like intensely moving, hey? Yeah, uh, it's probably like closer to this, but it's like, <laughs> it's very like, what's wrong with you kind of thing. Right, right. So that stuff, it literally works by increasing energy expenditure through like, stimulating your heart to just beat faster. Mm. So that I don't know. It doesn't sound if, healthy, man. No, it's terrible. It it's like the worst so thing bad. for your heart ever. Arguably wow. one of the most unhealthy bodybuilding drugs that there exists. The psychedelics pre-workout. In general, most people pre-workout, they use things like caffeine, Interestingly enough, PEAs and PA analogs as well. Like, in like one which of, ones? In one of my pre-workouts, I have N-phenethyl dimethylamine citrate, which no is, clue. it's a pretty smooth 
not too aggressive compound that's quite complementary to caffeine okay. and in general like i couple that with things like you know choline donors acetylcholine esterase inhibitors stuff like that that help like um like acetylcholine obviously a major component of actually like facilitating muscular contraction so you can get instant strength gains if you use things like alpha gpc i didn't know that yeah <laughs> well that that kind of stuff is typically what people leverage in a pre-workout context but mm. i know some people they do use things like kratom or I don't know, I guess you have experience with stuff I wouldn't have even thought of potentially. Yeah, just the microdosing really. Right. So that is like what do you get out of that that's above and beyond like a hyper aggressive stimulant though if you're having creativity while you're bench pressing, isn't that? Well, you you're not going to have creativity when you're bench pressing. I know that's probably a stupid question, but I have no fucking But the music you're listening to will sound better. Oh, right. So it can make that more enticing. Have you ever had the effect from Fenabut where music sounds better? No. I've got lim I've only tried it maybe 10 to 15 times. Yeah. I, I always heard that about it, but I never got it myself. I, I never liked Fenabut. Or Fenabut. It's kind of a dirty drug. Yeah, it, it made me feel just slow, I guess. Yeah, it has a yeah. lot of uh, dependence potential, too, in terms of... But uh, when it comes to the the using psychedelics in low doses to boost performance, Yeah. Um, another thing that I've noticed is if I were to, say, go for a jog in particular when the LSD microdose or the LSD analog microdose was in full swing, like as the effects first come on, they're usually the most intense yeah. and then they slowly level down. Um, it allows me to just like, I feel like I can run forever. Like, yeah, it's, right. I don't know how to explain it other than I just, I don't feel winded. Like, I don't know how that effect happens. I can't really extrapolate anything from this except I don't get tired and I can just keep fucking running. So it's really wow. cool in the cardio aspect. I wonder if those are, I actually don't even know off the top of my head if those are banned in sports. That would be hilarious if they're not. Because that's definitely something that can be, I've definitely talked about that before, but I haven't specifically focused on actual which compounds are not on the banned substance list, but that definitely mm -hmm. would be, even reducing your pain threshold, for example, in like combat sports or something, like I imagine that has Isn't huge- is shrooms being studied for that? I don't know, maybe. I could be totally off base, but I think they're currently studying, some university is studying psilocybin mushrooms specifically for combat sports. Mm. And I have heard Mike Tyson talk about boxing on mushrooms. He did a podcast. He said he boxed on mushrooms and he didn't feel the punches. And I, that's what I also wanted to touch on this. When I take the microdose and I work out, I feel the same thing with the weights. It feels like I'm not feeling the pain as much. Uh. So it's easier to push. Yeah. Um, but you also get that from Kratom, right? Yeah. And Kratom's obviously the kind of like side disclaimer on that is don't go past pain threshold where you injure yourself by accident on something like Kratom. Right. Yeah. I don't think the pain reduction is as intense on microdosing mm -hmm. as with Kratom. Yeah. But it's more in a, it's, it's different. It's hard to describe, but it's different. So yeah, it has it's a myriad of benefits. Like mm -hmm. can run longer, I can push longer. And you got to look at the stoned ape theory. I don't know if you know it by Terrence McKenna who strongly was a proponent that humans evolved alongside psilocybin mushrooms because he said early humans who saw the mushroom and ate it would be better at basic survival acts like hunting because it improves your visual acuity oh. and it allows you to run, you know, for longer. You have better endurance on it. So he hmm. thinks that we actually evolved through like like the through natural selection the humans who ate the mushrooms were the ones who reproduced so that's why he also believed that the mushrooms have such an impactful effect on us because we've actually evolved to have the receptors for these um you know the neurotransmitter um what am i looking for the cells have receptors for these specific neurotransmitters that are present in the mushrooms like right. uh, psilocybin or psilocin uh, binds to the 5-ht 2a um, serotonin receptor and if you know anything about just basic, well, you know tons about pharmacology. Yeah. So like neurochemically speaking, you could say if you're uh, happier, for instance, you're likely to continue being happier because your cells reproduce with more receptors for um, whatever dopamine. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the humans who took these psilocybin mushrooms would have their cells reproduce with more receptor sites for psilocybin, so it would have more of a beneficial effect. And now that's why the drugs are so profound in their effects on us. Um, so yeah, if you follow his theory, then it makes perfect sense why they are beneficial in a physical exertion context. No, that's good to note, especially because that's uh, I'm sure that's a conversation that'll probably come up 
um, when I do Rogan, his, he's big on psychedelics, and as well, I'm talking literally about performance mm -hmm. enhancement. So yeah. the hybrid of the two, especially if some of these aren't prohibited on the banned substance list, like, yeah. that's fucking huge. And it's weird because there's a, there's a dose response curve where it goes like, so I've tried, this sounds awful, but I've tried working out on pretty high doses. Yeah. And it's like, there's a sweet spot. And then if you obviously go past that sweet spot, your performance is decreased. Right. Like, like, so you can't like say take a hundred micrograms would probably be too much. Mm -hmm. So I found up to about 40 or 50 micrograms. I'm a small dude. I'm like five foot four. So for me, I, I weigh what? 145. I'm pretty light. So that, I don't know if it is based on weight, but for me, once I go past 40 micrograms, um, it, it has a negative impact. Um, and it, it's almost to the degree where it's like I'm having an actual trip and I'm like, why the uh, fuck would I want to work yeah, out? <laughs> like, I don't yeah. want to work out. I want to listen to some music. Yeah. <laughs> Screw this. Yeah. But um, I've found once you reach the peak effects, like at 40 micrograms, that is high, first of all, to most people. Mm -hmm. Most people wouldn't want to microdose more than 25 at the max end. So I've really pushed it. But at that point, it's like the effects are really strong. Right. Like I really can keep going. Uh, like it's cool. It, it's almost, it almost feels like it's a super physiological yeah, yeah, exactly. experience. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I definitely. So I don't have to, much more to add on that. I need to look into that further because I hadn't even really considered that, to be honest, above and beyond basic, like marijuana, for example, was banned for a while, sort of for the, the same. Fuck does that help? Yeah, sort of for the same reason of reducing pain threshold mm. was the thought process, but it's since been uh, revoked in most uh, sports, but some of them not so much. Your fitness journey, by the way, like it's kind of interesting how I was honestly shocked to see you even commenting on my channel. Like, I guess we do have overlap with drugs, but in terms of like what, have you become more interested in it recently in terms of just general fitness and like. Yeah, I stopped giving a fuck and now I care. <laughs> so, so it's funny. We're talking about um, <laughs> these experiences with Connor Murphy, people like where it takes them to the point where they don't give a shit about anything. And you're like getting up there. I'm getting yeah. up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I've noticed you've been posting like progress photos on your Instagram yeah, and stuff. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, yeah, so like obviously you do care to some extent about your progression and whatnot. Well, I went from not giving a shit to caring. Yeah. So it's having an opposite effect on me. Okay. Mm -hmm. That just goes to show that you can not, you know, it's not like it's always downwards in the escalation of. So this is hard to explain. So what happened with me was there's been a progression to it. So initially I cared about my looks. I had these really intense experiences. And kind of like Connor Murphy, yeah, they actually did contribute to me not giving a shit. But then you come full circle. And then it's like everything starts to really click in the sense where... I don't know how to describe this. More beyond just... Why... If you're only alive in this body one time, why would I not want to have my best experience possible? Right. And it's like the psychedelics show you that. It's yeah. like, yeah, you're all... You might be everything and nothing and all of this shit but literally right now you are you and there's nothing i can do to not be me yeah and so if i'm going to be me i want to be the best version of me and even if it's superficial you can accept and you're okay with the fact that people will treat you better if you look better and but you will have a better reason oh but presumably well, what do you like presumably you do it because you have a better overall experience in life looking better or is it purely for health benefits I like the health benefits, but of course, I'm not going to lie. I, I would love to look better. Right. I get a spike of dopamine if someone's checking me out, just like the next person. But I wouldn't okay. say that's the full reason why I'm training. Okay. Gotcha. I think it it feels, for me personally, it feels good liking myself. Right. So when I'm like, say I'm working out with a muscle pump and I'm looking in the mirror and I'm like, wow, I'm looking good right now. Like, I like that feeling. Yeah. But I say I'm more geared towards doing it for my own personal like reasons just because i don't know who wants to be ugly yeah fair. And my body got pretty ugly and now it's like once you see what you can do i want to push things i want to see how far i can get what's the leanest you've got is it like uh i don't want to be that lean anymore that was uncomfortable oh uh, how uh how far did you go like you can go to my instagram i'll show you a picture okay, okay. it wasn't even that crazy and i think it's largely because i don't hold like my abs always have fat over them Oh, it's like your stubborn fat yeah, spot kind of thing? Yeah, like I th feel like my back was lean, but I don't know. I just always hold fat on my stomach. So maybe you can tell me what percentage I was at because I have no idea. Hmm, yeah, but can... it was too lean. Okay, I'm going to put up a screen recording here for uh, the editor. It just started. Actually, fuck, I'll time it. I probably wasn't even that lean, but there there were veins in my abs. 
Oh, that's pretty fucking lean. Yeah, two veins. I had two <laughs> veins in my abs, and but I was miserable. Recording. Okay, so we're on your Instagram right now. So scroll we... down. I think I'm wearing a hat in the one where you can see the veins in my abs. Okay, so I am... Uh, is it further than this? Uh, keep going. Keep going. There, with the yellow hat. This one? Yeah, that one. Oh, shit. Looking fucking good, dude. Oh, I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> you did? <Yeah. laughs> see, that's about as lean as I got. Yeah. I don't know. What body fat percent do you think that is? Um, 10? 12? Probably probably 12. A lot of people... Back in the day, I probably would have said 10 because you have visible abs, and that's kind of where you know the idea is once you have a visible six-pack, you're 10% body fat, but... Um, I'd probably say like 12, but this is like, this was maybe 11. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you have visible abs. You look fucking good. So the percentage is just an arbitrary number. So yeah, that was too lean for me Yeah, because I was like having those symptoms of no sex drive. Oh, unsustainably lean. Yeah. Yeah. So that's weird. Even me at like, maybe it was 14% was too lean. If I don't have like a bit of fat over my abs, I'm fucking miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Some people, it's always a different trouble spot. Like some people, they hold their fat in their lower back. Some people it's their hips like whatever it is and it's always the last place to go yeah it's my stomach last place to go huh. yeah well what do you how much uh did you weigh in that video i don't know i'm not one of those people who really weighs themselves but really I was, yeah no i don't For tracking progress i'm surprised i know i don't but i was really thin like i'm a little bigger now i like being this way better yeah it's hard to tell in a video too right because of angles yeah, and shit yeah, yeah yeah but now like for example you fill out the shirt whereas maybe in that video you might have not so it looks like in clothes less impressive but shirtless more impressive sort of thing exactly yeah. yeah with clothes on i looked really thin yeah like for that video yeah that's the thing what they say about naturals it's like you can't be was that you can be big you, there's big and lean but you can't be both at the same time or something like that there's mm-hmm. a certain uh it's so, I guess it's not totally true for some people, but I mean like hyper genetic outliers, but in general it's you kinda gotta pick. It's hard to be like big in clothes and try Right to, now I'm time. trying to be like there's a more recent video where I've got kind of abs. Mm-hmm. You've you've seen it. My most recent one that I posted a progress report of. At uh, yeah. this point I feel good. And I don't this even This one. Uh or... yeah, see I don't even I probably look smaller here, but I'm actually way bigger. Yeah, in a video, like proportionally, it seems like you're smaller because that's just what the angles do. But in person, yeah, I'm sure it's drastically. No, different. I mean versus the other video where I was more cut. You always look bigger when you're more cut. No, of course. Like in the video, it looks like you're more cut. Bigger in the cut video versus in person, I'm sure there's a drastic difference in terms of you're bigger now, and you wouldn't have been able to tell in the. Yeah, video. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where do you want to go with with working out? Um, I'm just kind of trying to maintain and maintain high levels of productivity. To be honest, like my focus is as much on work as possible and just sustain everything else around it. So for me, I work out four times a week for an hour. And then I try and do like healthy cardio, which is like 10 minute walk after each meal I typically do. So Mm -hmm. I do like three a day for 10 minutes. And that is, I don't always adhere to it perfectly, but that's like my goal, like perfect schedule. And that keeps me. So I have a couple, a few days a week where I actually find working out inhibits my mental ability because i work out hard as fuck when i work out so when i go to do a video after i'm like drained right so it's very hard for me to dial in and be super focused and upbeat if i just killed myself in the gym so i actually really value working out less days a week and fitting in more into condensed time frames you still look huge so whatever you're doing is working yeah well for me it's a bit easier with trt to be honest but Ah. yeah so what would i look like if i took trt you'd probably be this plus like uh, well, I guess it depends if you're cutting or not, too, because when you're cutting, it's disproportionately harder to hold on to your size because your test levels are literally in the gutter. So you would probably hold maybe five to 10 pounds more of lean mass like as you would be cutting. Like you would be definitely like five, 10 pounds more muscle, I would predict. Mm. So and obviously disproportionately, that's going to it's going to depend a lot on what your baseline is, too. Like I'm just ballparking. Yeah. And some of that's going to be temporary water retention too, just, but it's still going to look. Do you think I would look like I was on steroids if I took them? I think based on how like compact your frame is, you already look like you're pretty like jacked in some of these videos, to be honest, like objectively Mm -hmm. to yourself, you might not think so, but like compared to most naturals, you look muscular. Cool. You know, if that, you know, I'm trying to like put it in a perspective that sort of makes sense here, but typically individuals who are shorter too it's easier to fill out a frame and look 
jacked yeah you know what i mean in a smaller yeah area, like you right? like you're filling out a t you have a visible bicep vein like i'm pretty sure on t- trt i don't know if you'd look like you're on steroids yeah i bet you if you got shredded on trt people would say you're definitely on gear though yeah yeah maybe just sitting in a shirt and like normal clothes they might not accuse you but so it's much. hard i think it's hard to say right like how someone's going to respond yeah these things yeah so it's kind of like brain chemistry in terms of your actual like receptor content in your muscle tissue too like just because you use a dose of a drug you can't really predict your response from a muscle protein synthesis aspect like i don't know how many androgen receptors you have in your muscle fiber or whatever Mm -hmm. like that's to be determined so it's not even just and i'm sure the same applies to psychedelics it doesn't even matter necessarily like a microdose for one person yeah you might respond disproportionately so because of your brain chemistry the same way with steroids some people they use the same dose of testosterone and they blow up versus right. another guy who's like barely responsive so did you were you natural first or did you jump on stuff really really early object like objectively it was young but it was i definitely trained naturally for a couple of years first i would have waited longer if i could have though and uh-huh. i had my knowledge back then was nothing like i th- it's sort of what led me to what i'm doing now what is what size did you get to before you jumped on gear well, like I could say a weight, but it's just an arbitrary amount because you don't really know what it looked like at you don't that have weight. Any pictures of yourself? I do. I could probably dig some up. Yeah, I think I posted them on my channel before. Oh, but I was like, okay. I was like two hundred and five pounds. It's probably like the biggest I got naturally. But it was not a super clean two hundred five. So you were like chubby. Yeah, eh, sort of. Yeah, it definitely did. Like no visible abs. Just put it that way. Okay. So I wasn't fat, but I wasn't lean at all. You know what's weird too? I find like I've I've been at that point where I had no visible abs mm-hmm. and I looked much beefier. Yeah. And but to other people they, they think you're fat. But like I remember I would look in the mirror, I'd be like, Oh, I look great. Like I oh, thought I looked great. Dude, back then. And it's funny because now you would see yourself and see even visible abs and be like, I'm fat or something, or I'm out of shape. Cause you used to be shredded and that's your, you know, the hedonic treadmill of like adjusting your perspective to things society's standards have changed so much you look at arnold in his glory days yeah and he wasn't super ripped yeah i still think he looks fucking great yeah but like now the- oh fitness industry people are like he's fat i'm like <laughs> <laughs> like when fitness industry people see a physique that's not like it's it's hard to even fathom how fucked up the mindset is of a fitness industry person for perceiving physique quality mm-hmm. you see a guy with some muscle and visible abs simultaneously, that guy is a top 1% physique, like by default. Like how many guys in the gym just at a random recreational facility are walking around with visible abs and have some size on them at the same time? Mm -hmm. Like none who are natural, like, Mm -hmm. you know, barely any. So like when you see even that, that's like an elite guy relative to the average population. Right. But like the fitness industry perspective, you see that guy, you're like, this guy is fat and small at the same time. (laughs) It's yeah. So I have my brain somewhat war- warped by that, but I've been able to reel it back to an extent to realize that the average person is not seeing anything like that. Like a girl would see a bodybuilder and be like, "Ooh, disgusting." For sure, they yeah. would. Yeah. So like for even for this, like for your size, I imagine if they saw your physique, if you had just worked out and were all vascular and veiny and were like flexing, they probably probably say that's too much, even as a natural. Like a girl would say that. Yeah. So it's like at the end of the day, once you start taking like heavy amounts of steroids and really like pushing the envelope, you're really just impressing dudes anyways. Yeah, you are. So it's yeah, like, yeah. how much do you value impressing dudes? I guess is the question. Some you know, people need that validation, baby. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. They get their kicks off from. But um, for me with my natural physique and whatnot. Yeah. Like I didn't, I definitely should have waited longer than I did. And that's a lot of what my educational content revolves around mm-hmm. now is like how to know when you'd be ready, how to educate yourself understanding endocrinology and pharmacology before deploying this kind of stuff, how to read blood work. Um, so, if you're even in a health state where you'd be able to tolerate it, because some people, it's not like psychedelics where I guess, I guess worst case scenario, which is obviously a bad scenario is you end up like Connor Murphy, but in bodybuilding, a worst case scenario is literally like heart failure or kidney failure or, you know, like actually dying. So, you know, that so kind of psychedelics are safer. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm trying to not compare the two like directly, but because you can't, no one's died from taking LSD. Okay, there you, you go. Can't overdose on it. It doesn't kill your heart. Yeah. So in bodybuilding, though, like for example, no one does like cardiac imaging. No one like actually looks at their organ health before de- exposing themselves to this kind of shit. They just mm-hmm. take it and assume like, oh, I'll be okay. And that kind of stuff, you 
should actually check first to see if you can even tolerate these drugs to begin with. And that's a lot of what my channel goes into. It's like stuff I wish I did back in the day and I would do now if I could go back in time. So yeah, I would have waited longer personally. Right. But you don't regret taking them? No, because a lot of the experiences I had, even if they were negative or were wasteful, like a lot of times I really did use shit when I was not making the most of it. Yeah. Like I would eat with like a subpar diet or, you know, not get my rest or train, you know, with like not even like focusing on like tracking my lifts for progressive overload. I would just go and do like fluff workouts and stuff. I didn't realize at the time you only have so much duration of like organ exposure to these compounds before you get to a point where it's like you're not healthy enough to tolerate continuing the stuff. So when you do take it, you got to be super dialed in and make the most of it because you can only do it so many times. You know what I mean? But you can take the HRT. HRT is long term therapeutic replacement. Yeah. So there are some things that are minimally thrown off, like your lipids, for example, like your HDL is likely going to be a bit lower. There's some minor things that can be have implications like a uh, heightened hematology profile. Like you get more viscous blood. Some people need to therapeutically phlebotomize occasionally are, are you safe on it, though. Like you feel like you're yeah. totally good. OK. Yeah. Knock on wood. But I think like based on I do all of my homework on everything and I'm and like you get blood work taken. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's obviously what I recommend. But in general, if you're replacing a hormone with a therapeutic amount, you should not be putting yourself in harm's way to any significant extent. Now, there's obviously very nuanced parts to that argument, though, because when you take TRT, you're also shutting down different processes in your body that produce that testosterone. So it's like you I don't know if you can make the argument that it's literally equal in health. Like there's mm -hmm. there's things that are definitively thrown off when you take TRT that are not literally the equivalent of natural production. But at the same time, if you're hypogonadolin had low T as a natural, either through lifestyle, diet, age, or exposure to anabolic steroids in your youth or whatever age you are, mm -hmm. it could be more unhealthy to not take the TRT because then you have low testosterone, low estrogen, which is terrible for brain health, cardiovascular health, et cetera. So at that point, it's like, okay, well, actually being on TRT is healthier than not being on TRT. So if you're going to compare it to a guy who's normally fine and a guy who puts his test at the exact same level of TRT, mm -hmm. I would imagine the guy who's natural, who has adequate production, is probably healthier than the guy right. who's on TRT. But is if, there any way to, to know? Yeah, you would get test? yeah, you get blood work done. You see where you're at. You see where your biomarkers are at and whatnot. But is there any way to check? Like, are there any? markers of having low t that you can tell without blood work erectile dysfunction mood swings um lots of things in terms of you you've experienced them yourself dude when you yeah. were dieting down think of all those oh you think i had low t when i was dieting down for sure probably okay you said you were like well i guess food deprivation also contributes to being fatigued and whatnot yeah, obviously I was too some days 1400 calories a Ooh, day oh dude yeah and that's what i looked like on 1400 yeah maybe my body just doesn't want to lose the weight yeah, it's uh sometimes it's yeah, sometimes when you crush your you cut your calories like so aggressively, you can get to a point where you plateau like really early and then it's like where do I go from here? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And it's like when you're at 1400, like I can imagine you felt like death. I felt awful. Yeah, like sub 2000, I'm like suffering. I, even 2500, like obviously I'm taller and like overall like larger so I have more calorie requirements, but in yeah. general like even proportionally like for girls that are like even like a couple inches shorter than you, they would be eating 1600 calories to maintain. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. doing the 1400 long. I was, I was bouncing between 14. To that was 1600. like your low point. Yeah. That was like the lowest, like yeah. there was maybe a couple weeks and I was just trying to do that aggressive cut. I did it in the most unhealthy way possible. Yeah. So then I gained a bunch of the weight back and now I've been slowly doing it in the way that preserves muscles. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's the way yeah. to do it for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like my girlfriend eats like 2000 a day and she just like sustains her weight. That's awesome. Yeah. So just guys who get to like sub like 1800, like really aggressively, you lose a ton of fat, like really fast. And it's super rewarding getting that like instant, like not instant gratification, but like pretty fucking quick. You see mm -hmm. results. But then once you plateau, you're like, oh shit. Like what now? Yeah. Well now I'm not dropping it more, but then, you know, you just implement jogging or some form of cardio. Yeah. But then it's like, you only have that one vector to push on. Yeah. And you're already fatigued as fuck. Do you want to do cardio when you're at 1500 calories? Dude, I was doing it. I was doing But you were suffering through it I and was starving as fuck <laughs> yeah. and probably thinking, I should probably use more amphetamine to crush my appetite right now. No, I wasn't I feel taking like amphetamine at that point. Good willpower then. Yeah. Because that's like something most people... I was people... taking Kratom, which made me so hungry. I was like struggling so much. That's a horrible combo, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so... I wanted to ask you something else and I forgot. 
Damn it. Something about being natural, TRT, um, health, not being... Uh, yeah, you said something in a video that I watched of yours that really I was interested in. You mentioned people who take TRT are more motivated. I wanted to ask oh. if that is kind of like the motivation you get from amphetamine. Is there a similarity between the steroid motivation and amphetamine motivation? Um, the no, in that amphetamine is a very like acute response. I find that you're like you have an instant drive to do something, mm -hmm. whereas with testosterone, it's more like a background. Um, I don't know. It's it's again like I imagine this is the same thing as you trying to describe psychedelics to me. It's more like okay, think this is a good example. So think about your mindset when you were not dieting versus your mindset when you are dieting, how much easier is it to get work done when you're fed properly versus when you're dieted down, you have no motivation, you're like tired as fuck and you feel shitty. That's not an exact comparison because if you have natural normal test levels, mm -hmm. you're okay and then you push it up to super physiologic. It's not like you're going to get that much more motivation or drive necessarily. But if you're a guy who's like, you're comparing low T to high T in a natural range, yeah, drastic difference in terms of what you're going to be able to do. So stress resilience, motivation to do things, how driven you are, goal oriented. And I do think there is a direct interplay with like gender and how many become successful. And I know that might be like a touchy subject, but I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that like there's obviously successful female entrepreneurs, Yeah. but in general, like the more male energy, masculine, you know, guys with test, Mm -hmm. typically excel above females in similar fields. Now there are females who do excel again. It's not, you know, there are, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but yeah. in general, I think testosterone really dictates how you go about your life and like how you go to achieve things. So I don't know, that's kind of like the best way I can put it is it definitely does make a difference in terms of your ability to fight through things, your motivation to drive through adversity, your, um, goal setting, caring about goals to begin with, that kind of shit is definitely enhanced. You're with making me feel like I have low testosterone because I've, I've gone through periods where I just like, I cared a lot and then I stopped caring so much about goals or all of that stuff. Uh, it's possible. But I can build muscle fine. So wouldn't that mean that my T is fine? Not necessarily. Because again, when it comes down to androgen receptor content, yeah, you could have a guy with topped out test levels, like, a th like the reference range, like, how, do you know what a reference range is? It's like on your blood work, you would have this is the normal amount for the population. Yeah, from, I know Canada's is really low, right? Yeah, it's like two, 250 to like 850 or 900, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, years ago, it would have been the upwards of like 1100 would be the top end of the reference range. Right. So anyways, they will, you know, hypothetically, you would think, okay, well, if you have a guy with a testosterone level of 700 versus a guy with 300, he probably has more ability to pack on muscle. Right. And from an actual like signaling aspect, that's not totally illogical to think, but when you actually at a receptor level, your receptivity to the actual androgen attaching to the androgen receptor. Like how sensitive you are to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So your actual expression at a gene level yeah. is different dependent on your actual androgen receptor content. It doesn't just come down to the volume of drug. Gotcha. So even if I if I injected me with 200 milligrams, you with 200 milligrams, we're not going to respond the same way at all. Mm -hmm. Like massive variation to the point where some guys like look like bodybuilders and some guys not necessarily on 200 milligrams. I'm just saying if you inject yourself with testosterone, yeah. some guys get like disproportionately strong effects and some guys are like barely respond. And then most guys are someone in the middle. So same with all drugs, eh? Testosterone, psychedelics, yeah. the, all the individualized unique experience. Yeah. So I don't know, man, but it's definitely a, like a lot of entrepreneurs I know do do TRT, not even just for, <laughs> performance so that's well, that's the angle i would be interested in is from an entrepreneurial exactly like, uh, i know a lot, a lot of guys who do it simply to maximize all the things i mentioned about stress resilience stuff like that and it definitely makes a difference dude mm. and especially if you want to be lean year round or at least striking distance of being like what your gold body composition is yeah that to be completely honest is typically unsustainable for most people without some sort of exogenous hormone support so i would never recommend a guy who's not like naturally gifted to sort of hover around that normally to try and like pursue a calorie deprived diet model to hold that body composition year round, consequently inhibiting their testosterone, their thyroid hormone, a bunch of different things, mm -hmm. which 
downstream is also going to play with your neurological health and how you respond to psychedelics and how you respond to different things because it all interplays like estrogen has a huge role on neurology and whatnot so that kind of stuff is uh like a huge detriment for naturals unfortunately if you want to be like the shredded guy oh, I, I can't do it it's so. fucking impossible if you're not like hormonally enhanced unfortunately yeah but with trt it's not like you have to be bodybuilder hormone levels it's just like replacing what you've deprived yourself of essentially I don't necessarily recommend it. I'm just saying that hypothetically, that's a scenario. If somebody wanted to sustain that like unreasonable body composition or at least close to it with no detriment to their performance and in a mental context in terms of being sharp and on the ball and whatnot, especially as you get like deeper into your thirties and pushing into your forties, depending on how much you're like sleep deprived too, and like a bunch of lifestyle factors that play with your testosterone production, like, yeah, it could be like a night and day difference potentially. So. Yeah, I'd be curious to try it, but I don't I don't know if I want to ju- make yeah, that no, jump. Yeah, no, don't proactively jump on anything. Just get like a blood test and you can see for yourself like sort of where you fall. Yeah, see, my fear is personally speaking, I don't like the idea of having, same with like taking the amphetamines. I hated Reliance. how I made it. Yeah, I got to yeah. take it all the time. And I'm thinking like if I tried it, then it's I'm dependent on it because then my test levels are going to crash when I go off it. Yeah, so what you could do, actually, you know, hypothetically, um it's not like once you take it you're shut down forever if you took a short acting version of it Mm -hmm. you could get it in and out of your system quick to a point where you would be back up to homeostasis like relatively quickly it's not like you crash and then you're you're... what does that mean a short acting version so like there's different esters attached to the drug itself so your body cleaves these esters off we're just talking about trt right yeah so testosterone is the actual androgen itself that's exerting its effects but when you administer testosterone just in its base form, it has such a short active life. Uh-huh. It's like in and out of your system in like hours. Oh, wow. So they have to attach attach something called an ester to it. So there's okay. different esters like propionate. Um, it's a very short one. Then there's like a bit longer ones. There's um, enanthate is a moderate one. Cypionate is a longer one. Decanoate is a very long one. Undecanoate is a pretty long one. Undesalinate is a very long one. These ones get cleaved off. And as they're cleaved off, like basically you, if you look at a, the chemical, It'll be like the androgen, like the testosterone molecule, and then this big like chain off of it of the ester. Mm -hmm. And it's longer and longer the more your body has to cleave off essentially. Gotcha. And that extends the active life of it. So for somebody who's actually on TRT and has dialed in their dose, they want to inject less frequently typically. So they will use a long acting testosterone like a testosterone cypionate inject it once or twice a week Mm -hmm. and then it's in their system for you know they only have to do it like one shot a week or something that's not so bad yeah so but with these shorter ones you're also exposing yourself to the risk of if you use a long one and you don't know how you respond say you have an adverse reaction or you want to get off you now have to wait much longer for it to clear out of your system yeah and extending your duration of being hormonally deprived essentially which is not optimal for somebody who's experimental about it. So at, gotcha. so at that point, it would be like, it would be like the equivalent of me, of you being like, am I going to recommend you a psychedelic that lasts for 24 hours versus one? Like what <laughs> is the safer introductory thing to like control the outcome, you know? Uh-huh. So if I have a bad reaction, you you don't want to be fucked for a whole day, obviously. So same thing with tests. You would ideally introduce something if you're going to experiment that is shorter so you can clear it quicker if you wanted to get it out of your but if system. you wanted to stay on it then you would just make the jump to a longer one yeah exactly gotcha. i didn't know you could do that that's fascinating yeah so there's like no a lot idea. of that's how they tweak the pharmacokinetic profile of these drugs is they'll use different ester chains in order to and extend that's the safest way right beyond doing like or sarms is that oh, sarms is like a bad an- idea yeah, I wouldn't do SARMs because those shut your testosterone down ah. and would actually, despite the fact that you'd gain muscle on them because they are very potent at what they do, they also sh- are relatively potent. They shut down your testosterone production, so you'd actually have symptoms of hypogonadism s- simultaneously whilst gaining muscle. So it's like the most paradoxical thing ever. You feel like shit, but you're making gains. <laughs> Yeah. So, so the best is just classic testosterone. For the safest. like where you're at in terms of just the fact that I've heard you even having like symptoms of low T and the fact that you're looking for aspects of it that are not just muscle growth. You're looking for the mental component too. Yeah. This is driven through testosterone mainly. Gotcha. So that's what I would be not recommending looking into. And obviously, to be honest, like 
it's really easy to get baseline blood work and just see where you're at. Like, there's no risk yeah, or should, harm in that. Bl- I'm curious. I'm just yeah. curious what my levels are. I should do the blood work. Do you yeah. know where to go? Where do you go to get this blood work? Um, it's a bit of a, this conversation would be like a tangent for like people wouldn't give a fuck because no, how many Canadians are going to watch this and know what yeah, I'm talking we should, about. We got way more stuff to talk about still. Yeah. So we'll talk about that after and I'll uh, All right. set it up. But um, oh, last question on the testosterone. This is, I don't know if this is relevant, but people who take it, they get the back pimples, right? I have back pimples all the time. Okay. Yeah. So could that be a sign that I have high testosterone or is it irrelevant? Um, it depends because there are individuals who just don't get acne when they take a shit ton of hormones, like beyond super physiological grams of shit. Right. And there are some individuals. But I always have it. Like I have it right now. I have back pimples. Yeah. So it's not necessarily in like it definitely for you in particular. I bet would be a metric of how much test you have in your system to an extent because you're prone to it, but it doesn't mean relative to another individual. Mm-hmm. They could have a shit ton of tests, have no acne whatsoever. Oh, I see what you're saying. But yeah, for yeah. you, presumably, if you had lower T, I imagine your acne would be lesser intense. And the more your test is higher, I imagine it would be worse. So that I'll likely get lots of back pimples if I took it. I imagine it would be exacerbated to some extent. However, it doesn't mean you can't attenuate that with other pharmacology obviously Mm -hmm. so i see yeah all right let's jump on something else so pickup artist stuff (laughs) totally totally different so well sort of i guess like being i love how you're leading this you've got the computer like you're actually leading the podcast you're on my podcast but you're guiding it (laughs) if if i actually liked uh delving into that that was that was cool if you have any specific questions for me by all means sounds uh, good so pua stuff so as some of you may or may not know my channel name, More Plates, More Dates, obviously uh, based around, it was sort of just, you know, a name I thought was catchy when I was in my early 20s and I thought was, uh, you know, sort of encompassed somewhat of what my channel talks about, which is like, to be honest, I don't actually care if I, you know, ha- lift more plates or like the more dates, whatever. It just sounds good <laughs> and it was catchy and memorable. But I did talk about dating dynamics and like social dynamics and stuff quite a bit when I was first starting. It's because I was, when I was younger, I was like crippled with, not crippled with social anxiety, but I was not very successful in social interactions to the point that it compelled me to like really disproportionately achieve in that area to where I kind of like made up for my lack of success in my teen years. I can relate. So me, I ended up going on like these forums and shit and like learning about pickup artist stuff. RSD? Yeah. Did, so, you, did you follow Tyler? Yeah. So that, that guy I told you about Chris earlier, he actually used to hang out with Tyler and Mystery and uh, Neil Strauss and those, oh no. those oh guys. No. From, oh, no, that gang. Yeah. And he did the dumb like peacocking shit and stuff like that. I tried that when I was younger. Yeah. I had a friend who was, anyway, you continue. Yeah. So the that whole thing was what compelled me about it is this idea that they explain in this book called The Game where they outline how... Basically, they laid it out in a way that it didn't matter how good you looked or anything. Rather, it was about how good you were with like game and talking, essentially. And that really, in my head, was very compelling because I thought, wow, like you can acquire the skill that's superior to others in a way that allows you to get, you know, women. I got to learn this thing. I got to figure it out. So I read the game. Literally wrote down the mystery method stack on a piece of paper like a fucking nerd and brought it with me. Openers, yeah, Yeah. brought it with me to clubs. I had my DHV spikes. I had my uh, my set openers that you probably said the same ones as me. Displaying (laughs) higher value spikes. Yeah, like (laughs) did you see the fight outside? Like blah blah blah, and you like say the same fucking story that every other guy said. That shit doesn't work though. Yeah. So what I quickly found out is that stuff because it's not true, first of all, but is also not congruent with your personality. You don't actually develop. You become a good actor at faking shit and talking about a script but you don't actually become better at talking to people and women can sense the incongruency they, exactly they pick up on it they're like what, what you're saying is going one direction but your body language and vibes are going the other yeah and then you just feel weird mm. yeah yeah it feels weird even when you're saying it even if you're you've rehearsed it many times and that's exactly it if you feel weird saying it they're going to feel weird hearing it you find out you learn this through doing it more that your base whatever your baseline is, is contagious. Yeah. So if that's a weird dude, everyone's going to be contagious and pick up the vibes. Yeah. So I found you get good at it when you actually just don't give a fuck, right? Yeah. So that's exactly what I thought is after a while, I realized there's no way this is sustainable. There's no way I'm going to have success with this long term. And even if I do have success, these chicks are not even here for me. They're here for this weird script thing that is not me. And I basically just like trick them into like having sex essentially. But did you actually get to the point where the script worked? 
No. Okay. The script never worked. It never worked. The script was <laughs> terrible. Um, so what I started doing was literally just like throwing myself into the fire and learning how to talk. Yeah. So for me, that was literally saying like, I thought you were attractive. I just want to say hi or like being with the same line. Exactly. Just I would go up and say, Hey, I thought you were so cute. I had yeah. to come over. And it wasn't a lie. I did think they were cute. Yeah. And that's like the good thing is it's genuine. And even if you have nothing to say after that, it's the throwing yourself into the situation enough times you eventually are able to say the second sentence and then the third. They and would then... call that the direct approach. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I do like cold direct approaches and get very good at speaking off the cuff. And that actually developed like for me, develop my social skills very quickly. Cause How I did long it. did it take to get good though? That's the real thing. Four months. That's it. But I did it every day. Wow. And I did, I treated it like the gym, like progressive overload. Like, you know how you go to the gym, you're like, okay, I benched, I benched, uh, you know, 185 today. So I'm going to do 190 next time. I mm -hmm. literally would go to my cold approach like session. Yeah. And I'd be like, I did three the other day. I got to do four. And I wouldn't leave until I did four. And then the next time I do five. And it got to the point where I'd like, titrate up my progression in some way that was tangible wow you did more approaches than last time yeah exactly <laughs> yeah exactly and it would feel it felt like you were failing yourself if you didn't beat your previous efforts yeah so, and then i got to the point where it'd be like my i do as literally right when i saw somebody i'd go up to them and then after that it was about reducing the amount of time it takes me to go up to them i don't know extending the conversation how many numbers I would collect in one day, how many dates I would subsequently go on. Did you get good at though getting the, because I found, especially, you know, there's a difference between daytime and nighttime. Yeah. But I found at nighttime, it was never about collecting numbers. No, It ever. was about, you got to just stay with the same person the whole time. Yeah, if you didn't close them on the night, like you're never going to get you, a drunk not, chick to go out on like a date with you rarely. after. Like, yeah. like sometimes you'll get a text back. But yeah. I found, I used to take the approach where I would go out at night. In the beginning, everyone does this, I think, because the numbers are like the dopamine hit. That's like yeah. the reward. You're like, at the end of the night, you compare with your friends. Oh, I got five numbers. I got six. And yeah. then it's like this, this, co this dick measuring contest. But then you go to text those numbers or call them. Yeah. They don't answer. They don't respond to the text. And you're like... I even got to the point where I would, I had made out with some of the girls, right? And they'd still ghost you. And in your head, you're like, okay, come on. She likes you yeah. enough to kiss me. Yeah. And then they still don't respond. Yeah. So I quickly put two and two together and I was like, no, nah, you got to make a real connection. Yeah. So then I started doing it where I knew I got to the point where I was good at it when I could consecutively just choose one person that I liked and I would just stay with that person the whole night. Was your origin story like similar to mine in terms of lack of success in like high school or like how did you get into it? Yeah, well, that's kind of how I got into working out. Okay. Was I, I, I think I was, I started working out at 15 or 14 even, shit, I was young when I started working out. And it was because I was like this really short, obviously skinny, nerdy kid mm. and picked on for being small. Mm. And it was like, I think that over overlapped into feeling like I wasn't attractive to women. Right. So I was like, how do I boost my attractiveness? Well, I've got some weights. Obviously, I didn't know what I was doing at first, but I quickly gained like abs. And I like at 15, not many kids have abs. And I had like a None. six pack. Yeah. And I was like, I don't even know if it was because I was ripped that I started like becoming more attracted to women. But I just I felt more attractive. I think that's the biggest thing because I, I objectively don't have didn't have a lot more success directly from like getting shredded or something it came more from my attitude about my own self bleeding into my interactions so like my perspective of how valuable i was would bleed into my confidence and how smooth i was and how confident i you was it's trippy the... you can be a fat guy and, and you yeah. can be just as successful if oh, you yeah. have those same feelings some of my best successes were when i was like bulking aggressively and yeah, like yeah. looked like shit Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not about that. It may, it's really funny to all these dudes who like put so much emphasis on their body at the gym and you said it, it's really just validation from men. Yeah. Like to a degree, obviously looks matter where you can't be like atrocious, but I mean, as long as you have, as long as you do your best to maximize yourself, it's not going to be like a make or break if you have abs versus not have abs or like, yeah, like you can't be 500 pounds. Like yeah. There's a, there's a limit here, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so yeah, my story was that, but then what happened was I had this one girlfriend and I had a daughter really young. Mm -hmm. And like, because I think I had low self-worth even when I was a kid, because I thought that my self-worth came from being physically fit. Right. So I had really low self-worth. And then that relationship was with a very unhealthy partner. She was horrible. Like uh, the type who cheats and lies, like a compulsive liar, like a very, very unhealthy female. Mm -hmm. And then that like crushed me. 
because I had no experience with girls. So I was crushed. And then I remember feeling like I would never uh, meet another girl again. Like, so I was fully like emotionally dependent on this super unhealthy chick. And then when that finally ended for good, I just felt like I had nothing. And then I found out about the pickup stuff and I was like, oh, maybe I do have hope. All right. So yeah, then I got into it that way. Yeah, it's typically like some like traumatic or like, I don't know if traumatic, but in I general. Know, mine was traumatic, having a kid at like 17. Yeah, so yeah. for you, you had like a big shift in your mindset to be like, you know, rock bottom and then like climb your way back up to. Oh, I was so depressed. Yeah. I, I started it from a place of like just misery. Yeah. So it's definitely, and once you learn this stuff for the first time too, it feels like you've opened the floodgate sort of, because before I would always have thought you have to meet people through friend groups and social circles and there's no other way to do it. Because even when I started, it's not like online dating was a huge thing. It was like, there's like plenty of fish and like, okay, keep it and oh, stuff. Plenty of fish was awful. Yeah. I hope this camera doesn't go. Hold on. Okay. Time left. There was one of these that is, that is pushing its limits. Okay, so honestly, I don't know exactly what I was left off saying, <laughs> but. Sorry. No, it's, we, uh, we took a break because we had to reset the cameras and. Um, empty so, bladders. Yeah. So we're back on the uh, PUA discussion. And like for me, the like a lot of it was honestly trying to get to a place where not only I felt like I was confident in my ability to like, it isn't just about getting girls. It's about facilitating like social interactions in a way that you feel can like you have some control of the situation you're able to handle yourself in a public environment without mm -hmm. being embarrassed or anxious and the most beneficial aspect i found above and beyond actually having a healthy dating life was it would bleed into things like job interviews business presentations oh, yeah, and university sure. i felt like i had this innate skill that no one else had because i was like i'm way better at all you fuckers than talking like <laughs> in the job interview like waiting room i'd just be sitting there like you know how many hot girls I've talked to like this is fucking <laughs> easy and it would actually like translate because yeah, it it's does. like if you can if you can talk to like terrifying like hot girls talking to some random dude about you know business stuff not too hard so for me a lot of people I think they frown upon the pickup stuff because they see it as this uh you know like hedonistic you know they see it as manipulating women they don't, under, they don't understand that it's not it's really not about the woman it, it's about you and just gaining confidence yeah like it's not even at first, it's about getting laid, but also it's about even knowing you can get laid. That's a big part of your mindset shifting to an area that's not so insecure about everything. It's about becoming emotionally healthy and your ability to facilitate social interactions in general, in my opinion. So like for me, it went above and beyond just the get girls thing and, you know, make up for lost time in high school sort of thing and mm -hmm. went into actually becoming a man in my opinion and i think a lot of guys especially in today's environment like it's a lot different when we were doing the pickup stuff probably where like this stuff wasn't going on with the you know what and people are stuck in their houses but in addition to that the more how would you do it now yeah the more online stuff gets too it's like considered more and more weird to be like a cold approach guy or something who gives a fuck that's what I think, though, too, because I think it's easier to set yourself apart from people who are like hermits at this point. If you were out and about and you were at a grocery store and you saw an attractive girl and you're able to hold a fluid, intellectual, like good conversation. And with the amount of fear going on, how refreshing would that be for her? Mm. If you were actually good on your toes and you could keep up with her conversation wise, because, you know, women are so much more advanced than men, socially speaking. Yeah. They just mature faster and these are skills they learn sooner and they learn skills that men usually never learn so almost in a way it's like learning pickup kind of gets you up to speed to be on par with where women naturally are yeah in a sense but i think that women would really appreciate a good interaction even if that woman is taken and a lot of guys are afraid of it because they're like well what if she has a boyfriend I yeah mean, it's gonna hurt the rejection or she doesn't want it they they, they defeat themselves before they get into it. They come yeah. up with a million reasons why it's a bad idea to talk to her. But like realistically speaking, I found that the women really appreciate you and, yeah. and the whole framework of leaving them better than when you found them. If even if like she's taken and she rejects you, usually if you do it and if you're coming at it from the right perspective with a big smile on your face, mm -hmm. she actually feels happy. Yeah. Like she is enjoying the interaction. And it's memorable versus having 50 guys in their DMs who are saying, you're so hot. Yeah, anyone, anyone can do that. Yeah, and that's what everyone anyone. does now. So it's becoming more 
as much as it seems like women are inundated with opportunity to a point that it disproportionately bolsters their ego. Yeah. At the same time, it's also easier and easier to set yourself apart as a man in that most guys are pussies who do everything online now. And I truly think that if you're able to have a fluid, cold conversation off the bat from no, you know, prior knowing them or anything, mm -hmm. that sets you apart from every other guy like so drastically. Yeah. I mean, no one's able to do that now, I feel like. So, yeah. Do you think it's so you think it's getting less? Obviously, with all this stuff going on, it's less common. Yeah. But even before that, you think it was getting less common for guys to go yeah. approach? I think at the rise of Tinder and all the apps and stuff, I think mm -hmm. it was becoming more. It is, I will admit, very time efficient to use the apps, but there's no reason while you're out and about just doing your errands and stuff. Yeah. If you come across them and you find attractive, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to have a conversation. Feels like a superpower, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Like I was saying to you when we first chatted that uh, it was, I think, what caused my channel to rise in success because it translates not just to job interviews, but making these videos. Yeah. You feel like you're more confident in your ability to speak. Oh, absolutely. And that when you're this becomes your job and your job is to talk. Yeah. I don't have to describe the benefits of that. So it's no, like yeah. the benefits are countless. And if there's anything that is promising about it too, like I definitely think there's newbie gains from it. Like, you know, when you go to the gym and you first start, you gain disproportionate amounts of strength relative to when you've plateaued kind of thing. Yeah. And when you first start doing this, the first approach, terrifying. First few approaches, pretty fucking scary. Mm -hmm. After a while, even if you're literally stumbling on your words, it gets to a point where you're more expecting and you kind of are okay with it. If you're getting rejected, you start to accept rejection as like a normal outcome and it's not... Yeah. Of 100 approaches, how many are going to translate into a number? How many of those numbers translate into dates? How many of those dates translate into a long-term relationship? Like 1% if you're lucky. Yeah. So maybe not the lays, like you might get better percentage than that, but like ultimately finding a good partner of 100 cold approaches, it's a lot lower even for like top tier elite attractive guys than you would think. Yeah. So I think people get very uh, uncomfortable with the idea of rejection when in reality, it's like you have to expect that that's going to happen. And it will inevitably, you will crash and burn. That's the whole point. And that's how you learn how to overcome that and speak more fluently and become better at, you know, getting closer to a successful social interaction sort of thing. I'm fascinated with where that fear stems from, because if you look at it from the whole tribal standpoint, I'm sure you know this, but I don't know how many viewers know this. Back in the day, we're designed to live in tribes. We still are. Yeah. And it's like, imagine there's like five or 10 women in the tribe. <laughs> If they reject you, you're toast. Yeah. Your genes will not pass on. You're never going to have sex. And it's like these fears are still instilled in us today, even though it went from five to ten women to like five to ten million women in, I don't know, I can't say in a city, but in any given area, there's, yeah. there's millions of women. Yeah, yeah. But we're still programmed for tribal life. And yeah. these programmed effects of tribal life transition into like a lot of problems we see, not just women. I mean, I could go off and on how, why it's like, why we feel so lonely. And it's because we're all now living in individual homes. And we used to live in actual like gatherings with mm -hmm. things of people. And I, I feel like our current state of affairs, like the current way we live is counterproductive to our general happiness, just because yeah. we're not designed to live this way. And we're trying to force like a, a, a square shape into a round hole. Yeah. And it just, it doesn't work no matter how hard you push. And this is why people have to convince themselves. I'm going off on a total tangent, but when it comes to women, <laughs> We have this fear where there's some men who they have admitted they would rather go to war. You've heard yeah. this, right? They'd rather have to fight to their death than approach a woman. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. What a fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And even the scarcity you mentioned of, you know, you only have five or 10 people in a tribe or whatever. It definitely, you can see it bleed into relationships and people holding on to toxic, emotionally unhealthy partnerships just because they think they can't do better or you know replicate their current scenario again they think we can only do worse yeah yeah so they end up staying with somebody they're like totally unhappy with based on the fact that they don't think they can do better and that's i think where a lot of this the benefit of this you know um thing that people frown upon as like pua like yeah the pua stuff is can be a bit slimy and whatever, yeah, but the this reciting is reciting lines. Shit yeah, we're not really talking about PUA. That's just our way to discuss the topic of talking to females. No, we're talking about going out and, and just being we're basically what they would call the natural approach. Just yeah. being yourself and yeah. starting a thread of conversation with a stranger. Yeah. And people conflate that with like manipulation when in reality, it's 
why can I not talk to a guy and have a fluid conversation? Why can I not talk to a girl? And it's the same thing, yeah. you know? And if I happen to click with her, like maybe you want to hang out again. Like that's a very natural progression of social interaction, I would think. Mm -hmm. But instead they view it as, oh, guy walks up to girl equals creepy. It's like, yeah, if you make it creepy, it can be creepy. Mm -hmm. But how about you just fucking talk normally, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's definitely something that is becoming more and more. Um, Unfortunately uncommon yeah because i think it almost feels like a rite of passage that men should learn how to do yeah and i see something very commonly too is men who think that the path to getting women is success or financial or whatever and then they neglect the very basic component of being able to talk to humans and they end up in this position of power or authority or money and then they've neglected the social aspect so much that now they're like this insecure, like 40 year old rich guy who's trying to make up for lost time in a disproportionate way and like date, you know, like 18 year old models and 20 year olds and shit. But they, yeah. they're so socially awkward too. They don't even have the emotional stability to trust that the girl's with them for the right reasons. And she's not. And yeah, they're, they're not. And the, like, if you haven't built up that skill set, then yeah, he's not confident he can actually get her any without the money and without the blah, blah, blah. Cause he couldn't. Exactly. So that's <laughs> that's where also the uh, main reason you do it, too, is you can only accumulate wealth and success through time in such a, you know, however quick you can do it. It's not the quickest thing. There's no overnight success, really. Mm -hmm. So if you're a 20 year old kid who, like, drives a piece of shit car, lives with his parents, has ten dollars in his bank account, I can relate to that, that. That kid, there's no way you're going to compete financially or successful wise with a guy who's in his 30s or whatever and has had a decade plus to accumulate these resources over you. Mm -hmm. But you can go out and talk to people and become literally better at him socially within six months of trying. Like that's the kind of thing people don't do. And then that thing translates into even your ability to generate that wealth as you get older and to, you know, interact with people in healthy ways. I think it's just a severely neglected component of becoming a man i think that i'm not even saying you need to like you need to go sarge and do the whole like I forgot about that word. yeah i totally forgot yeah i don't i don't word. you don't need to dedicate blocks <laughs> of time to cold approaching in mass but it's just about being if you're able to just talk to people without getting crippling anxiety like that's the ultimate goal and then translate into all areas of your life and that's what i found was like so valuable it is, above yeah. and beyond it's so unfortunate that that now more than ever people are shamed for doing that yeah like they're seen as doing something, like we said, manipulative, something wrong when um, ugh. our society is fucked. What was your channel like before? Like you mentioned you had an old channel that was about like social interaction, like sort of. Yeah, so I had a really old channel that was about like learning how to get good with women. And this is like in the infancy days of YouTube. And then I had a second one after that, which was uh, I still got one video up. It's called Super Wingmen. And uh, we tried to do like a mix of pranks and pickup. Okay. And are you are you on your thing? What? Are you oh, on I'm your on computer? my computer. Yeah, I can. Yeah, pull it go up. to uh, just type in asking strangers to have sex. Okay. That was my best video. Asking strangers to have sex. That was seven years ago. Is that how long it was? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, 2013 June. Super Wingman presents. Wow. <laughs> You can see, too, how people respond to stuff like this with the like to dislike ratio. Oh, so many dislikes. Yeah. And it's just like, I'm sure the comment section is filled with. Well, I wasn't expecting to get anything other than no's. Like, it was just a joke video. Like, let's just ask as many people okay. as I can to have sex. This isn't a real pickup video. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway, this. Uh, so what, why'd you stop this channel? Anyway, because I had absolutely no passion for doing this. Mm. There's another more pickup-y video. There's two up. And the other one is, if you click the channel, you'll see it. It's uh, using three words to pick up girls. Okay. Oh, there we go. Three magic words to get her number. Yeah. February 25, <laughs> 2013. Play it. What's this for? Oh, you, you don't speak anymore. Lost you. <laughs> Does this work for you? No, it doesn't work for you. You are cute. Thank you. You know what's funny about this is circling back to the Connor Murphy thing. This is kind of what he would do, but yeah. he, he did a video where he would take his shirt off and he would just like 
point at his phone and say zero words and oh, try and get numbers. See? So this is the kind of thing he would do. Like the same stuff? Yeah. Only I would just say you're doing it. Um, this is a great example of like doing Of course. <laughs> yeah. We're just trying to make a silly video. No, I have yeah. a boyfriend. I have a boyfriend. <laughs> you're like, well. Yeah. You are. And that kind of stuff's fun and like even if it's not meant to be serious that helps that kind of stuff is almost helps kill your social anxiety like if you're able to stand there awkwardly and endure that yeah imagine how easy it is to have a normal conversation yeah exactly yeah so this is my channel we, we did stuff like this and there I, was other videos i removed them and i guarantee like obviously i wouldn't recommend going up and asking girls to have sex but like the three magic words thing for example like that's i guarantee these girls remember that and laugh about it and like yeah, think it's sure. funny it's like a good memory you know Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they don't have anything like that that's happened to them. Probably. The sex one was more on the prank side. Yeah, and that's I like, even asked guys. You can tell that's more for trying to get views on YouTube rather than being like. And it worked. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like 16 million views. Yeah. Uh, some crazy number. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. Anyways, like relating it back to like a practical context, I definitely think uh, guys just need to get out of their comfort zone because once... I would recommend doing that one. The, the, just going up and saying they're cute. That's yeah. a really great way to shatter your anxiety because i think one of the hardest things to do when you're learning the whole pickup thing is being upfront with your intentions mm. how many guys would do indirect do you remember the two the oh, they would yeah. say direct game versus indirect yeah and everybody preferred indirect yeah. but then you're almost coming across as a friend like i always thought it was better to make your intentions known from the beginning like hi i'm talking oh, to you because you're sure. cute but that is honestly that was the hardest part for most guys isn't it it's just expressing their intent yeah because that all of a sudden puts you right on that thin line now it's like when you're indirect, there's some wiggle room because she's and you you think that there's wiggle room. Really, she knows why you're talking to her. Yeah. But you think, oh, since she doesn't know I'm interested, I have time to build that interest versus when I just go up and tell her my intentions. It's like a make or break. Like she has to say yes or no on the spot. Yeah. But that is attractive. Yeah. Just the very act of going up and saying, hey, you're cute. Yeah. And it's trying like to like finagle your way around just being direct. It comes across, I think, as not masculine and the opposite of attractive and she does not respect it the same way no you're right yeah yeah so i think the direct thing like ultimately that's you know the goal is to like communicate what your intentions are and if see if you guys are click or not like you have to see it not from the perspective of you're trying to trick this chick into liking you rather it's to see if you like each other like you exactly. are a valuable th addition to her life as she is a compliment to yours you're screening her this yeah. is when you get good you get good when you actually reach the, reach the point not where you're pretending yeah. that you're screening her but when you actually go up and you feel mm -hmm. with your being that i'm going up to see if i like this girl yeah and a lot of guys never reach that point and that's when you actually get good at doing this yeah. because they sense that they're like this guy just came up to me and he's screening me. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of throws them for a loop, right? Yeah. Because they're like, oh, this is weird. Yeah. They're used to being the uh, selector and being hit on. And, you know, mm -hmm. actually, I don't even know how used to girls are being hit on now. Because, like, I've, you know, attractive girls, to be honest, it's more and more seldom that guys will come up to them. But, again, they're used to being inundated on their phones and stuff. So they're pretty used to the flattering shit. But if you yeah. have the balls to be direct, do it in person be a confident guy like that kind of thing it sounds cliche be confident but it's like it makes a fucking difference especially in the context if it's in person yeah, but the real thing is how do you build that confidence and i would say you exposure therapy through exposure therapy which boils down to facing rejection yeah that's like in a nutshell you get as soon as you get good at facing rejection it has a counter effect where you get good with women mm -hmm. because that's what happens. Like you said, you in the beginning, you just I think I counted at one point. Like I actually sat down and did the math and I was like, all right, I have been rejected in the past six months, two to three thousand times. Wow. Yeah. I calculated how many nights a week I was going out day and night and then how many average approaches I do versus how many people actually are receptive. Yeah. And then it comes down to, what do you count a rejection? Because even getting a phone number and she doesn't answer the text, that's theoretically a rejection, right? Yeah. And it was like, wow, almost everybody I talk to, like less than 1% percent which is going well. Contrary to what, what bugged me about the whole pickup YouTuber space too, is they would show the phone number acquisition as a success. Like simple pickup? Yeah. They I talk shit about them all the time. So many videos yeah. where they got so many. I watched them too and I was like, wow, they make it look so easy. But what yeah. they don't show is how none of those girls are responding. Yeah. So a phone number means nothing. Yeah. So that, that shows who knows what they're talking about is if you can 
if you actually think a guy is successful because he's accumulated 300 numbers from hot girls, like you have no idea how little of those convert. Yeah. Yeah. So even even on online dating, you could get numbers and they still go nowhere. The girl just goes cold. Like the same shit happens. So, um, yeah, like I'm not like basically you have to go out there and do it yourself. You know, don't live through these like pickup videos. Don't, you know, try and, uh, Skirt around it with dumb tactics and shit. Just like go out there and like throw yourself in the is, fire. Is that what your advice would be? Just throw yourself in the fire? Yeah, definitely. Don't watch any content. Online. I treat it like I talk about it like double Dutch jump rope, where it's like you're you can see the thing and it's like it's very very intimidating, and you know yeah. you're probably gonna get slapped in the face a couple times when you try and jump in the first time. Mm-hmm. Almost inevitably, you're not gonna be successful the first time you jump in. You will get hit in the face. You will stumble. You will whatever. Eventually, after throwing yourself into the fire, however many times. You're able to jump in and smoothly jump the double dutch jump rope. But how many guys don't try it because they know they're going to get hit in the face? And this All, is why also, it's so powerful. Yeah. Because so few guys are doing it. Yeah, exactly. I definitely think it is uh, becoming a more and more valuable skill as the years go on. Because before, like, everyone had to do that, you know? If you weren't going to meet through your social circle, you had to do it. But now... People actually just met through their social circle, though. Yeah. Like, people were actually that restricted. But I think guys like us got into it because we had no social circle. Yeah. For me, I actually had none. So I was like, how am I supposed to get a girlfriend? Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, a lot of people get very uncomfortable about having... N- like, if you move to a new area or you're going to a new school, too. I did a video a long time ago on how to build social circles. And I think people don't realize how easy it is to actually build out one thorough approaches like it's not very hard to if you meet a girl and she ends up being into you just like that you have her and then her entire friend friend group that want to hang out with you Mm -hmm. like you could through a hundred approaches you could build so many different clicks of big circles that you could seem like the most popular guy fucking ever even if literally a week ago you knew nobody like there's so, so I don't know like people who use that as an excuse like I have no friends who like want to do this or whatever it's like go it alone yeah exactly all it's more awkward but to be honest sometimes it's more awkward for you exactly but it's less awkward for the girl yeah. how awkward is it when you're out with a friend we, I used to do this we go out in tandem and then you know we say we just chill mm-hmm. and then it depends on the scenario but say we're walking by like a coffee shop and I'm gonna go and talk to a girl at the coffee shop how I met my partner actually. And then what's your friend going to do? They're just like kind of waiting. Either they have to go and approach someone to not feel awkward standing around doing nothing. Or these days, I guess they'd go on their phone. But back when I was doing this, the phones weren't at like people had phones, Mm -hmm. but it was just transitioning into the touch phones. Right. So it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. But um, that's kind of awkward because it also gives you an escape because you're like, oh, I have to get back to my friend. And then you'll actually you will be mid interaction. And things are going smooth and you're thinking, well, I could escalate this and leave my friend. But it gives you the safety net to bounce back on because yeah. you're like, my friend's actually waiting for me. Yeah. And we're out ga- gaming together. Yeah. So I got to go back and join my friend. And it kills your pickup gains. Yeah. Because you're worrying about your buddy. So if you go it alone, you eliminate that whole scenario from yeah. ever happening. Yeah. And you can, you know what? I had my best success doing it when I was either alone or at nighttime. Because at nighttime, if I'm with friends, they, they're they going to go do their own thing, too. Yeah. And we'll just meet up at some point. Yeah. But in the daytime, I don't think it's good to go out with guys. No, it's yeah. It's just weird. I never tried to, like, close during the daytime. I would acquire numbers and try and set up a quick, like, a date shortly thereafter. Or perhaps... No, you do it right at the same time. Infrequently, I would do instant dates. Yeah. But that was more on campus with girls who were just, like on a break Uh, rather than if you're at a grocery store i don't like try and set up an instant date you could do it how i met jasmine yeah it's interesting so if i never got into this pickup stuff my two children wouldn't exist like it's all thanks to learning pickup and getting confident doing it i met her at a starbucks i was going to get a coffee she was outside at the coffee shop so yeah so i sat down with her at the coffee shop initially actually i thought she was uh i saw her go in and someone came in after her, a guy. Like, they went in, like, he held the door for her. And I was like, she's with that dude. Yeah. So I was sitting outside on the coffee shop patio. And I was thinking, she's really cute. I need to talk to her. Oh, but she's with that guy. And then I had this moment where my thoughts were like, should I do it even though she's with the guy? Like, how do I know that the guy yeah. is her boyfriend? Like, yeah. maybe it's not. Because that's a huge uh, disqualifier that guys see. They're like, she's with a guy. I can't talk to her. Yeah. When a lot of the time, it's not her boyfriend. Oh, exactly. And worst case scenario, if it is, you know. You just gave a compliment. Yeah. And you you can actually say to the guy, yeah, well, wow, sorry, bro. Like, you know, the girl's hot. Yeah. Like, <laughs> sucks to be you, bro. Like, you know, but turns out she wasn't even with that dude. So she came out to the patio 
and she brought her she was doing some work on her laptop and i was like so I, I waited for like a minute to see if the guy was coming out too because i didn't want to like be talking to her as he came out right that was it was the first approach i think of the day and you know that's always the hardest oh yeah and i was just like oh, <laughs> you just got to do it man just go do it so yeah. i definitely this is also a common misconception people think once you get good at it you don't get nervous anymore you just get you get rusty for sure. But you, you get better at pushing through it. Yeah. Like you always fear, always. I would say when you first start approaching in the day, I don't know if you can relate, there's always that little ping of anxiety. Yeah. That's like. Once you get going though, you're like. You're good. But the first one, at yeah. least for me, there was always like a little bit of, or a lot of apprehension. Yeah. But I remember I talked to her and then I sat down, we started talking and then there was like a. Five minutes up the road, there was an actual hiking trail, and I just asked her, like, what oh, are you up wow. to right now? Do you want to go for a walk? Nice. And she's like, uh, yeah, I guess. So we went for an instant hike. We did like a three-kilometer hike. There's definitely something to be said about striking when the iron's hot with girls that you are like, to. you've just met cold, because the you longer you to. wait, the more they'll you know, not be into it as much yeah. and forget about it or whatever. So like you either have to strike right away or you've got to like message them really early. Yeah. And I would set it up soon. within like as close to getting the number as physically possible. Like obviously sometimes if I meet them, if they were like, like oftentimes I would go to the mall and like, I wouldn't do this now or, mm -hmm. but like back in the day I would go to the mall and if I meet somebody like who's at work, even for example, who's like this like cute girl comes to help me at some store I'm in. I'm not going to be like, leave your shift right now. And like, let's go on an instant date. So I would get the number and try and set up, you know, when's your next day off, you know, set something up concrete and having uh yeah, the sooner you do it, the better for sure. But, um, definitely something to said to be said for that. Cause guys who like collect numbers and then go nowhere with them. It, uh, like it, they'll often fall off too. Like the longer they will, you wait, cause it's miserable. Yeah. I mean like the guys will fall off even continuing down the path of going out and meeting girls. Cause they'll feel very unsuccessful sometimes. Yeah. And it, it can be really, um, derailing what's the word it can be really demotivating um, yeah demotivating when yeah you... my first like 30 approaches or whatever like went nowhere mm -hmm. yeah like probably at least that eh, maybe only no... 30 dude my first like 100 like went nowhere <laughs> i got like some numbers that also went nowhere pretty quick and then i sort of started to pick up a bit more traction after maybe like 50 i got like a couple dates in but mm -hmm. um yeah like oftentimes of going nowhere too you could consider a first date that doesn't lead to a second also going nowhere so true like if you were to actually count things that developed into like high quality even if you consider a fuck buddy like a high a long-term thing because mm -hmm. it's more than seeing a girl once and never seeing her again yeah like every couple like every hundred maybe like one like high quality long long-term potential if even if like it's very low percentage like turnaround on those it's low percentage but it's more than if you were doing nothing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it helps you in so many areas of life. I feel like we're really selling the pickup game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like if my relationship fell apart, you know where I would be? Right back doing pickup. There was a time recently when things were really shaky and we like, you know, kind of split up for a bit. And where was I? I was in Mexico talking to some Mexican yeah. boss. <laughs> it was amazing too how fast I jumped back into it. Yeah. Like I was petrified. And then as soon as I started talking, I was just like, invaluable life skills i was like well this is actually easier than i thought yeah the first girl i talked to actually she's like my boyfriend's right inside and i just looked at her smiled i was like well you are adorable it was yeah. nice meeting you and it was like it just felt so easy yeah yeah exactly so easy yeah, worst case scenario you build up some mo some momentum like talking to somebody even if you get rejected like it's not second a big... girl i talked to i went on a date with there you go yeah yeah it was bazillion years off have yeah. kids approach second girl wants to hang out I guess you don't really lose the skill. No. What was wild is when I first started doing it, one of my friends who sort of got me into it, or at least was a heavy influence on me, his first cold approach ever in his life ended up being his long-term girlfriend. I was like, what the fuck are the chances of that, dude? Like, it took me... That's unhealthy. Yeah, it was almost, like, unfair to the point of, like, that should have not happened, you know? Also you unhealthy. He never gained the skill. Exactly. Yeah, it was, like, the most sloppy approach ever, and it still works, but... Yeah, definitely, um, without belaboring the point too much, I definitely, not just for getting girls, you know, but also even being able to talk in big groups, going to events with people you don't know. Yeah. Um, again, the job interview thing, YouTube, if you're going to do, you know, stuff that has to do with being YouTube. on video. Yeah. Has so much translation to so many aspects of life. Like, yeah, I, we're social creatures. You're basically upping your social game. You're leveling it up. I don't see yeah. how that couldn't be a good thing. Yeah.
And I don't want to like sound like I'm bragging, by the way, but being like, oh, I was off for so long and then I was able to meet someone the second time. But more like this is a real skill that is, you have like muscle memory with it, just 100%. like with working out. Yeah. And um, yeah, there was something else I wanted to say, but I tend to start getting a little rusty when I've been talking for so long. <laughs> You're more used to it. Yeah. You do this all the time. I, I get like better as the later it goes. Oh, I'm in man. Such a I'm of... like, my coffee's run out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have some random side topics that my co-hosts of my podcast have brought up that I thought would be interesting that we kind of came up with together. I don't know how many of these are going to be super. Um, Before I fizzle out totally, why don't we do the uh, the questions that other people submitted? Oh, sure. Because I think those will be a little more attractive to viewers. Okay. Um, let's see. Because I don't know if I have answers to the co-host questions. We might just be, you might ask, and I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend to know something I don't. It's funny because some of these are just so irrelevant. It's like, ask me questions to ask like substance. And then this guy's like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> like you're, you're collabing with him. Working out on Molly. Have not done it. Will not do it. Terrible idea. It raises your resting heart rate and that would be dangerous. What would happen if you mixed DMT with pre-workout? I, I have very little experience with pre-workout. Uh, Derek is going to have to assist me in this regard <laughs> and give me some of his fantastic formulated pre-workout to use. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll start like featuring it in videos. <laughs> I was like, before I start this video, here we'll have some gorilla. Is that what? Gorilla mind. mind yeah. Gorilla mind pre-workout. Yeah. All right. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I imagine this would not be the best combo, obviously, but none of us have practical experience, to be honest. Um, thoughts on Kratom. So obviously you've done many videos on Kratom already. I don't know if you have like a general <laughs> summation of like your <laughs> overall thoughts on it. Like it makes you hungry. Um, it has, which is opposite to most. Yeah. It makes most people not hungry, but for me, it makes me fucking starving. Yeah. As far as its actual effects um what was your overall stance on it just in a as somebody who has a hard time sometimes getting going with their work which is why i found amphetamines attractive i have been diagnosed adhd i don't know if i necessarily stand by that diagnosis like i don't know if i believe i have it to be real real with you guys uh, but for me it definitely helped in the work regard so i like to use it as a productivity enhancing agent so it helps me with getting stuff done. It helps me socially in the sense where I have an easier time talking. It would give me more of a flow to my conversations. Yeah. Less choppy. Um, I found the effects very similar to amphetamines, but less intense. Similar, notice, uh, similar in like the actual effect itself, not in the way that I would reach that effect, if that makes sense. What are your favorite strains you try? Like, like do you notice a huge difference between like a Mangda and like a Bali, for example? Yeah. The interesting with Kratom is when you're like addicted to it, you're, I've, I've read this happening to people, a strain that works really well for you can actually stop working. And then a strain that used to not work very well, all of a sudden you try it now and it's like very effective. So my strains would, would switch. Mm. Um, a few that I remember uh, having a high affinity for would be the Mengdas. Yeah. Uh, not the red so much as the white and green Mengda for sure. I definitely was more tailored towards the whites, which is probably the same reason why I liked amphetamines. They're more stimulating. Right. So I would go to the, my favorites that I can remember was the Mengdas were okay. But oddly enough, after like I really pushed Mengda, I couldn't take them anymore. They just started giving me like this weird head buzz where there was absolutely no pleasure associated with Mengda at all. Oh, wow. So, near the end of it no more mang does and then i moved on to the ties like the white or green tie i found to be really um pleasurable in the sense where it heightened my ability to escape reality like if i had this mountain of work to do and i just wanted to play some fucking video games yeah i could take a green tie and just like zone out and play games and it was like that work i had to do was gone so it really helped heighten um yeah it made it easier to run away from shit hmm. so so the Kratom had like mixed effects. And initially it helped me do work. And then as I started using it more and more, it started to become more of an escape tool than a productivity tool. 
Hmm. The tie strands, aren't those traditionally seen as slower? Or is that... I'm actually I'm trying sure. to work. I, honestly, it's been so long since I've looked at the effects of Red Edge. Bally is a universal favorite. I think that was the first big strain. I thought that was like a hybrid that's like not fast but not slow. Red Bally? Yeah, that's what I thought. No, I, I'm pretty sure it's like the OG Kratom st- strain. Is really yeah, but I, I thought it was like pretty broad spectrum in its effects. It's yeah, I think like, so. Okay. Yeah. For like a, the reds are generally more in line with opioids. Like there's right. some more sedating. And, uh, but the red Valley one, I didn't really find too sed- sedative in nature. It, it did. It gave a bit of anxiety, some relief. Um, honestly, the strains were really hit or miss. And then you got to think of how honest are these vendors mm. with labeling the strains. Yeah. And I've talked to some who are like, I hate to break it to you, man, but there's really only like four or five strains that exist. Right. And everyone's just labeling them different things just from a marketing standpoint. But you're just getting different maybe mixes of these exactly. four or five. And that's it. That's what. Yeah. A lot of it is just mixing them. Like I know so some it's people all who psychosomatic where you, you think that you're, you should get an effect. So you get it. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I know some people who swear by it for productivity and then some individuals who think it's, uh, you know, too addictive to be using. And some think it's like a poor choice for its. uh you know, interaction neurochemically and whatnot, but combining it with other drugs was interesting. Oh yeah, I would get good effects. Say phenylprazetam combined with kratom. Oh yeah, I definitely. Used that in a while. Have you tried phenylprazetam? Yeah, a long time ago. Mm. Did you find it effective? Honestly, I don't even remember to give you a reference point. <laughs> but it was when it was when I was like really into experimenting with nootropics back in university, trying to figure out mm. all of the alternatives that can enhance cognitive function to you know be better on tests exams stuff like that i want to be clear though that i'm not recommending anyone combine these things i don't even know if it's safe to combine phenylprazetam with kratom but i found the combo would be effective for getting work done yeah okay same with modafinil and kratom i tried kratom with about everything you could imagine even alcohol and kratom terrible combo just makes you really tired have you ever tried fluorinated modafinil no i haven't yeah it's like a hyper potent version of it yeah. It's kind of it's a research chemical. It's kind of interesting. I've tried the other Adra. No, what is it? Adrafinil. It's like is... the, the pro drug, the modafinil. Yeah, I've tried that one, but there's one more. There's the one that's. Hydra. Haven't tried that one. I have it though. Someone gave it to me. But there's one more that's like very common. It's prescribed. There's modafinil. Oh, or modafinil. Yeah, or that one. I didn't like that one at all. Yeah. That one made I... me really jittery. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. Interesting. I'm surprised I would prescribe it. Here. Have you tried modafinil in all like. Yeah, I actually have a prescription for it because I have sleep apnea induced by bodybuilding, interestingly enough. I have a friend who has sleep apnea and they prescribed him modafinil. Yeah, hmm. so if you are getting to a size where your neck can sort of be like too large to, I don't know, not collapse into itself sort of, mm-hmm. or it, part of it is like your tongue too and how you breathe when you sleep. Yeah. But like my actual like mechanical position of my body determines if I have sleep apnea or not. Like if I fell asleep sitting here, I would breathe normally. If I'm lying back, my tongue sort of like falls into my throat and I get sleep apnea. So I have to use a CPAP machine, but I'm also prescribed modafinil. Do you take it? Um, Not as much as I used to, no. So you take it what, like a few times a week? Like modafinil hypothetically would be for somebody... It's kind of interesting how they'll prescribe it even if you have a CPAP because a CPAP essentially attenuates all of your problems to a point where you're you're breathing like a normal person because it's literally shoving oxygen into your body. So then you don't really need the modafinil, but they'll still prescribe you a full 200 milligrams a day if you want it, hmm. which, you know, anyway. <laughs> so, so you don't take it ever? Or Not you take it almost. Sometimes? sometimes for me only because it's, I find it less stimulating than... An amphetamine analog or oh, amphetamine. For sure, for sure. Even like basic caffeine and stimulants in a pre workout context, I find modafinil smoother, but is very potent at keeping you awake. Like, I, some people get the very, um, like mood elevation from it. Some people get very productive. For me, I literally just get awake. So yeah. that's what I use it for is when I'm trying to be awake, but without having any kind of adrenergic, like racy signal. You don't even get a little, like, I would get like the tiniest euphoric boost not anywhere close to amphetamine but i would feel like a little uplifted but it's very slight yeah you get nothing if i could quantify it i would definitely say they're slight yeah yeah but it's definitely nowhere close to no them. it's not like amphetamine. Yeah. but is it a lot of people see it as like the limitless drug and you know the, they haven't tried amphetamine <laughs> it's been hyped up a lot and it's definitely not a justified hyping up in no, my it's opinion not like that but it's also dose dependent maybe you needed a higher dose 
I've tried then upwards. You get side effects. I've tried upwards of like 500 milligrams, Holy fuck. which is way too much. But that yeah. was that's like some days where I was so sleep deprived and I needed it. And I also I did really dumb shit when I was younger. Like I I take Fenibut and I take too much, so I'd end up having to use modafinil to counter How it. Which is too much, like two to three grams. Ooh, yeah. I tried 1.8 or two ones. And I actually experienced like overdose symptoms. I know a guy who totaled his car while driving because he fell asleep on Fenibut. Fenibut, is it still really popular? I did a video, eh? I've got one Fenibut versus Xanax. It's, well, l- justifiably the FDA cracked down on it because it's not Deshea compliant, which is like how you deem if a dietary supplement is actually just a synthetic chemical made in a lab mm-hmm. versus derived from nature. And it's obviously a synthetic chemical in a lab and it's actually a prescription drug in a lot of countries or maybe... With Russia well, it's or similar something? to GHB and its mechanism of action. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this shit is actually very potent. It's and like it sh- GHB light. Yeah, and it should not be a supplement necessarily. We're turning people onto it by yeah. the way, by saying that like GHB <laughs> light, it's legal. Yeah. <laughs> so the FDA cracked down. So not very many like normal supplement companies don't sell it anymore. It used to actually be in like normal like straight edge company sleep aids. Huh. Which is so irresponsible, telling you to take a sleep aid with Fenibut every day. Brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Like maybe like once or twice a week max, but you know not. The withdrawals are brutal. horrible. Yeah. Like I had a guy that I did videos with and he didn't tell me mm. when we did the videos that he was addicted to Fenibut. And then after he was having these really nasty effects, like we did a, like compound videos, like yeah. he tries this. And then he was like, well, I might be having some real negative effects because I'm four days off my Fenibut and I was taking it multiple times a day. And I'm like, seriously, dude, you should have told me that. Yeah. Like he was so depressed. Yeah. It's, it's very. Uh, much more volatile compound than people realize because they think you can buy it off the internet it's the or legal status man as yeah. soon as you make something legally available yeah. people instantly they have this weird thing that goes yeah. on with like <laughs> it's legal so it's safe yeah versus there's so many illegal drugs that are safer than prescription drugs the whole world is twisted backwards one thing bef- there's a very relevant tangent about supplement industry where they will often find the most obscure stimulant that was like abandoned in a pharmaceutical pipeline and resurrect it as like a Frankenstein (laughs) compound simply because it's not banned, even if it's far inferior to a pharmaceutical agent, simply because it's not banned and it's like still legal, right? Yeah. So you can get an effect even if it's super dirty and then people automatically would rather prefer that over an amphetamine analog that is like traditionally used simply because it's, oh, it's available you know, in this supplement. So it's probably fine. Wow. When oftentimes they're like far inferior to something that's traditionally seen as like sketchy because it's a pharmaceutical. So that's, right. that's something I see all the time. But the Fenibut. Like what? What's, what's an example of one? Um, okay. There's this one compound called, um, what was it? There was, um, there was one compound called 1,3-DMAA, 1,3-dimethylamine, I believe. And that is like a very hyper-aggressive stimulant that ha- hits way harder than or as for me it hits harder than adderall it feels wow. like you want to like run through a wall when you use it and do you sweat like you uh i don't i don't even think like does your heart beat really, oh, really yeah. fast okay. yeah it makes you feel like it's like the most hyper aggressive version of a stimulant that is like leveraged towards just hardcore adrenaline hmm. so there's like you know dextro rotation of like amphetamine which is like sort of like it's kind of racy a little bit, but it's more smooth. And then like think about the total adrenaline ridden side of that would be this DMAA stuff. It makes you want to literally you're sitting there taking your pre-workout and it's like, I want to run through that wall. Like you make, you get so aggressive on the weights. So Derek's just staring at a wall yeah. just imagining himself <laughs> busting through yeah. like the Hulk. Is that it? Yeah. Like you literally feel like. It makes working out so much more enjoyable because you're so aggressive on the weights and you're like euphoria through the roof. Wow. But it's so acutely de- like centered that you when you come off, you crash super hard and mm-hmm. it's uh, your tolerance builds up extremely quick. And that's just one example of like a resurrected compound that isn't necessarily superior to a like time and time again studied like amphetamine, but was like heavily abused in pre-workouts to the point where you know, people would be going to the hospital with like, you know, Shit. arrhythmias or like, you know, a crazy heart rate or whatever. So there, but on that whole train, is there analog or amphetamine analogs that are still in pre workouts? Depends how illegal the company wants to be because some of them are. Do you have any in yours? No. 
We have PEA analogs that are still straight edge, but are very like smooth and not racy. Okay. But there's no like straight up like this is like a actual amphetamine purely necessarily. I see. So like I know there's a lot of overlap with that compound class, but it's like in general, the stuff we use is more like straight edge stuff that we don't think is going to get banned basically. So, but there are companies that are smaller and more obscure that are willing to take risks because huh. they are much less likely to receive oversight and get targeted. So they'll put in like a mega dose of like DMA, for example, and just like put, make you like, you think it's better because you've never had this feeling before. The first time you have an amphetamine, it's like, holy fucking shit. Yeah. So this stuff is like really, really, um, you know, especially the young teens and like the young guys who like really like stimulants. Have you, uh, tried any of the stimulant class of drugs beyond amphetamines like mdma no actually mdma <laughs> no yeah why not i don't know i guess i always classified it as a party drug probably party yeah drug. it can be but it doesn't yeah. have to be yeah so for me like it's definitely i don't know like i always it you would think i'd have researched that more thoroughly because it's not like i don't already look at receptor interaction how to optimize things or how to you know do i don't know just you would think i'd have looked at it more thoroughly but i haven't like mdma yeah. i have no fucking clue no clue yeah geez that would be one to look into yeah just because um i mean i'm not advising anybody does or doesn't do mdma but there's something to be said about feeling that level of love and acceptance for yourself yeah. even if it's just once in your life like you reach this point where you feel like everything how it is right now and psychedelics can do this too but mdma does it efficiently and effectively like in a congruent way like you can almost map it like every time you take mdma you're gonna feel this level of just absolute joy and love just how you are and you can come out of that with something called an afterglow where you just you feel great it's it's a cool drug doesn't it kill your dick in terms of trying to have sex on it sometimes or it makes sex phenomenal that's the thing i've heard it's kind of like paradoxical in that it enhances sex but also makes it way harder to keep an erection if you're with someone you trust you're good it, okay. it makes it harder to have one night stands for sure. Right. Some guys, yeah. But if you're with someone that like you know is good, willing to take the time, yeah, to get you to that, to get you hard, basically, yeah. then it's good. Okay. Good to know. That's an interesting one though. If you do that with someone you care about, be prepared to be sharing a lot. It's almost like a truth serum. Like you just sit there and you you share and share and share, almost to the point where you want to be careful with it because you can regret how much you've mm. spoken the next day. Yeah, but you talk about amphetamines, and I'm like, MDMA is obviously a mixture of amphetamine and psychedelic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a little surprised. I thought you would have tried that one. No, yeah, you'd think. Yeah. I, I didn't even consider the fact that a lot of those are like a hybrid of the two, though. To be honest. Oh yeah, you get a pretty good energy boost on on MDMA. It feels great to walk. We, I used to be addicted to MDMA. That's one of my past addictions, and I would take it with some friends, and we would just walk. Like, you want to talk about burning some fucking calories? <laughs> like, shit. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, maybe uh, the microdose LSD and then perhaps that would be uh, definitely first things to look into for Those me. Those are pretty... What's the word I'm looking for? Newbie 101. Yeah, yeah, those friendly. are like newbie drugs. Yeah. It's a pretty novice way to like jump into it. Like you're not you're not really committed to anything too severe. Yeah. Um, obviously, research the MDMA because there are side effects. Yeah. And you can have a come down, which may not be worth it from a business standpoint because you don't want to be feeling like shit for a week. So if oh, you shit, a are going to, maybe, maybe. So usually it's a couple days, but it depends. Wow. So if you are going to do it, be really careful with the dose. Okay. And just don't redose. People make the mistake of redosing, and usually it's the because you feel so good in that state, and it's very short acting. So you want to keep it going. So you'll take like a common redose would be half of your first dose. Right. So if you did one fifty, you'd redose at like seventy five. But usually when you redose, that heightens your chance of having a debilitating come down. So if you just if you can be cut like you know steadfast, take it once, then you're pretty much good. Drink water. Good to know. Research that. Watch some of your videos. Watch some of my videos. Take some, do a candy flip, take MDMA and acid at the same time. <laughs> okay. Um, man, some of these questions are fucking dumb. I'm trying to scroll through some of the ridiculousness. Um, like some people are asking me straight up questions about steroids and it's like totally irrelevant to this podcast. Of course they are. Um, no questions, but what a killer combo for a podcast. Thanks, bro. Um, Who would have thought we had so much in common? Yeah. <laughs> Pick up stuff? Jeez. Um, let's see. 
we talked about micro dosing already for pre-workout um this guy's asking about nitric oxide combined with psychedelics i feel like no you have no experience yet i've never tried nitric oxide oxide yeah yeah. um shrooms improving physical performance we already talked about some of that um teenage brains and the possible damage from popular popular recreational drugs long term i think you've talked about this i've heard you talk about this in a video before yeah i'm thinking more of like so mine's from the PED side. If you're like stunting certain processes, which mm-hmm. you theoretically could, I've never talked about it from like a psycho, like a psychedelic context. Like I can definitely say rec drugs in a performance. By the way, actually, I have a much better tangent than this question, which is why have you not experimented with performance enhancing drugs up to this point? You are a natural individual still. And like we talked about the TRT briefly and whatnot, Mm -hmm. but like, have you never been compelled to push the envelope a bit, take a little something, something considering your, is it just health concerns or my other concern is my heart. I have a really strong heart. Like my resting heart rate is like 40 to 45. Okay. And I don't want to fuck with that. Like it feels good having a strong heart. But then you have stimulants, and that's arguably more cardiotoxic. Oh, than... for sure, I think it is more <laughs> cardiotoxic. <laughs> but that was when I was on the unhealthy train, right? And now I'm now I'm on this health. Oh, health thing. so you're like avoiding both. Then. And when I was doing the amphetamines, I wasn't working out. Yeah. So I didn't really care. So to answer the question, when I was younger and I got into working out, yeah, I think I trained from 15 to like 17 and then i got really depressed for a while i stopped and then from like 20 to 23 i worked out and then i just kind of tried to maintenance for 10 years almost okay what i gained from being younger and obviously i just slowly deteriorated more and more and then as i got older i started gaining fat like there's youtube videos of me early on with my shirt off and you can see like like i'm fat Mm -hmm. so i went from being fat and then I remember, I'm going to get to the, the answer, but I got to go on this little tangent first. I remember looking in the mirror on an acid trip and I was like, I was flexing. I was like, my arms look so puny. I've got this belly. I was like, I never imagined I would look like this. I thought I was going to keep the physically fit body right. forever. Like, you know, as long as I could. Yeah. Like, I imagined that I would just slowly improve. Like, I thought by the time, hey, I'm 30 something, I'm going to be like, improved on when i was 20 because obviously i'm going to keep gaining muscle right i'm going to be getting better Mm -hmm. so when i realized just how much i let myself go i made the switch so thank you acid for showing me how hideous i was (laughs) (laughs) Um, but then i did it maybe recently i've gotten curious yeah but it it's been so long of not being curious because i wasn't training right so now that i've been training recently i have gotten a little curious because I've seen when I tried to do the cut, I saw not only how hard it was to cut the weight, but I lost a lot of muscle when I cut. Right. And then I, I knew that if you take the steroids, you can cut and keep keep the muscle. Mm-hmm. But really, it's just out of fear of side effects and not wanting to crash my T levels. Ah, gotcha. So the decision not to has been mainly fear based and uh ignorance based because i just never really researched it to know enough like the fear of what could happen stopped me from taking the next step to researching because i was just like it just sounds like too much of a risk are you planning well i guess it's impossible to say for certain but are you do you know for by chance if you're not going to have any more children ever again or is that something to be determined still i don't think i'll have any more kids okay because that would be Obviously, a reason that would make it easier to justify something like a testosterone replacement therapy. Makes it harder to have kids? Well, you can't. You can maintain fertility on it, but it can definitely reduce sperm counts, motility, morphology to a Mm. point where you need to add ancillary drugs alongside it to aid in your fertility, and it can be a bit more problematic. Do you think it's worth taking from just a wanting to get better at business standpoint? Um... Off the record, even though we're on the record, yeah. <laughs> Depending on how low you are, though, because again, I'm pretty low, man. If you were, let's just say, if I saw your blood work and you were like the top end of the reference range, no, I mean, I'm pretty low in terms of motivation at the moment, right? So I can say though, like even guys on TRT who are manually manipulating their hormone profile, I still see lazy fuckers. I see guys not doing their work. I see guys not getting their stuff done. It does a lot come down to like how much. You want it at the end of the day, too. It just yeah. enhances your current state. I'm not lazy. I'm yeah. going, going, going all day. So it would definitely... I mean, I'm maybe, I'm, I think I'm just used up. I get with kids and stuff, and they're home all the time. I get drained. One thing that often goes overlooked with TRT, too, that I should mention is the fact that your libido goes much higher 
So that in itself, despite the fact that you have more energy and more mm -hmm. oomph to do stuff, if you yeah. direct that into fucking, you can end up losing energy because you are literally getting drained so many times a day that then when you try and work, not only have you spent hours either jerking off or having sex, but in addition, like that in itself can totally offset the benefit you get from test if you're doing it like three yeah, times more often. You got all that prolactin going on. Yeah, and exactly. Shit. Yeah. Mm. So you can imagine how lethargic and lazy you get if you were busting a nut like three times Dude, a when day. When I was taking the amphetamines all the time, I was busting many nuts a day. Yeah. And I, it totally offset the productivity exactly. the amphetamines would have given. Yeah. So, so I know what that's like. Yeah. So that's something to definitely uh, at least consider is that there's a very realistic expectation that your libido will be much higher on it oh, i see so so yeah i would want to take some blood work i have been curious for a while just what my levels are because i've looked at symptoms of low t mm -hmm. and i have some of those symptoms and it's like do you I wake up know. with morning wood still when i'm not cutting i do okay yeah if well, i'm cutting, that's like relatively normal though to expect that your t levels will go down when you're depriving yourself like of... even right now i'm not super cut but yeah. i i did lower my calories i think i'm at like two thousand a day i fluctuate between 1900 to 2000 calories a day like i write everything down in a book okay so all of my meals are written down i used to do all the macros until i realized that was bullshit so i just write calories and protein mm -hmm. and um some days i hit 1800 but i might be cheating on those days and not counting something i think realistically it's 19 to 2000 is that low do you think um like in general i would say yeah for your weight it's not like obscenely low but i would imagine a maintenance for you that would be considered like I don't I'm know. also running every day. Wow. So yeah, that little of that little of calories to me is kind of surprising. Like I honest. run anywhere from five to ten k a day. How many steps do you get in in total? Like during that, I don't even know what that would. I don't know. I don't to. count steps. You just okay. I just count kilometers. Um, and how often do you lift? Mm, four or five times a week. Huh. Yeah, I don't know, man. Like I think that food is a bit. A bit low, personally. It's a bit low? Yeah. Like, yeah. I would plug... I don't know if you've ever heard of... You've heard of My Fitness Pal, I'm assuming? It's like yeah. a, a macro counting thing. Mm -hmm. There's another app called Chronometer. That is like a superior version of the app, but it not only counts your macros and calories, but it counts your micronutrient intake. And what a lot of people don't realize is how much things like zinc, things like your B vitamins play yeah, into I, your... Yeah, I take all that. Separately, not in food always, but... Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're absorbing it all, too. Mm -hmm. So plugging just even plugging your diet into the app to see what your breakdown is and if you're deficient in anything yeah can be helpful to figure out okay maybe this would be you know beneficial for helping my hormone production like there's certain things to track that sometimes go overlooked like basically like a lot of times people fall into the trap when they do the cutting model that they do diet choices that are very satiating yeah. but are less actual like food it's shit that's like artificial sugar stuff that tastes good but is low calorie mm -hmm. but at the end of the day is lacking like fat needed for hormone I production do, i eat a lot of fish i don't eat meat i just eat fish really like we're vegan beyond fish okay. and eggs so i think i get a lot of healthy fats because i'm eating salmon almost every day bioavailable b vitamins i'd be interested of like i'm a, like you use a multivitamin to offset that mm -hmm. or something yeah i use a multivitamin but i could probably benefit from some actual b vitamins yeah at the end of the day though the calorie intake is largely what's going to be dictating to your so yeah this all came about with me saying i don't i, go, I don't get morning so on this calorie dose i'm not getting common morning wood mm. but if i up it to just 2200 like just 200 more yeah the morning wood is back it's weird how such a small bump makes such a big difference yeah yeah it gets to the point where guys competing in natural bodybuilding shows they're literally walking around with like 80 year old man test levels Shit. while they're trying to cut but what's weird too is at 2200 i can't cut yeah that's the problem why because you're, you're so low your body wants to maintain a healthy level of fat that's man. not starving so yeah. that's where the kind of uh it's not hard to do 2000 a day like i'm not struggling with yeah. it yeah Food tastes amazing at this level, though, because, you know, when That's, you're yeah. when you're deprived, everything tastes good. Yeah. And I actually have found a way to make my brain like being at this point, mm. because why would you not enjoy food tasting fucking amazing? Yeah. So I, people always complain about it being so hard to cut. And um, I don't know. It, I, I get why it's hard because I went down to 1400, which was crazy. Yeah. But at 2000 and food still tastes awesome. I don't know. It's kind of fun. Honestly, it's kind of fun. Don't you? find that a benefit if there's a sweet spot between like yeah when i'm bulking i get to a point where i hate food because yeah. it's like you're eating so much and you just like don't look forward to eating and then if you're cutting 
you're disproportionately hungry to a point where you're not even barely satiated after your meal and you're perpetually hungry. The hybrid in the middle is like you get hungry, you eat, you're satiated after until your next meal, and it's like a perfect balance. Yeah. But in general, most people cannot maintain their like ideal body composition at that like amount is the only. Mm. But again, it's not like to the average person, your physique is already like good enough. Yeah. Like, they see visible abs and filling out a shirt and they're like, what are you complaining about? I'm not complaining. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> I, I'm complaining not about the physique as much as the, maybe the energy aspect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so definitely something to uh, the blood work baseline. Like I'd be so happy the morning, to, what is a good is That's a good, a good sign for that things are functioning correctly. But it would, so it would say that I'm not eating enough then if I'm not getting it. I Yeah, Okay. personally. But what if, here's a question. What if I ate more, but then I upped the cardio? Is it going to offset it? Is it going to make a difference? That... To be honest, it seems like you have such quick feedback from your dick that I'd probably, you'd do it, and then you tell me. <laughs> so I don't know, dude. I can't predict for sure, but it sounds like that might be a, be interesting to a, see. a reasonable you know, experiment. Yeah, that would be a fun experiment. Yeah. So I would definitely try that. But def- yeah, the blood work for sure, dude, because it gives you a lot more uh, real-life feedback, and it's like, okay, this is factually what's going on. I hate needles, but I'll do it. I'll suck it up. You hate needles? I hate needles, yeah. Wow, that's interesting for like a drug experimenting guy. I don't inject the drugs. I don't know. Yeah, I guess everything is pretty much oral that you use, right? Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. sublingually. Or with the ketamine video, I snorted it, and I complained like a little bitch about that. I hated it. Yeah. My nose, I think, is still a little plugged from that. Have you boofed anything to skip first I tried pass? tried boofing uh, 2CB. That really? That was intense. That was really intense. So that's the <laughs> aggressive, like, hybrid stimulant euphoric compound? People say it's a cross between MDMA and LSD. Okay. I don't think it feels anything like that, but that's what people say. Okay, that's a good tangent because I actually had that on my list, 2CB. So why? what's the benefit of boofing it? Is it poor bioavailability orally? Or oh, no, it's just for it to come on like a motherfucker. Oh, like so just, just get like a cute, like right aggressive do- like effects. Yeah, I went from like baseline to having psychedelic visuals where everything's starting to like get patterns emerging and everything's bulging and breathing mm. within like three minutes. It was like I did it. And then, like, I felt like I had to shit because I had to hold it in my ass. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, three minutes later, I was like, oh, my God, what did I just do? Oh. That was too much. Something that is, uh, was that, is that like a, like, you just thought of that yourself or that's like a practice that people. I read about people doing it. Yeah. Um, I was, what I was doing was I was looking for a way to circumvent the nausea. Like two CB ah. always for me would give me, it doesn't anymore, interestingly enough, but back when I did this experiment, it would cause this nausea and this like mucus buildup in my throat right. where I would always freak out during the, exper- the experiment because I would feel like I couldn't, um, I would feel like my airways were getting clogged because right. it was just constant like, you know, when you get that mucus buildup and because I was already tripping and then I'd exaggerate the feeling, I would always freak out. And I was like, I really wanted to experience the drugs effects without the mucus. Yeah, it kind of ruins it. If you, it did. Yeah. It ruined it. So I thought if I boof it. Then people reported it had less nausea. Hmm. And um, I don't know about that. It still made me nauseous. Yeah, there's some interesting things I've learned through the bodybuilding pharmacology, but I'm sure has some overlap with the psychedelics where if you don't take something orally, like not only do you potentially avoid GI distress, but you skip first pass metabolism. So oh, yeah, that's effective. Some, yeah, sometimes the metabolites though for certain drugs in bodybuilding are responsible for the pharmacologic effects you're oh. seeking so you end up with like a disproportionate amount of parent compound relative to these metabolites that are doing something else and it's just interesting because you can totally change what a drug does just based on shoving up your ass versus putting it in your mouth versus injecting it versus yeah, whatever most people know this about weed when you actually eat weed um, there's a metabolite cause. Do you know what causes the change? I forget what it is. Is it the liver? Yeah. That causes the change. And it's, it creates a drug that you don't get when you smoke it, which has an actual more psychedelic effect. Yeah. And that plays into why eating weed is more psychedelic. So it's yeah, interesting. Crazy. It changes the drug's effects completely sometimes. Well, yeah. not completely, but you know. It's weird how your liver detoxing something can make it more pharmacologically <laughs> active. Have you boofed anything? No, but I've Nothing? definitely, I've can cons- anything that I've tried to skip first pass with, I've either injected or sublingually administered. I was going to say that, like, you seem to know a lot about this boofing concept. I was wondering, <laughs> yeah. is it the same sublingually? Isn't it very you're, similar? Um, Okay. Well, sublingual, you're getting trace amount swallowed still. Cause like most people are same actually with snorting too. Yeah. Nasal administration obviously is a good way too. If you're okay with that. I, I hate it. 
Yeah. But like I mean, I, you're swallowing some too, because it goes all the way through. Right. Yeah. So like injecting or topical administration are both effective and then boofing as well would do that. But yeah, sublingual can be effective, but it also depends on like the preparation of the solution and like what you are, the molecular weight, I imagine of the drug too. I've tried a lot of drugs sublingually, like where I actually just took the crystal and would just like rub the crystal under my tongue. Yeah. And it definitely changed the effects. Yeah. Even fennel, I tried fennel prazotam that way. It made it way more effective. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them it's like, it definitely through the mucosal membrane, it's like, way fucking different it's my preferred way of taking something actually because it it comes on i find faster and with less gi like distress in addition to that if you're trying to get like a disproportionately aggressive effect for example in the gym some people will sublingually administer androgens to get like even more aggression out of a steroid because it's like Hmm. the plasma concentration through sublingual administration is like And then like crashes down and it's in and out of your system very quick, very quickly wow. versus you orally administer and it goes through this entire metabolism process. Like you're not totally skipping the liver detoxing or anything, but you're skipping, you know, the first GI pass, the first pass of the liver, et cetera, yeah. to a point where you're not getting as many metabolites. It's in and out of your system quicker. You get a disproportionate serum ex- like spike and you get more aggressive effects out of it. And you might want to avoid some of these metabolites if they are, you know, inherently toxic or whatever. Can you do that with stuff like Anivar? Do yeah. Do it? Okay. Yeah. So like Anadrol is like one that people sublingually administer. Um, Anavar, I, I would imagine you could, but I would have to look at if there's any point of doing it based on like the downstream metabolites like Anadrol. Like most of the time, the sublingual and performance sensing drugs is to avoid detection is oh, what a okay. lot of people are doing. But then in addition, if you're trying to change like the pharmacology of it you can get a disproportionate amount of like parent in the serum versus like metabolite just by skipping that. You know what I mean? And it's like a totally different drug when it's administered in that fashion at that point. Mm. Cause a lot of people, they think, Oh, this is what this drug does. It's like, no, that's what the metabolites of that drug do. Not the actual drug. I see. Yeah. So I imagine it has a lot of overlap with the uh, psychedelics too, for sure. Yeah. In, in the effects range, it changes the effects. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else did we have on here? That definitely so the 2cb thing is that why are you so, so interested in 2cb it's honestly not nearly anywhere near lsd <laughs> i'm not i just have it on my questions list oh. <laughs> and it was a suggestion so. i see yeah so L- lsd is a superior choice for me personally is what you're saying i think for most people depending on what you're after lsd has more of a chance to to give you a beneficial effect long term mm. Okay. 2CB can be seen more as like a surface level experience. Like you don't, you don't really go too deep to really explore. You can, again, this is also subjective. I can't make a definitive statement that you don't go too deep, but in general, most people don't get as much out of the experience. They don't get as much personal growth. Right. It's, that's why I would say it's more of a beginner compound because um, it, it doesn't really force you to explore consciousness in the same way. It's more controllable. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but, but, but let's see a lot of stuff about weed and working out. Um, I've got no experience with that. I've never been a big weed guy. Let's see. People asking me about gynecomastia, totally irrelevant. <laughs> uh, that was another fear that oh, I had yeah. of taking stuff is the gyno for sure. Yeah, it's definitely a realistic fear. Even with just TRT? <sighs> Not in general. It's pretty, you'd have to be pretty genetically like predisposed you have never had any puffy yeah then i highly doubt that would happen Mm. yeah it'd be very unlikely so it's just the other compounds that cause it more so um like you could definitely get it from using too much test right it's just the amount you'd be using for trt it would be highly unlikely that it would be problematic in that regard unless Mm. you were like had existing pubertal gyno that you exacerbate with trt and yeah um Man, a lot of questions about working out, downsides of psychedelics. Talked about that, I think, pretty elaborately. I can ask you some questions. Yeah, but you have some. Yeah, I can I can come up with some. Sure, think of some while I'm scrolling through, and I'll, uh, whoever comes up with a good one first. Uh, da, da, Which is da, da, da. better, hero dose of mushrooms or micro dose? You can't say. It depends on what you're after. Yeah, I feel like that would be a goal-oriented question. It would be. What would be your goals of taking a psychedelic if you were to try one? Productivity enhancement literally is the primary goal. I do even not from a full dose or just from a micro dose. Well, that's the thing is like I don't even know if I'd want to do the experience of like a full dose. Like I'm thinking, <laughs> how can this assist my current 
regimen, which right. is like, how do I interplay into my current life, which would be enhancing some sort of element of being locked in and dialed in on what I'm doing or enjoying what I'm doing more, getting distracted less, um, killing hunger, I guess would be a huge upside too, if it could do that. Cause the longer I stay fasted, the more mental sharp I am. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better than some of the current agents that you have at your disposal, but it might just give you something new to play with. Yeah. And if there's a day I can avoid, like, for example, the more days you use stimulants in a row, obviously not necessarily good for, you know, long term. Like, it would be good to have rotation potential of things that are not yeah. stimulant backboned or whatever. Yeah, for sure. That's in yeah. the microdose field. But for, like, uh, an actual having, like, a you know, a, a real dose. Yeah. Um, what would you be looking for? Really just the same thing, right? <sighs> Nothing, though. That's Nothing. The, so, then like, it's I would not be, for you. I guess, yeah. Like, to me, I'm... It's it sounds dumb, but I see like no upside personally. Like maybe I might have a different perspective on things, but it's like I'm pretty fucking happy with the way things are going. I imagine if I experience some critical shift in my progression, maybe I'll be like, oh, like I need to explore some <laughs> other or I stop being getting rewarded from, you know, what I'm doing. I don't know. Like, I think the fact that I found my lane and I'm actually passionate about my lane. Yeah, it's hard to like even think about deviating in any aspect or trying to perceive it in a better way because i'm like quite happy with how it's going mm -hmm. and it's not just like from a financial standpoint or anything i literally am like very rewarded from what i'm trying to pursue yeah it makes sense you yeah. don't want to mess with that yeah like it doesn't seem like other than something that could enhance my desire to continue down that path like further like maybe but i mean like i'd be good for bonding with another person okay that would be good then that would be something i actually have intranasal oxytocin in my fridge that i've considered <laughs> using but I have not really looked at practically how to use it. Where do you get that? I want some of that. My compounding pharmacy I use. Oh, can you get me some? I want to try that. Yeah, maybe. We'll talk about it. <laughs> so, but yeah, that, for example, as far as like the bonding thing, yeah. is something I'm very interested in. And I haven't really... It's one of those things where I was like, it's not like I even know how to use it yet, but I'm like, this is a good idea. I'll just like keep this in the fridge here. <laughs> so at some point, I'll probably do something like that. But yeah, that is actually a good tangent that... You mentioned earlier the um, MDMA is good yeah. for that. Pending, I stay hard. And then the... Even just on an emotional level, like sexually, emotionally, MDMA is it's a fantastic bonding agent. Okay. But people sometimes, they, there's, a, there's a dark side, obviously, to all of this. I don't want to make it sound like I'm a proponent of mm. taking it. You want to already be in a healthy place before yeah. you try anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Have you ever heard of somebody's relationship getting ruined taking it? And oh, like... yeah, of course. Like saying, like, like what, saying what would I happen? Cheated on you. <laughs> okay, so if you have like an underlying secret of something you did, then don't do it. But if you have nothing to hide necessarily, or just, or just maybe tell them, like you don't, you're not going to say something you don't like about them. Maybe like if you, you might really, so you'd be you like, might. you look like shit. Like fill in the blank. It probably like, won't be like related to their visage. <laughs> like, okay, I'm gonna... just like thinking of like how much of a dick I'm going to become when I do it. You won't become a dick. Okay. You're going to become, you become very compassionate. You get very huggy. They okay. call it the love drug, not the sex drug. And you, you generally just want to cuddle and you want to share deep insights about who you are. You want to share things that are very personal, but more so you want to learn about them. Mm. So it makes it so like you actually want to know them at a deeper level and and then they want to share with you on a deeper level so you have this exchange going on where you kind of get to go to places that you might not be comfortable going uh sober and even if you are comfortable going there sober it just it's got a little interesting kind of spin to things it's definitely something that is neat to explore as long as you don't rely on it huh because that's like for me again from the paranoid perspective i think of the entrepreneur who fucks up their ego and becomes less focused on achieving success from psychedelic trips yeah but then i'm also thinking now in a relationship aspect if your relationship is exceptional already and then you do this mdma is there more of a there's always a risk a downside relative to the plus if it's already like i think there's more of a pot there's a more possibility for the plus okay there's more chance that you're going to have positive and a positive outcome than a negative one hmm. in a relationship sense obviously you both have to do it like yeah. you can't just be one of you doing it yeah that would be bad this drugged out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. you just be Noted. annoying at that part yeah. <laughs> i've been there i've been the one on mdma and oh just really like go to bed adam like leave me alone oh my god <laughs> yeah i can't imagine that um but yeah that actually sounds like a realistic ac application because i do i have looked at the oxytocin for that 
Well, what MDMA does, one of its effects, is it actually raises the amount of oxytocin in your brain. So huh. it does that. That's largely this is why people bond it into your fucking brain. The yeah, literal, I get that. So I wonder if it's similar and. In- it's probably better because you're getting a massive dump of serotonin, dopamine, yeah. norepinephrine, and oxytocin. Like it's the combination of all those chemicals that causes that unique effect. But it's funny that you're so sold on psychedelics, deviating you from your path of success. When like I gave you the biggest example of Mr. Steve Jobs, who had yeah. helped him with his success, sure. and then you want to go more. Then there's the person who invented or discovered the DNA helix. You want to argue his wife did it, Francis Crick, and he said that if it wasn't for Ellis, like he actually discovered it well on an acid trip yeah so there's been these are just the two most commonly talked about ones if i really think about it i could come up with more you had a good a lot uh, of instances at one of your videos i was watching um before this you had like a good like testimonial conclusion i think it was either after a podcast or perhaps your newbie introduction to psychedelics i don't remember which but you had like discoveries made and quotes by that person as to what it contributed to their Mm -hmm. you know novel finding yeah yeah and there was like quite a few so i definitely can acknowledge there is you're uh, you're looking at connor murphy and you're getting yeah, scared yeah probably. here's a lunatic like yeah. the dude he's behaving like a lunatic yeah and even before so it's not like he was the kind of person that you aspired to be i don't think no yeah so you can't really look at him as an example of uh why you should or shouldn't do something i'm more of the like it might sound like i'm trying to talk you into trying it i'm more so just taken back by like you explore all these compounds but then you have this whole class that has so many benefits that you're afraid of yeah because they're really the benefits of these things when they're done responsibly in the right mindset with the right intent endless benefits like it can help you emotionally not not you just you're so like in your lane of yeah. You know, entrepreneurial like work and yeah. progress. Like I get it. That's what you're at. So you're looking at things from um, that perspective, but mainly you're coming at it from a fear base because all of your concerns are about like, how is this going to hurt me? Yeah. Instead of like, and that's probably a sign why you shouldn't do it because then you're going to do the substance if you were to do it. And then you'd come at it from that fear thought. And if you come into it from fear, you're likely to experience fear. So you want to have the intent of how is this going to help me? Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, I guess the uh, going into it with the right headspace seems like critical. It is for critical. Not Absolutely. fucking it up. Yeah. Yeah. I want to. I want to just yeah share like the right information with you. Yeah. Um, have I ever used psychedelics, Derek? No, I have not. But I don't know. No. I would honestly though be surprised if you never do. Just based off your history of like exploring, it seems like something at one point down the line you're probably yeah. gonna explore. Yeah. From like so an outsider too. looking in, it seems like that. It might just be a matter of like when. Can a pregnant woman microdosing psychedelics make their child smarter? That would be absolutely. Amazing. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> you, know, you never know, dude. Um, that's funny. Uh, let's see. Can you get performance enhancing effects? Yeah, obviously we talked about that. Um, bu- 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 similarities between the processes of making. NNDMT and home brewing gear. Oh, actually, that's impossible for either of us to answer. He's talking about home brewing steroids compared to making DMT. DMT is pretty easy to extract. There's a lot of plants that it's in. Oh, but, yeah. But I don't know about the, the gear at all. Can you yeah. make gear? You can pretty easily. I just, honestly, I don't even know how, but it's there's a lot of underground labs that have, you know, emerged really? over. Yeah, dude. Like, Shit. there's. So, like, I assume a lot of the psychedelics that are well i don't know like uh, presumably there's somebody who's acting as a chemist and like making the shit that is bought on the underground scene for psychedelics too yeah i think so yeah so it's kind of the same thing with anabolics you have some guy who's like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna make it i'm gonna provide it to people in the masses or at least as mass as i can scale my operation right right so yeah they just call them like underground labs and they're actually like branded whereas with psychedelics gotcha. I'm, I'm assuming they come in like they don't come with like a branded like label on them and shit like this is that'd brand. be cool yeah, that's what gear is. They'll have like, it'll be like this brand for every compound and they'll have like their own logo and their own mm-hmm. like actual marketing behind it, even though it's illegal as fuck, which is kind of interesting. That's weird, man. Yeah, when you actually think about it, it's kind of weird that they yeah. have like branding. It's like, what are you doing? For something that's illegal? Yeah, I yeah. guess that just goes to show that it's not really that over like regulated. No, in, in Canada, the regulation on steroids is extremely low. Isn't it legal to possess them? Yeah. So like if you get caught as a guy who's like the mastermind of an underground lab, worst case scenario, you get like 
a very minimal sentence or you don't even go to jail at all, which is interesting. So whereas in the States, it's much harsher. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of things are harsher in the States in that regard. Yeah. Um, ketamine just for horses? Question mark. I, don't, I just tried it for the first time. So oh, yeah. Yeah. It was weird. Couldn't have said. Um, p- 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 can, psychedel- can psychedelics cause you to be less motivated? I think we kind of already talked about that. Yeah. It can swing either way, really. Either way. Um, let's see. We can probably just edit out me looking for shit if yeah, we need to. <laughs> this guy's like, does he think you are stupid or unknowledgeable in any way? And if so, why? Ask for good reasoning. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of taken back right now with the quality of these questions. When you said you had viewer questions, I was expecting you to like be scrolling through some real winners here. Yeah. Like, what's up with this? No, I'm uh, a lot of the questions that are reasonable or stuff that they assume I know about your area of expertise and they assume you know about mine, ah. which is makes for questions that are unusable and then just basic shit. Like, what do you think about Connor? What do you think about this? What do you think about my gyno? It's like, bro, not really. We should touch back on the Connor situation before we wrap it up though. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I feel like we didn't completely like, we didn't really have any closure on that. We just skipped to something else. Yeah. His, uh, Video coming up for tomorrow. Let me see what he has scheduled. He has another big reveal thing. Uh, what is it? Connor Murphy. You looking at your watch keeps making me think we need to wrap up. No, I'm looking. I've got a timer on for uh, the camera. So I'm seeing how much time is left on the recording. So his video set for tomorrow at 7 a.m. is Connor Murphy's final words. Heroin R.I.P. Huh. Which... To be honest, seeing as we saw R.I.P. Connor Murphy today and he's talking about how to get his Dogecoin, like, I can't imagine he took heroin or he's going to be dead. No, I don't think so. Yeah, but this is, uh, I don't know, man. Like, I can't, he's done this so many times, it's impossible to be like, oh, like, something's actually going to happen now. So, I don't know if he's, no. Like, I, I don't even know what kind of conclusive opinions I have to even wrap up on him other than, Like, it seems like no matter who helps him, he's not really open to help as much as he may seem to put on. Because when he does get the interventions, there was actually a live one with that Kenny KO guy where he was like, I'm very worried about you. Like, promise me you won't do this shit. Fly out to Vegas and I'll take care of you and make sure you don't take this stuff. And he's like, okay, I will do that. And then doesn't do it, obviously. Yeah. And I I don't even know what to say about it because I'm I'm blanking up again when Mm. I think about it. Yeah. It's like on one hand, I I don't want to... I have I have a hard time with the situation because there's some truth to his experience. Yeah. Yeah, I can uh, I get the thing where you mentioned how he's like trying to explain to people trying to get them see it to see it the way he's seeing it and to him it makes sense and it's like frustrating that people aren't seeing it from his perspective necessarily. But when you're in that state, man, you think everyone's you think everyone besides you is like asleep. Yeah, that's like exactly he, how he behaves. Is yeah. it? Yeah. Like you, in a sense, he probably doesn't have any shame in how crazy he's being. Exactly. Because he's like, he's so, ah, oh, and everybody else is like. Yeah. So so to him, it's just, it's all one big game. Yeah. Like even when you make a rebuttal video to him, like some of my responses, he's just like, like you can see it's, he's like brushing off the opinion. Like why? Like you're so close minded. Like what the fuck? You know? Like you clearly like don't understand the higher purpose. Like fuck off, Derek. <laughs> you know, say you're in on it. You're gonna look like an idiot. Like so he literally DMs me in private. It's like, what did he say in the messages to you? Um, he said uh, I probably shouldn't play them. I guess because they're private. But basically, in general, he was like saying um he was doing his weird like Matthew McConaughey voice. And Can you recreate it for me? <laughs> Like, you don't have to like, say you're in on it. You're going to look like a fucking idiot. And then he was like, he, what does he say? In on what? In on what? I don't know. Like his like plan or whatever, or like whatever he's doing. Like he just says you're in on it as in like, you know, um, Oh, in on the, the, the game of reality, I guess. Or like every time somebody tries to talk about his psychedelic experience in a negative way, like that Kenny KO guy where he's talking about, Connor, like, are you actually okay? He, he, I don't know if he actually believes it, but he starts laughing and he says, 
like you're such a good actor, Kenny. Like you can stop now. Like it's okay. Like people know. Like this is all. Uh, um, like we know you're acting. So that's exactly what he's doing. He's he's so awake. He's seeing that everybody is just God in drag. Ramdas says this. Ramdas says when you you reach a point in your spiritual journey where you start viewing everybody as God in drag, and when someone does something that really irks you and gets you angry it's really easy to just laugh at it because they are behaving as a teacher for you because they're just god too and they're here to teach you a lesson it almost sounds like he's translating these very powerful teachings in a negative context almost where he's kind of being abrasive like he's being really it's condescending yeah 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 because like you can view what it seems he's viewing it seems he's like he's like Derek, you're in on it. Just admit that you're in on the joke. You're pretending to be a singular I when really you know that you're God. I know mm. you know, Derek, that you're God. Yeah. Just admit it. But it's condescending because on some level, he must know that when you're playing the game of reality, part of the rules of the game is you don't know you're playing. Yeah. Like if you knew you were playing, then you wouldn't be fucking playing. Yeah. Like he, that, that's what you like get. He's very cognizant that we aren't awake. And he's like the whole point of it is he's trying to make it seem like He's trying to enlighten people and teach them how to do what he's done by calling them out and saying that they're they're just they're in on the game. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's just very contradictory because then he says he says again like to start he's trying to convince people how to become enlightened like what they should do to become like him and then on the opposite side of the spectrum <laughs> everyone's in on it and they're just pretending that they're not. People should be like him, right? But, yeah, like I don't know, dude. It's uh. It's hard to have more insight personally when like it's just so off the fucking wall and I don't really know what he's everything he does essentially comes down to some it sounds like he has some grand ending that is going to be I don't know like dying and returning from the dead or something and then in reality he's talking about giving away dogecoin it's like how do I like relate this in any practical aspect the other aspect of people who are actually in that like satori state is they don't view people that are asleep as being less than them. In fact, the real way to view that from that, you know, from a spiritual standpoint is they're playing the biggest, most terrifying game of all because they're so far down on that tight rope that says, like, if I just slip up, I'm going to, like, fall and I'm going to be dead and I'm gone forever. Like, they so much so believe in the game they're playing that you have to respect them for being that far out on the tightrope. Right. That's what they would say. So so if someone's asleep, you're not like, you're less than me because you're asleep. It's more so a total reversal of that. And you're like, wow, wow, look at that guy go. He's re- He really believes it. Like, that is so fucking cool. Like, I almost How? think you'd be sympathetic to people not being enlightened. No, you're, you're not following necessarily. It's not about being sympathetic. It's about being in awe with them. Yeah. It's like looking up to them almost. Because they are actually playing. And when you're that enlightened and you realize the whole point of this is to play, it's like in being enlightened, you're actually less because you are, you know, you're choosing not to play. Do you follow Uh, what I'm saying? Yeah. So if Connor really was enlightened, he would be like, shit, how do I get unenlightened? Right. Because when you get there, it's the kind of thing people say when you become, when you reach Satori, a common quote is you reach Satori, you realize that you do not want Satori. What that means is when you reach the state of enlightenment, you realize that the point to life is to not be there. Uh, So you quickly want to forget it and you want to get back to just playing the game of separateness. Because you can't immerse yourself in the experience of the game like you could prior when you were unaware that it was like the simulation type thing. Yeah, exactly. You you follow what I'm saying. Okay. So because you see that it's a game and you're here to play. So if you're awake, how can you play? You can't. You can't play. So he's trapped in this like weird, this weird corridor where he's he's awake and he's infused his ego with it, and he thinks that the goal is is to is for everybody to be enlightened like him. But literally, what that looks like from a Satori standpoint is death. For right. everybody to be awake, it means everyone has to die. Okay. And I don't think he realizes that. No, like no. the only way to actually be awake from that from that view. This is just one perspective. I'm not saying this is truth this is gospel but they say to really be one you have to lose your individual consciousness and you only do that through death Hmm. i don't i don't think he realizes what he's saying it's gonna be interesting all his response videos to all of these clips that we come out he's gonna know how to respond to what i just said he he won't but he he will (laughs) he will dude you just wait he'll literally make a video about both of us and do like a crazy ramble with like 14 overlays of different shit (laughs) 
think uh, Greg's going to have some stuff to respond to? Oh, for sure. Yeah, what Greg. What the fuck would Greg respond to? Greg was one of the first ones to post about his uh, his first like um, suicide thing where he was like claiming he was going to kill himself. Jesus. And Greg basically just talked about mental health and stuff like that. I had no idea. Yeah, it's been a... Uh, Are you friends uh, with Greg? Yeah, yeah. Like you guys chat? Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Decent Greg's man. an interesting dude. Yeah, his uh, hardest fucking working guy ever. Like, honestly. Really? Yeah, his work ethic is what inspired me to get up to two videos a day. Like, I would have never done oh, it. Oh, wow. I well, you're inspiring me right now. Yeah, so he has like a bleed through effect. So he he set the new standard for posting frequency and um, just like how hard you can actually go. Like harder than last time. Well, <laughs> it so, sounds like such yeah. an old man thing to say. Yeah. Harder than last time. <laughs> yeah. like, it's like my grandpa would yeah. say that to me. It's like when I got to one a day, I literally thought like this is the pinnacle of posting and no, like I've heard of burnout hardcore burnout from one a day now granted that's vlogging so obviously that's but that's me. when you're editing your own stuff you can't really burn out when you're not editing your stuff how much work is it to make a video if i don't you're know vlogging it's pretty intensive I okay because you're trying to make each day exciting for the vlog versus for information it's a bit easier yeah, to not burn no, out I, I totally get that. so so anyway he like i got up to one a day and i just saw him and his posting schedule i was like this guy is pumping out a video every fucking 12 hours and I was like, I if I want this growth and I want to realize like the benefits he's getting, I need to get up to his level. And I'm like, that's you know what I strive to do at the end of 2020, and finally got there. And now it's it definitely reflects like proportionally. You think, oh, I'm gonna post more, people are gonna hate it. How much of my face can you stand? It's a fucking lot. People can stand clearly. People can stand a lot of your when face. when they like you. Yeah, but you think that's what you think. Your perspective, even before you start YouTube, is. I'm not likable. I don't have the information. Like, no one's going to, you know, listen to me. But no, like, if you are, especially in your niche, like, you're already the authority in the space. So just imagine. Which is start. crazy because I personally don't think I know very much. Like, <laughs> honestly, if you were to ask me, no bullshit. I, I, I really don't. I, I know a little bit. You have a lot of anecdotal findings through shit. And yeah. you also have some like a good foundation of knowledge of the pharmacology and the intertwinement of the two very basic foundation but some plus knowledge. the ability to communicate it in a way that's entertaining and i don't know just obviously very very uh resonates with people it's like relatable yeah it's yeah clearly like put you above everyone else so i Wild. just uh lean into it dude because you never i i don't know when the algorithm is going to change because it definitely did not used to be like this where you could just post as fucking much as you want and it would just nothing like gets killed by you posting more like you would think maybe it might mm -hmm. punish you for being like you're spamming I, i've actually thought that yeah, yeah that's what I've i thought, thought too i was like greg's videos they're gonna stop getting as many views because he's he's spamming that's like but they'll stop getting views when he stops being interesting yeah yeah uh, like I mean, I mean, like if, like if you no, post exactly. every day and yeah. your stuff isn't interesting. Oh, for sure. But if you're posting interesting things every day, then yeah, yeah. Like for me, I definitely see videos not do well if they're just not interesting. But if they're interesting, they still get the same views they would get. Well, probably well, they probably get more views than they would have got otherwise because I'm have all this other algorithm prop up from all the other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So it all pushes into each other like very, very well. To a point that a video, even that's at 100K like a week ago, ends up being at 200K a week later, even if it's normally would have died otherwise. That's pretty cool, man. Do yeah. your videos just like hit 300 and stop? Like, do you find there's like a limit to the views? It's interesting how hard they'll push up to 200 to 300 and then kind of just like stagnate. Yeah. But then oftentimes, if I'm doing well, random videos from will just pick up again yeah I've sometimes they'll stay at not no progress for like a month and then just like randomly boost like sometimes I, it's longer than a month i've seen that i had a video from 2017 which only had 5,000 views which was like a uh it was like a skit i did and it was so unrel unrelated to the kind of stuff i do now mm -hmm. and it was stuck at 5,000 views for like ever and now all of a sudden the algorithm decided to just push it to people who watch my stuff and now it's at like I don't know, 200 or something. Wow. But it's just like, yeah, even stuff that at the time didn't perform well because it wasn't good enough ends up being good enough just by your sheer frequency, which is kind of nuts. Hmm. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's uh, definitely, this is almost like a game too. Like the whole YouTube thing seems like a very 
like a simulation game kind of focused thing because it's you can like see everything as a game yeah for it's sure like, it's like the views equates to this subscriber count which equates to this much output of revenue just like with people this. saw pickup as a game right mm. they, that wasn't always thought of as a game yeah they literally called it the game in that book true so it's interesting you can turn everything into a game so we wanted to do just you know we've already talked about the connor murphy thing a bunch of times but i didn't give an accurate depiction of how intense like the mental breaks really were because we kind of talked we showed some of his like you know blabberings and long uh, weird overlay content that make no is, sense yeah but this is to give some context like i feel like I did not elucidate it well enough without actually showing his mental break deleted videos. And this is a year ago, eh? YouTube? Yeah, so he's been dealing with this for a while now. Oh, okay. So he had his first ayahuasca. We didn't even go into this depth, which I feel like we should have dove into. When did he have the ayahuasca experience? Um, so presumably it was almost a year ago today, maybe like in April is, of last year. My year-ish. question is, is that truly when started to lose his mind were there signs or symptoms prior yeah, to the like, ayahuasca uh, no like his friends even confirmed that he did the ayahuasca trip and then after that he started acting odd and trying to enlighten everybody and then subsequent to that this mental break video happened where he deleted it but in here he basically snaps and says well you can no oh, uh, shit we have to redo that i didn't hear record on the mic uh I should have like seen that nothing's There's happening. There's no internal audio on your cameras. Oh, there is. Yeah. Oh, uh, we can. That can be used. Yes, we can use that then for that part. As long as you're confident enough, it'll catch what we said. Um, it's turned really down. It'll be low quality, but it'll catch it. Okay. If people at least heard it, then we should be fine. I yeah, think. Yeah, they'll hear it. Okay. Well, that's fine then. So, so anyways, this is the actual video itself that happened shortly after his original ayahuasca trip and. The actual like context on the exact date, the exact like you know how he was led through the ceremony or whatever like I don't actually know any of that, but this is you know what it led to. Guys, um, just to let you know, again I've done this in the last few videos. This is just acting, okay? So YouTube keeps it up. So I want people to know. <laughs> what is happening? I'm literally mentally fucking insane over the past few days. I don't understand. I feel my mental breaking point. I used to be so happy when I was a kid. The world seemed endless. The world seemed infinite. It was like I could actually be happy. I had dreams. I had aspirations. It was amazing. And I accomplished it all. Look at my life. I fuck three fucking girls a day. Three girls a day. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard to not laugh at that part, yeah. No, 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 but hold on. One of the things I've noticed with him, in the few videos I saw, keep in mind, I I haven't seen this in great depth, but in the few that I saw... Even though he was talking about all being enlightened, he always pulled it back to sex. Yeah. He said that the point of life was to have one big orgy. So yeah, like a lot even of... Even in his enlightenment, it's about... I'm not laughing at this. I don't know if this is real or not. I'm not laughing at him being upset. I'm yeah. laughing at, like, he's always tying it back to sex. Yeah. Yeah, even in his enlightened state, a lot of it is hedonistic, even though he claims it's, like, it's, it's not about that, but it sort of is at the same time. Does he realize that if he is everyone, he's having sex with himself? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. He'd probably think he'd have a good answer. He might reply to that, actually. I imagine he will. Do you believe that? Fuck yeah, you do. Look at my YouTube channel. I'm popular. I'm famous. And this doesn't come from ego. This is... And he has a great jawline. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm unhappy. I have nothing that truly matters. <laughs> my parents have sucked away every ounce of happiness in my body. I've done everything. What? It, what? His, what did you just say? His, his parents? parents have sucked every ounce of happiness from his body. So he he elaborates on why in this video, but it's odd because literally one video before this, he was talking to his parents, trying to enlighten them and failing to enlighten them, and he was all calm with them and stuff. And now he's breaking down about like how well you can see for yourself, but basically he's achieved this big 
famous. But why is he tying it back to his parents? I don't know. Especially if it's an acting thing, you would not be like shitting on your parents on a video for an acting reel, I would imagine. I mean, like everybody blames their parents at some point in their life for something. It's it's very well documented yeah. and it's talked about by a lot of psychologists. But I just I thought that was strange that he says he's talking about being unhappy. And then the first thing he brings up is his parents have sucked it away. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the it's interesting, though, because even this in his mental break, if you've seen some of his more recent stuff like this seems tame hmm. in comparison, like this is actually like seems more raw and genuine. Whereas now his mental breaks are like actual insanity infused relative to this is like the original. I don't know. It's hard to explain. Like this seems a lot more like his his reasoning is still sort of, I don't know. He's trying to wrap his head around what happened with his ayahuasca trip, perhaps. And he came to this realization that's sort of broken his sense of what reality is. But it's a lot different than now where he's actually seems just insane to the point of beyond comprehension so i don't really know how to put it into words but it seems this is more you're what he used to be well. like i understand what you're saying yeah okay just to please them just to make them proud just to make them happy and it didn't work i started youtube so he would be proud of me so i could be successful and rich show them that i could have a fun life but they don't get it they can't understand happiness they just don't understand it I visit them five times a year. Is this a ruse to enlighten his parents? Because you said prior to this, he had tried to enlighten his parents, and now he starts off talking about his parents. Maybe this is a tactic to get his parents to hear him. Perhaps. The fact that it was posted publicly, though, and is like... But that would be how he would get his parents to hear him, because yeah. then his parents could read the comments, and they could be like, oh, this is what other people think. Maybe he's trying to manipulate his parents into enlightenment. Maybe, it's certainly possible. I yeah, I really don't know. To be I'm honest. I'm honestly just speculating. Yeah, but yeah. Five times a year, I I offer to fly them out to L.A. I do everything, for them. everything I can to make them happy. It's not just me. They fucking ruined my sister. They instilled such horrible unhappiness into her, and then her unhappiness feed it into me. They convinced her that I was the cause of her unhappiness. <laughs> they convinced her that I bullied her. <laughs> That's not where the bullying came from. I've been living with this my whole life. I just need to let go. So in the most recent update before he came back and started posting again, literally yesterday, his sister posted on social media saying how... Um, Connor's fine you know he's with people who care about him and etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I don't know if that is you know like I don't know what their family dynamic is to give an actual insightful response but this is people were messaging when he the most recent him getting put in an institution this was her he was off social media for like a week does and she not want people to see her face I don't know to be honest oh certainly is her possible. face public I don't know, to oh, be honest. Okay. I'm nearly certain she's in one of those weird private groups I'm in with Tiger Woods, too. This is a little concerning. Yeah. He is very loved, and frankly, my parents and I are very depressed solely because of a situation. She's putting blame on him? That That's a concerning statement right there. If someone's very loved, you don't, you don't, yeah, you don't say that. Yeah. Just, just he's very loved, period. Yeah. Would have been cool. Yeah. So this is literally after his most recent string of craziness and then going silent and, for and a look, week. We have done absolutely everything we can and continue to exhaust all of our energy into his situation every day. There's quite literally no reason to bully me. Like, I don't know what she's going through, so I'm not placing judgment on her. I don't know. I, I know absolutely zero about her situation. It sounds like I imagine based on this original mental break video, people are blaming her for a lot of his ah, stuff. I see. Because that's what he's literally saying right now is his, I don't know, his uh, he bullied his sister or something and his parents claim that. I don't know. Like, I assume the parents and or the sister. The is whole frame of this, though, like the, this whole the what i'm getting from this frame is like she's putting some blame back 
Yeah. Like he, like this is just a blame game at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough for me to say on like the uh, family front because I don't actually know for certain, but that's just it. Just it does not seem like her response doesn't seem healthy either. Like when someone is really sick, you don't reply with "We're exhausting our energy into helping them." Yeah. Like, what is that? Yeah. When someone's sick, you say we love them very much and we are doing our absolute best to ensure that they have the care they need. Yeah. Not we've exhausted our energy. Yeah. Like that. That is almost in in tailing that like they don't really like they're they're fed up they're done with yeah it. i feel Which like i understand i get that but like publicly to say that i don't yeah. know man I, I read between the lines when i see this stuff like i'm i'm kind of i might be reading to things that aren't there but that's what i see yeah maybe it might be almost her feeling that he's being selfish for putting them in this position or something but like he would have no control over it if he's actually having a mental break that's not like he's choosing to be this way like like it's hmm. very difficult. This is why I don't do these videos. Yeah. Because I think I'm going to piss people off with my reaction. Yeah. So obviously none, we're just speculating. We don't actually know what the fuck's going on with his family dynamic. So this is just based on this. <laughs> Nothing helps. I, I just bought them a flight, a thousand dollar flight for my family for one day on a Saturday just to visit me in Los Angeles. They've never visited me here. In context, this is one year ago, guys. So this is the original break one year ago. And after this is when all the stuff I originally summarized at the beginning of the whole he's podcast. He's making his family problems public, though. Like, I just, now he's saying, I just paid for this and they don't value me. They're like, I don't know how I feel about this as like a viewer. Like, this feels like something that I shouldn't be watching. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And this is one of the few videos he actually deleted after posting. <laughs> for three years. Three fucking years. I made YouTube videos trying, I learned about happiness. I learned about the science of happiness. I, I, I tried to learn it from every religion, from every teacher. To explain to them that it's, it's all you have to do is believe that it's possible. And then it, it builds on itself. <laughs> but they can't, they can't grasp it. It's like trying to convince someone the experience of drinking water to a man who has never drinking water in his life. You can't do it, and I've realized that now. You can't convince anyone to be happy. The mics can hear this, like, in passing in the background, right? The camera mics can. These mics are very directional. Okay. We got I mean, we got in total five mics going on. So yeah. Okay. So I make sure the editors would be able to hear what parts we're at. Yeah. <laughs> it all comes from within. <clears throat> YouTube means nothing to me without the love of my family. I made an hour and a little more video trying to convince them putting on this front this i am happy front just to try and convince them i actually convinced them of all sorts of religions of everything and they couldn't grasp it i talked to my friends i could convince them i talked to other people other people could be convinced by my parents they it's like they don't have souls it just doesn't work i give up i give i fucking give up I've stayed up all uh, for six days. I've stayed up. I haven't slept. I wrote, I wrote a seventy-page book in two days to try to explain happiness to them. And it's it's crazy, but it's yeah, I'm crazy. But I just want them to be happy. I'm trying to save their lives. I'm afraid they're gonna kill themselves. They don't realize how unhappy they are. This is the only option. The only fucking option. I know exactly how to do it. <laughs> to experience true happiness. <laughs> I figured it out.
exactly how to do it. I realize why the bathtub feels so amazing because it's trying to tell me something. It's trying to reach out and say you can be at peace here in the bathtub. You just have to go through a little pain beforehand. <laughs> Thank you. I, they're teaching me it's possible. <laughs> If anything, I just hope that this maybe this will spark something in their head, even that they they have to find happiness within, and I can't do anything. I tried. My mom says she believes in God. I fooled her into thinking I believed in God, and she still wasn't happy. Nothing makes sense. I want people to see this. I want people to know this story and spread happiness to the world because if it goes the wrong direction, <laughs> I would rather have my arms chopped off, I would rather have my penis chopped off than to feel like this. <laughs> you can imagine this type of experience. I just want my parents to be happy. <laughs> So put it in context prior to this, literally like weeks before he was publishing still normal get girls videos and stuff. Like this was a total 180, clearly was induced by whatever trip he went on. It was just like, boom, made a drastic, like earth shattering change in his mindset. And now he is here, wherever here is in terms of like this video caught, obviously people off guard at the time. Now it's like the norm for him to post stuff like this but back then it was like holy shit like everyone thought he was genuinely gonna take his life after this video and people were like checking on him and like rushing to his apartment and blah 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 hmm. mom and dad if you truly love me if you're truly sad about this just fucking stop fucking be happy <laughs> figure out how to do it. do it for morgan you horrible fucking people i love you but you're infecting the world you're making the world go into this literal hell. You made my sister try and commit suicide. Is that true? I have no idea. Hmm. So it would be impossible for me to give. I wish I had more context, but even I don't know if anyone knows the answer realistically. <laughs> When I'm although I'm sad, I'm so happy to finally to finally be happy. <laughs> you can come here to one six seven one zero Ventura Boulevard, apartment three three nine in Los Angeles, California. You can walk into my bathroom and you can witness what true happiness feels like. You can witness what it's like to actually meet God. As soon as this video is posted, give it 30 minutes and then you can come and witness it too. Maybe it'll make you happy too. It'll show you the way. Guys, remember, please remember, this is not real, it's just acting. I Am God Changed My Mind is the next <laughs> video Oops. on the list. Yeah. Why am I there? It was on like, <laughs> my related popped up. Oh. That is hilarious. So this is where we're at now with the whole, you know, him. Like, that was the intense thing. Like, I legitimately remember seeing that video last year around this time and was yeah. thinking, like, holy shit. Like, this guy's actually 
just posted this and is going to commit suicide. I don't know if it's that, like, if he's being honest, though. Well, yeah, it ultimately was not. And he ended up just leaving his house and he was walking around in uh, the beach where he lives. And they ended up finding him at some random place outside. So it was, you know, not what you would spec like what he's saying he's going to do. He did not do like, like, is he acting? I don't know, dude. That's the thing is like, it's sort of like he's half acting and half not at the same time. Yeah. Cause like part of what he said looked like acting. Yeah. Like it, it didn't look like someone having a genuine breakdown. Okay. Yeah. Like for me, I had never even witnessed something like that before. So when I saw the video the first time last year, I was like, wow, this is like scary shit. Uh. And people were obviously genuinely concerned cause he had never shown any signs of acting like that ever. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, he goes from this happy go lucky guy getting girls shirtless blah 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 to this so. yeah like just some of the things he, he was saying were still like out of left field like yeah i don't know it, it actually looked like acting to me mm. that's what i that was my instinct was this guy's kind of putting on a show but then like what are you accomplishing like obviously he's not actually thinking he's gonna get acting roles by acting clinically insane on youtube you know he's getting attention yeah but I guess, like, if you post an acting reel just for the sake of getting attention, though, I don't know. I I can't answer that question because he knows how to get attention and get views without coming across as ruining his credibility. Like, he built his whole channel off of doing that. So why would you? Yeah, need but it's a to... different kind of attention. Okay. Like now, he, maybe he's looking for sympathy. Like that's going to give him sympathetic attention versus the kind of like attention you get from showing your abs and showing that you can get girls. For, like like maybe he does want people to reach out and try to help him like it I, I think it's it's a genuine cry for help yeah but i don't i don't i don't think the whole thing was legitimate yeah or he was just setting himself up to go to the like he's even done clickbait videos that it's like i escaped the in- asylum and it's like him doing a selfie of him like running out of the building and shit like that so like a lot of this stuff is pre-planned in his head to make certain videos yeah. So I don't know what to make of it some of the time, but this is where we're at. Mental illness, my friend. Yeah. This is where we're at as of a couple of weeks ago where Kenny Kao was trying to tell him to stop microdosing. This is before he went to the most recent um, institute and then came back for what is what he's doing now. So mm. this was on his like big string like, of right, Connor, stuff. I'm, I'm being, I'm being dead he turned it down a little bit. I think I it's too loud. And I, I want to make sure you're taken care of, like, as best possible. I'm, I'm going to talk to you. Pretend like we're not recording or anything. Um, I know it's for a video, but I do want to say, like, yeah, I am, don't... just based off of what you've posted the last know. couple of days, I am worried for you. Uh-huh. I, I've, I've received, I mean, countless DMs. I can't even tell you, like, how many DMs I've received about you. Um, so this is almost a year later, exactly, as far as I know. Is he worried, though? I don't know. I don't, I don't I don't even buy him saying he's worried. I don't know. Like I don't know how close they actually are. They've made like a couple videos together, but like I don't my vibe is he's putting on an act too. Like what are we just watching actors for, uh, on actors here? Uh it's certainly possible. I don't know, but I don't actually know the relationship to say if it's legitimate or not. So Like how could you have like a real relationship with somebody who's behaving like yeah. This Connor as far is. as I know, they met too in person when he was already like this. So I don't know how you could, like you said, you know, become friends with somebody in the state sort of thing. Yeah. It almost like, like their first collaboration was responding to me calling him out about taking steroids, essentially. Jesus. And him being like, so Connor, are you a fake natty? Blah, blah, blah. So that was their first collaboration. As far as I know, I could mm. be wrong on that. But so I don't know if they're actually genuinely friends or if they just collaborate here and there. And, and he's just saying he's concerned just because he's doing a video and he thinks it's like what you got to say. I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm being too careful to be judgmental of like the personal relationship stuff because it's like, for all I know, they could be. I don't know. I mean, I want to talk to you, see what's going on, like what what's changed. If it, I, I don't know, because I, I haven't like, talked to you in depth. Is it, is it like for a social media <laughs> stunt? But like, if you really care about someone, you don't make a video about it, man. Yeah. Like, if I cared about you and yeah, you, you were freaking out, yeah. I'm not gonna be like, let's turn the camera on. Yeah. So yeah, I really care, Darren. How are you? <laughs> yeah. Is there anything I can do to help? Yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I definitely see your point. Yeah. A lot of people, there was a lot of criticism in his comment section about like, you did this literally just to post a video. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. That is uh, like, I'm careful. Is this just LA life? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Us Canadians don't understand. 
Kenny, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore, dude. I, I'm done. I'm done with the acting, bro. I'm fucking done. Kenny's acting has improved, and it's too fucking good. I can't do that. They, they have to know. They have to know you're in on it, buddy. In on what, though? Oh, he's still going to be an actor. Oh, I so can't. This is, this, is, this is what I was talking about earlier. So I have seen this video. Yeah. So I'm glad that we're showing it. But this is the one of the few that I've seen. And I was like, when he's saying you're in on it, you're in on it. I'm pretty sure he's talking about being in on the joke that life is all a game. Right. And by the way, I apologize. I'm just sitting over here farting. Like that protein bar? Yeah, it gave me oh. some mad gas. So if you smell anything, it's coming from me. Oh, okay, got it. Thanks for the heads up. No worries. <laughs> anyway, so you, the uh, yeah, you've seen this one already. Yeah, but we, I'm, it's good to react to some of it at least. Maybe not the whole thing. Yeah, but as far as like the context, you think he's saying you're in on the whole like simulation of the, of the life is a game and you're seeing from afar the people who are not aware that it's a game and you're in on it yeah that uh, i think that's what he that's what he means just in case anyone's wondering like anyone's confused like what do you what does he mean calling kenny out on acting like he's basically saying kenny you know you're god i'm god and, and you're pretending to play this role of kenny right. knock the role off and admit that you're god with me is gotcha. probably what he means yeah fuck i can't uh... wait wait so are, is this like a stunt a skit? Oh my god! I can't, Kenny, you're too good, bro. You need to go to Hollywood. Fuck. I mean, I'm hoping. I, if I if I am, I'm hoping it's a skit. <laughs> is, is it? Uh, 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 yes, it is a skit, Kenny. I'll give you that much. Because all right, so I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard from people that you've been taking ayahuasca like every couple hours. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Yes, that is true. And I trust me, Kenny Ko is definitely not taking ayahuasca every two hours either. And the government is not either. The government would never be in on it, would they? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, yes, I'm taking it every two hours. <laughs> so, I, Connor, I, I'm gonna be serious. Talk, talking to you as a friend, like social media side, like even if we weren't recording this, if I was just talking to you, like, do, do you have people to talk to? I don't know if you're currently under the Abigail, influence of psychic. Are you under the influence right now? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> there's orgy. <laughs> Kenny, there's orgies going on in, in Austin. It's Sixth Street. It's a pure orgy. So I guess, are you under the influence right now? Oh, Why was there a duh. cut there? <laughs> I just talked. About Why was there a cut? Yeah, there was a cut there. Maybe it's just his phone skipping, I would imagine, because this is Kenny's video. Okay. I don't think he would have edited I don't think he's editing anything. Okay. The cops, mm. They loved it because they're in on it too. Check my story. Check my Instagram post. I just talked and to the cops and they're in is on the it. Is the cops because you talked to them or because people are calling them on you? Uh, Both. I called them too because I wanted to collaborate with them and also people are calling. And so it's very fun. So so my concern, obviously, you know, you have a like, why would you be compelled to use this accent too? That's what I don't get. Yeah. And notice he does this weird thing with his eyes. I've witnessed personally people who believe they're in that enlightened state all the time yeah they they, they it's, it's just a weird similarity i'm just picking up on right now they've done these eyes too oh really like, like i don't know i don't know it's almost like they're trying to like maybe they think they're communicating with their mind when they do this like, do, you, <laughs> do you get the message i'm sending you right or they're trying to like control what you say like i'm gonna latch my consciousness into yours and control your next word of speech i don't know but it's a weird I, i've seen that before i've seen these eye movements before in enlightened people so by enlightened, I mean like crazy people. Right. Obviously, you know you have a large social media platform, like a lot of followers. You know, maybe not the reach that you used to have, but it's still fairly large. That is correct. I think like, I mean, I don't know. Like, you know, you can do what you want, obviously. I, I entitle you to do whatever you want. But like having the social media platform and putting out there like what you currently are, do you think that's detrimental to certain people that are potentially watching or perceiving your content? Yeah, you know who it's detrimental to? The poor little lost souls, the egoic souls, the egoic souls who don't want to accept me as the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and accept the collective consciousness. They want to keep their individuality. They want to suffer. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so are you are you taking the the ayahuasca DMT essentially every couple hours? Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, <laughs> yes, Brian. Um, I'm taking it every two hours. Yeah. So so for what reason though? Um, it expands my mind. It essentially, it gives me the neuroplasticity of a kid. So DMT doesn't like just for anybody watching who wants to like who's a, who's getting scared of DMT from this. DMT doesn't do that. Okay. Not when you're taking it in microdoses every two hours. Yeah. It doesn't do that. Hmm. Do you think there's something else on top of it, or he's just using a different drug entirely? We see that he's either lying that he's not taking it. He's clearly in a psychosis state, or like that's what the DMT is doing to him. 
but microdosing isn't going to make you go crazy. Yeah, like it seems extremely like even his facial expressions are so like all over the place. Like I see him like randomly rolling his eyes or in the back of his head. He's just like doing the weird eye movements and shit. Yeah, it's, like twitching. I don't know. Yeah, and DMT like on like. Did you think that these were effects of DMT? I didn't know what to think. I just thought he's under the influence of something, and I didn't know what, though. I didn't even know if it was possible to microdose it in that fashion. Because, yeah, the main ingredient in DMT is, or in ayahuasca, is DMT. But I'm just curious, like, from someone who's never tripped, like, is, did you think that these effects can happen? Um, well, after seeing this, I was thinking, oh, that's kind of sketchy if that's possibly what could happen. So I didn't think that before this, and now I saw this, and I was thinking, you know, maybe. But that's my own completely uneducated opinion, seeing it for the first time ever. So I imagine this is not what happens, obviously, after speaking with you. Yeah, no, it's not what happens. I can show you. I have DMT right here. Oh, good. This will make the video great. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to see the actual effect of a microdose. Here's what a microdose does. So that would have been about five milligrams. I think there was 10 in there. Okay. So that was five to 10 milligrams of DMT. I keep it in there because I find the microdosing helps me with meditation. So I might take a hit and then like go into like a deep meditative state. But I'll tell you what I'm experiencing right now, just to contrast this craziness. Mm -hmm. An interesting taste in my mouth that tastes like shoes. <laughs> That light looks a little brighter. The interesting thing, too, is when one of his videos, he was showing him dosing, and it was him literally just eating it. Yeah, well, this is more intense. I know, but when it was just like, it, it's more intense. yeah, that's the thing is when you're eating it, it's not going to be as pronounced. So it's kind of interesting how he's acting this exaggerated when he's not even administering it in this way. Off a microdose of DMT, I'm really not getting much, man. Yeah. Not much happens. Hmm. It's not it's not a kind of drug that you can microdose. Like, like really. Like nothing really happens. Interesting. You kind of either like have the experience or So you think he's making it up, or he's just the psychosis state is what's making him act like this has nothing to do with under the influence of something. I mean see, I have never microdosed ayahuasca. But I know, like, it should be similar to what I just did, only elongated. Right. So, like, right now I hear a little buzzing in my head. But, like, these drugs are all based off the dose. It's right. all dose dependent. So a microdose of ayahuasca or DMT, to clarify, is not going to give anything near what he's going through. Like, this is just what psychosis looks like. Because everybody watching is currently witnessing what DMT in a low dose looks like. And I don't know, do I look weird? No, you seem fine. I I have a buzzing in my ears. Yeah, you seem exactly the same. Like that's it. I got a buzzing in my ears. Huh. It doesn't do much. The F a kid with the wisdom of an adult, so I can do anything. I am a superhuman. Como estás humano de superhero? I'm about to learn the Spanish because I can learn anything. I have the neuroplasticity of a kid. Do you feel like you should seek like metal medical attention? Uh, I just did. The cops just showed up at my door with a psychiatrist. And they talked to me, and he said, wow, those fucking fans are so fucking dumb. <laughs> like, how can they not realize it's an act when I've said from the very start that it is an act? How in the world can you believe that I am not acting? <laughs> like, I can switch, like, dude, I can just be normal. So, is it, is it an act, though? <laughs> Kenny, you are too good of it. Kenny, see, I can't. Kenny's a better fucking actor than me. He's acting so perfectly. I cannot believe this. He needs to go to Hollywood. Everyone is in on it. Joe Rogan is in on it. Elon Musk is in on it. Tiger Woods is in on it. You can check my story. I've been messaging them. Everyone is in on it. It is time to reveal Kenny does not want to give up the act because he is having so much fucking fun. I mean, I wish it was a skit. I'm going to be honest. I, I wish it was. I, and I mean, it still potentially could be. If you did, you have damn near fooled me. Like 100% you fooled me. So I, I would give you that because it's hard for anyone to like slip anything past me. Yeah, for sure. But like, I just want to make sure, you know, obviously you're good. People are looking out for you. 
that you're in the right state of mind, you know, because you, you so basically this whole video is him saying, are you good? Are you good? Here's uh tickets to Vegas to stay with me. Promise me you won't take microdose the drugs anymore and you'll stop taking it. He actually says yes, even though obviously I imagine he's not actually intending to do that. Yeah. And my argument is really like, I don't know if it's the drugs that are causing these, these effects. These are very strange effects. Yeah. 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 So I imagine his, uh, yeah, I don't know if people, even the people saying like, this is what he's doing drug wise. I don't think they actually understand the pharmacology of it whatsoever to even know that what he's doing is what he's saying he's doing or what effects it would exert or any of that. Right. So I speculate. Interesting video. I, I don't know. I really just think it's psychosis. Yeah. Schizophrenia, psychosis. I don't know. I'm hard pressed to say that the drugs are attributing to his behavior, but because the thing is, if you're already in that psychotic state, the drugs are going to ex exaggerate it. Right, but so. it's not going to cause it necessarily. Like you can't microdose your way to being insane. I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of experience microdosing. We're talking hundreds. Yeah, of microdoses, and yeah. I've never personally experienced anything like that. I have though had psychosis from being on a trip. I had this one trip where I was in the wrong state of mind to do it, and I mixed. I have a video about this. I mixed, was it two and a half tabs of 1P LSD with about a bottle of wine. Oh, man. And I think because the wine made me really drunk, it was probably a bit of an empty stomach too. So you know how you get like blackout drunk? I yeah. wasn't blackout drunk off a bottle of wine, but the combination made the effect so much more pronounced. And I remember I couldn't see out of my eyes. Oh, my God. And I was with two friends, and they were also on a trip, but they mixed M with it. So they were on M and acid, and I was on fucking alcohol and acid. I didn't want the M. I should have just taken the goddamn M. I would have been so much happier. <laughs> but with the alcohol mix, it was like I entered. The, that was the most psychotic I've ever been because I couldn't see them. And they said that I was picking up things in the room and throwing them. I have no memory. So that's job. like what psychosis is on a drug. Yeah. Like, so in my experience, something totally was diff different. I have no memory of doing this. They said I, I sat on my computer. I was picking up boxes and just like chucking them across the room. And they said that they were scared that I was either going to like hurt them, hurt myself, or like run out of the house and run onto the street and get hit by a car, which is a legitimate concern because I couldn't see. Yeah. So in my experience, what I was seeing or feeling was it felt like it's very funny that alcohol was in this because you know how you lose your balance on alcohol yeah it felt like i was tumbling and falling through a never-ending pit like you know in those movies like the those pits that just never end like you know there was there was one in that um one of those marvel movies where loki falls through a pit and he just keeps falling oh, and falling yeah. forever yeah that's what it felt like i thought i was in a never-ending fall and sometimes if you would see me i would have like i it would have looked like I was touching the wall, like to catch my balance. Cause I yeah. remember coming to, and I would come to just enough to see that I was falling into the wall, but where you would see me stop at the wall in my experience, I was going through it and I was uh. just tumbling. And it was like, it's this mix mat, mi mishmash of real reality mixed with this psychotic reality that you can't describe where you are, are your body is doing things that you are no longer aware of. And to everybody watching, you look insane mm. because you don't know what you're doing. So they actually, what ended up happening was they got me in a headlock and they held me down in a headlock because they said they were scared that I was going to just like, you know, hurt somebody because yeah. I'm just whipping things across the room. Yeah. Or and then they said, I was like, I was smashing into the wall. So they were like, Adam needs to be constrained. Yeah. And they said that I kept heading for the stairs. And they were like, if he goes up, the we were in a basement. Like, he's going to leave the house and, like, die. Yeah. And I probably would have. Yeah. So they headlocked me. And it was a little necessary. But the one guy kept punching me in the chest every time I tried to move. So they, like, <laughs> I can laugh about it now. But that's brutal. Yeah. Like, that imprinted me with some serious psychological fear. Yeah. That was traumatizing. Yeah. How long ago was that? Four or five years ago. It took me, like, I didn't trip again for quite a while after yeah. that. Because uh, that scared the shit out of me. But that that's what psychosis is like. And I remember looking at their faces, and I didn't see my friends. They actually became demons. Like, whatever you picture the most hell-bent on I want to murder you and rape you type demon from hell looks like, that's yeah. what they looked like. And I thought they wanted to rape me. Like, I don't know why my brain went here, but I was like these two demons are trying to rape me hmm. and it was terrifying also like they they were actually choking me out like to the point where i was passing out 
and then I'd wake up and then when I'd struggle, they'd choke me out again. So can you imagine Jesus what that fuck. feels like in a trip? Yeah. Ooh. Jesus Christ. I got over my fear of headlocks. Yeah. <laughs> How long did the trip last for they had to keep choking you out and like restrain you? Five hours. Oh my fucking God, dude. Yeah. That's insane. And then I just came to. But that's what drug psychosis looks like. So I'm out of it. They're they're choking me out. They're demons. And then all of a sudden I just went. They said that their words, I don't remember this. They said I went quiet and I stopped moving for about 10 minutes. Like I stopped trying to escape. Because yeah. before that, what would happen was they said that I would like build up and like kick my legs and try to like, you know, fight my way out. And they choke me out. And this went on of me trying to escape. Uh, props to me, though. I didn't give up. Like yeah. I, was, I was trying to get out yeah. of there. Um, so I just kept going and then finally they said after like hours of this I just stopped and then 10 minutes goes by and then they said all of a sudden I was just like do you guys think you let go now and then they said they let go of me and I got up slowly and um, I asked them if they wanted to smoke a joint with me and we smoked a joint and fell asleep wow yeah it was like I just I was gone and then the next second and you'd think why on earth would I smoke a joint yeah when I was gone because I was so back yeah. like it was like I was totally back to normal I barely when I came back I even had slight visuals it was like my trip ended wow. it was weird props for getting back on the horse I guess after that That'd oh be... dude that was hard yeah that was that made it so oh oh that was hard that was hard yeah, it sounds horrible. Because apparently I kissed one of them too. Really? Yeah. I, I, I'm not gay, but I kissed one of them because yeah. I thought they were trying to rape me. And in my experience, I was like, well, maybe if I just kiss the monster, then it would like then not it'll, then it'll, go it'll, forward yeah, more. It'll like back off. Yeah. I don't want to get raped. So I'm, yeah. like, like, I'm like, fine, I'll kiss you. But apparently, what it looked like is I just walked over to him and started <laughs> fucking kissing <laughs> It's lucky that they were in the middle of something and were still able to deal with it properly, or at least in some well, capacity. Luckily, the one guy only took a hundred micrograms. Because imagine if you were all in the same shit at the same time, like what it would happen at that point? You'd all fight each other to the death. Probably. <laughs> like, like everyone thinks each other is a demon and just like kills each other. These are the stories you hear of where people have the police called on them, they have to get tased yeah. or shot because the police come and they might see a demon and start charging at it and the police kills them. Like uh, this is why it's so important. I have firsthand experience on why it's so important to trip in the right mindset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. So I don't even know what kind of like conclusive opinion I can give on the Connor debacle other than, I don't know, like make sure you're in the right headspace before you do something like that. Yeah, and so I would like, see in my experience, like I'm just trying to relate to him yeah. and, and telling the story is it's the that is the only time that I've been in like uh, I've had other slight psychotic breaks on trips, but that was the most intense. Yeah. So like I can only imagine if he is in psychosis that um it's it's a scary place to be. Yeah. Especially if his isn't ending and yeah. he's like he's now that's his norm is this psychosis. Um, yeah, like for a year now for like different degrees of severity, but for a year he's been in this place in his head. To some degree. Wow. Which is, that seems too long. Well, that's what I mean. I think the drugs, to conclude my opinion, again, I don't, I don't know. I can't say for sure. I'm not him. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's acting. Maybe it's, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think the drugs have, they, ha they gave him probably this crazy enlightening experience, which triggered some latent psychosis in him, some schizophrenia. And now what we're witnessing is that. Yeah. And at this point, I think it goes beyond the drugs. Like, we're not seeing... It doesn't look like the effects of microdosing ayahuasca. Yeah. It looks like some kind of schizophrenic that we're, that we're viewing. And, and like I said, it's hard to say for sure because, well, a lot of the stuff he says is crazy. Like I've already talked about in great depth already. I'm not going to retouch on it. There is some truth in some of the things he says. Yeah. And this is what I find is common with people who are kind of crazy. It's like, there's always a little bit of truth. Yeah. It's like, that's how they kind of convince themselves of it. They're mixing truth in with bullshit. Right. So, yeah, I guess that makes a lot of sense. So all that we can really do is, um, I guess we can do nothing. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Just hope he gets the help he needs, I guess. I hope and he gets the help he needs. Stay safe and doesn't take more shit. And I would suggest if he's able to read some Ram Dass. Yeah. Listen to some Ram Dass audiobooks because he explains the psychedelic state in, in a way or, or this um, the enlightened state in a way that maybe if, Connor, you're watching this, it might give you some different insights so that you can 
maybe look at timer's done one of the one of the cameras just cut off my timer's real this time yeah um yeah i would suggest you you do some work and also some alan watts could be good there's a, maybe don't read his book called the book the taboo on knowing who you really are because in that book he'll tell you you're god and that might exacerbate your <laughs> symptoms so stay away from alan watts the book but maybe <laughs> maybe listen to some of his audiobooks um some of them are really good you can find them on audible and that'll give you some greater insight into how to relate the psychedelic experience you've had in a way that is not so egocentric. Yeah. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. I don't know if you want to do you have like a specific outro you do for podcasts. No, but I think the camera cut off, which is kind of shitty. When you're messing around. That's all good. We can cut to the uh, big angle if we need to or whatever. Which one's off? No, no, they're good. It's got five minutes left. Oh, wow. Okay. Ugh, sweet. No, there's not usually anything that I do to wrap it up. How does the DMT smell? Can you smell it? Nothing. Didn't, didn't smell your farts either, bro. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> wow, there's these silent but not deadly farts. Yeah, go figure. You Even when I lit that, you didn't smell it? Not really, but I'm also kind of like a little bit nose deaf, to be honest. All I can do is taste it. What does this smell like to you? I'm always curious people's perception. Smell it from here? Yeah, you're not going to get high from smelling the bottle. <laughs> no, your description... <laughs> Was pretty accurate with like a uh, shoe store. Yeah. Yeah. Like a mothy, like stinky shoe shit. Funny, eh? Yeah. Yeah, that's all I taste. I thought it was just like wafting through the air. Yeah. Gave you some good clickbait there. Yeah. Sex substance smokes DMT. Oh, I yeah. Know, I, I was fucking shocked. Like, we weren't, I wasn't planning that. So <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Uh, yeah, to wrap it up. Thank you for being on my podcast. I almost felt like I was on your yeah. podcast because you had a lot yeah. of questions. Yeah, I had a lot of questions for him. So, like, sorry if I sort of, like, dominated the uh, question, you know. Oh, no, you don't have to apologize. I'm happy because yeah. I came into this with, like, no questions. Yeah. I was like, I just knew you were going to ask me about Connor Murphy. I'm yeah. going to give an opinion. And then whatever else happens is gravy. Yeah. Cool. So, thank you for having me. This was awesome and honestly got a lot more done than I anticipated. Like we ended up talking for three, four hours or something. And I'm scared. I can't <laughs> edit all this. I'm going to have to get someone else to go through it. I'll get, uh, maybe I'll get my editors to give you the pre like chopped up version for you to consolidate yourself. That would be so, amazing. like, you'll have all the back and forths done the yeah. manual shit. Dude, if you could do that, I would love you forever. Because yeah. That is a nightmare. Cause they're going to have to, they're going to be doing that anyway. So I might as well provide basically take the raw file, jump back and forth in all of it and then from there we clip it however we want yeah yeah, yeah. It. so that yeah i'll do that yeah would you be down to do another one because this is fun oh no, for sure yeah absolutely we should do it again i'm sure we could come up with tons of absolutely. different topics yeah all right sweet we can do a handshake awesome thanks for having me dude <laughs> i'm apprehensive i don't know you're you're cool with touching people oh touching yeah humans? I don't give a fuck. it's fine all right <laughs> all right thanks you guys for watching like subscribe take it easy cheers that was good that was awesome yeah Honestly, covered a lot more. Like, I didn't realize we'd have, like, that much in common to talk about and all that kind of stuff, so. All the pickup jumps? Yeah, the pickup stuff is really interesting, too.